Chapter 1 of Daring Deeds of Famous Pirates. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by James R. Hedrick. Daring Deeds of Famous Pirates by Edward Kebble Chatterton. The Earliest Pirates. I suppose there are few words in use which at once suggest so much romantic adventure as the words pirate and piracy. You instantly conjure up in your mind a wealth of excitement, a clashing of lawless wills, and there pass before your eyes a number of desperate daredevils whose life and occupation are inseparably connected with the sea. The very meaning of the word, as you will find on referring to a Greek dictionary, indicates one who attempts to rob. In classical times, there was a species of Mediterranean craft which was a light, swift vessel called a mayaparo because it was chiefly used by pirates. Since the Greek verb piero means literally to attempt, so it had been the secondary meaning of to try one's fortune in thieving on sea. Hence, piertes in Greek and parata in Latin signify afloat the counterpart of a brigand or highwayman on land. To many minds, piracy conjures up visions that go back no further than the 17th century. But, though it is true that during that period piracy attained unheard of heights in certain seas, yet the avocation of sea robbery dates back very much further. Robbery by sea is certainly one of the oldest professions in the world. I use the word profession advisedly, for the reason that in the earliest days to be a pirate was not the equivalent of being a pariah and an outcast. It was deemed just as honorable then to belong to a company of pirates as it is today to belong to the navy of any recognized power. It is an amusing fact that if in those days two strange ships met on the high sea, and one of them, hailing the other, inquired if she were a pirate or a traitor, the inquiry was neither intended nor accepted as an insult, but a correct answer would follow. It is a little difficult in these modern days of regular steamship routes and powerful liners, which have little to fear beyond fog and exceptionally heavy weather, to realize that every merchant ship sailed the seas with fear and trepidation. When she set forth from her port of lading, there was little certainty that even if the ship reached the port of destination, her cargo would ever be delivered to the rightful receivers. The ship might be jogging along comfortably, heading well up toward her destined port, when out of the distance came a much faster and lighter vessel of smaller displacement and finer lines. In a few hours, the latter would have overhauled the former. The scanty crew of the merchantmen would have been thrown into the sea or pressed into the pirate service, or else taken ashore to the pirate's haunt and sold as slaves. The rich cargo of merchandise could be sold or bartered when the land was reached, and the merchant ship sunk or left to wallow in the Mediterranean swell. It is obvious that because the freight ship had to be big-bellied to carry the maximum cargo, she was in most instances unable to run away from the swift-moving pirate except in heavy weather. But in order to possess some means of defense, it was not unusual for these peaceful craft to be provided with turrets of great height, from which heavy missiles could be dropped on to the attacking pirate. In the bows, in the stern, and amidships, these erections could easily be placed and as quickly removed. And as a further aid, oars could be got out in an endeavor to accelerate the ship's speed. For whilst the pirate relied primarily on oars, the trader relied primarily on sail power. Therefore, in fine settled weather with a smooth sea, the low-lying piratical craft was at its best. It could be maneuvered quickly. It could dart in and out of little bays. It could shelter in close to the shore under the lee of a friendly reef. And it was, because of its low freeboard, not easy to discern at any great distance unless the sea was literally smooth. But all through history, this type of vessel has been shown to be at a disadvantage as soon as it comes on to blow and the unruffled surface gives way to high crest and deep furrows. It is impossible to explain the growth of piracy as it is to define precisely the call of the sea. A man is born with a bias in favor of the sea, or he is not. There is no possibility of putting that instinct into him if already he has not been endowed with that attitude. 
So also we know from our own personal experience, every one of us, that whilst some of our friends fret and waste in sedentary pursuits, yet from the time they take to the sea or become explorers or colonizers, they find their true métier. The call of the sea is the call of adventure in a specialized form. It has been said, with no little truth, that many of the yachtsmen of today, if they had been living in other ages, would have gone afloat as pirates or privateers. And so, if we want to find an explanation for the amazing historical fact that for century after century, in spite of all the efforts which many a nation made to suppress piracy, it revived and prospered, we can only answer that, quite apart from the lust of wealth, there was at the back of it all the love of adventure, that desire for exciting incident, that hatred of monotonous security which one finds in so many natures. A distinguished British admiral remarked the other day that it was his experience that the best naval officers were usually those who as boys were most frequently getting into disfavor for their adventurous escapades. It is at any rate still true that unless the man or boy has in him the real spirit of adventure, the sea, whether as a sport or profession, can have but little fascination for him. International law and the growth of navies have practically put an end to the profession of piracy, though privateering would doubtless reassert itself in the next great naval war. If you look through history, you will find that certainly up to the 19th century, Wherever there was a seafaring nation, there too had flourished a band of pirates. Piracy went on for decade after decade in the Mediterranean, till at length it became unbearable, and Rome had to take the most serious steps and use the most drastic measures to stamp out the nests of hornets. A little later, you will find another generation of sea robbers growing up and acting precisely as their forefathers. Still further on in history, you will find the barbarian corsairs and their descendants being an irrepressible menace to the Mediterranean shipping. For four or five hundred years, galleys, waylaid ships of the great European nations attacked them, murdered their crews, and plundered the Levantine cargoes. Time after time were these corsairs punished. Time after time they rose again. In vain did the fleets of southern Christian Europe or the ships of Elizabeth or the Jacobean navy go forth to quell them. Algiers and Tunis were veritable plague spots in regard to piracy. Right on through time, the north coast of Africa was the hotbed of pirates. Not until Admiral Lord Exmouth in the year 1816 was sent to quell Algiers did Mediterranean piracy receive its death blow, though it lingered on for some little time later. But piracy is not confined to any particular nation, nor any particular sea. Any more than the spirit of adventure is the exclusive endowment of any particular race. There have been notorious pirates in the North Sea, as in the Mediterranean, there have been European pirates in the Orient, just as there have been Moorish pirates in the English Channel. There have been British pirates on the waters of the West Indies, as there have been of Madagascar. There have flourished pirates in the North, in the South, in the East and the West, in China, Japan, off the coast of Malabar, Borneo, America, and so on. The species of the ships are often different, the racial characteristics of the sea rovers are equally distinct, yet there is still the same determined clashing of wills, the same desperate nature of the contests, the same exciting adventure, and in the following pages it will be manifest that in spite of the differences of time and place, the romance of piratical incident lives on for the reason that human nature, at its basis, is very much alike the whole world over. But we must make a distinction between the isolated and collected pirates. There is a great dissimilarity, for instance, between a pickpocket and a band of brigands. The latter work on the grander, bolder system, so it has always been with the robbers of the sea. Some have been brigands, some have been mere pickpockets. The grand pirates set to work on a big scale. 
It was not enough to lie in wait for single merchant ships. They swooped down on to seaside towns and villages, carried off by sheer force the inhabitants and sold them into slavery. Whatever else of value might attract their fancy, they also took away. If any important force were sent against them, the contest resolved itself not so much into a punitive expedition as a piratical war. There was nothing petty in piracy on those lines. It had its proper rules, its own grades of officers and drill. Lestarches was the Greek name for the captain of a band of pirates, and it was their splendid organization, their consummate skill as fighters, that made them so difficult to quell. I have said that piracy was regarded as an honorable profession. In the earliest times, this is true. The occupation of pirate was deemed no less worthy than a man who gained his living by fishing on the sea or hunting on the land. Just as in the Elizabethan age, we find the sons of some of the best English families going to sea on a roving expedition to capture Spanish treasure ships. So in classical times, the Mediterranean pirates attracted to their ships adventurous spirits from all classes of society, from the most patrician to the most plebeian. The summons of the sea was as irresistible then as later on, but there were definite arrangements made for the purpose of sharing in any piratical success, so there was an incentive other than that mere adventure which prompted men to become pirates. Today, if the navies of the great nations were to be withdrawn and the policing of the seas to cease, it is pretty certain that those so disposed would presently revive piracy. Nothing is so inimical to piracy as settled peace and good government, but nothing is so encouraging to piracy as prolonged unsettlement in international affairs and weak administration. So, it was that the incessant Mediterranean wars acted as a keen incentive to piracy. War breeds war, and the spirit of unrest on sea affected the pirate no less than the regular fighting man. Sea brigandage was rampant. These daring robbers went roving over the sea wherever they wished. They waxed strong. They defied opposition. And there were special territories which these pirates preferred to others. The Liparian Isles, from about 580 BC to the time of the Roman conquest, were practically a republic of the Greek corsairs. Similarly, the Ionians and the Lycians were notorious for their piratical activities. After the period of Thucydides, Corinth endeavored to put down piracy, but in vain. The irregularity went on until the conquest of Asia by the Romans, in spite of all the precautions that were taken. The Aegean Sea, the Pontus, the Adriatic were happy cruising grounds for the corsairs. The pirate admiral, or as he was designated, Archipererates, with his organized fleet of assorted craft, was a deadly foe to encounter. Under his command were the Mayaparians, already mentioned, light, swift, they darted across the sea. Then there were two, the Hemiola, which were so called because they were rowed in one and a half banks of oars. Next came the two banked Briems and the three banked Triems. And with these four classes of ship, the Admiral was ready for any craft that might cross in his wake. Merchantmen fled before him. Warships by him were sent to the bottom. Wherever he coasted, there spread panic through the sea-girt towns. Even Athens itself felt the thrill of fear. Notorious, too, were the Cretan pirates, and for a long time the Etruscan corsairs were a great worry to the Greeks of Sicily. The inhabitants of the Balearic Islands were especially famous for their piratical depredations and their skillful methods of fighting. Wherever a fleet was sent to attack them, they were able to inflict great slaughter by hurling vast quantities of stones with their slings. It was only when they came in close quarters with their aggressors, the Romans, that the latter's sharp javelins began to take effect, that these islanders met their match and were compelled to flee in haste to the shelter of their coves. At the period which preceded the subversion of the Roman commonwealth by Julius Caesar, there was an exceedingly strong community of pirates at the extreme eastern end of the Mediterranean. They hailed from that territory which is just in the bend of Asia Minor and designated Cilicia. Here lived, when ashore, 
one of the most dangerous body of sea rovers recorded in the pages of history. It is amazing to find how powerful these Cilicians became as they prospered in piracy, so their numbers were increased by fellow corsairs from their neighbors, the Syrians and the Pamphylians, as well as many who came down from the shores of the Black Sea and from Cyprus. So powerful indeed became these rovers that they controlled practically the whole of the Mediterranean, from the east to the west. They made it impossible for peaceful trading craft to venture forth, and they even defeated several Roman officers who had been sent with ships against them. And so it went until Rome realized that piracy had long since ceased to be anything else but a most serious evil that needed firm and instant suppression. It was the ruin of overseas trade and the terrible menace on her own territory. But the matter was at last taken in hand. M. Antonius, proprietor, was sent with a powerful fleet against these Cilician pirates. They were crushed thoroughly, and the importance of this may be gathered from the fact that on his return to Rome the conqueror was given an ovation. In the wars between Rome and Mithridates, the Cilician pirates rendered the latter excellent service. The long continuance of these wars and the civil war between Marius and Scylla afforded the Cilicians a fine opportunity to increase both in numbers and strength. To give some idea of their power is only necessary to state that not only did they take and rob all the Roman ships which they encountered, but they also voyaged among the islands and maritime provinces and plundered no fewer than 400 cities. They carried their depredations even to the mouth of the Tiber and actually took away from thence several vessels laden with corn. Bear in mind, too, that the Cilician piratical fleet was no scratch squadron of a few antique ships. It consisted of a thousand vessels, which were of great speed and very light. They were well manned by the most able seamen and fought by trained soldiers and commanded by expert officers. They carried an abundance of arms, and neither men nor officers were lacking in daring and prowess. When again it became expedient that these Cilicians should be dealt with, it took no less a person than Pompey, assisted by fifteen admirals, to tackle them. But finally, after a few months, he was able to have the sea once more cleared of these rovers. We can well sympathize with the merchant seamen of those days. The perils of wind and wave were as nothing compared with the fear of falling into the hands of powerful desperados, who not merely were all-powerful afloat, but in their strong fortresses on shore were most difficult to deal with. With the Balearic Islanders in the west, the Cilicians in the east, the Carthaginians in the south, the Illyrians along the Adriatic and their low, handy Liburnian galleys, there were pirates ready to encircle the whole of the Mediterranean Sea. It is worth noting, for he who reads naval history must often be struck with the fact that an existing navy prevents war, but the absence of a navy brings war about, that as long as Rome maintained a strong navy, piracy died down. But so soon as she neglected her sea service, piracy grew up again. Commerce was interrupted, both east and west. Numerous illustrious Romans were captured and either ransomed or put to death though some others were pressed into service of the pirates themselves. By means of prisoners to work at the oars, and by the addition of piratical neighbors and mercenaries as well, a huge piratical community with a strong military and political organization continued to prevent the development of overseas trade. This piracy was only thwarted by keeping permanent Roman squadrons always ready. Of course there were pirates in these early times in the waters other than the Mediterranean. On the west coast of Gaul, the Veneti had become very powerful pirates, and you will recollect how severely they tried Caesar, giving him more trouble than all of the rest of Gaul put together. They owned such stalwart ships and were the most able seamen that they proved most able enemies. During the time of the Roman Empire, piracy continued also on the Black Sea and North Sea, though the Mediterranean was now for the most part safe for merchant ships. But when the power of Rome declined, so proportionally did the pirates reappear in their new strength. There was no fearful navy to oppose them, and so once more they were able to do pretty much as they liked. 
But we must not forget that long before this, they had ceased to be regarded as the equivalent of hunters and fishermen. They were, by common agreement, what Cicero had designated enemies of the human race. And so they continued till the 19th century, with only temporary intervals of inactivity. The thousand ships which the Cilician pirates employed were disposed in separate squadrons. In different places, they had their own naval magazines located. And during that period already mentioned, when they were driven off the sea, they resisted capture by retreating ashore to their mountain fastnesses until such time as it was safe for them to renew their ventures afloat. When Pompey defeated them, he had under him a fleet of 270 ships. As the inscription, carried in the celebration of his triumph on his return to Rome, narrated, he cleared the maritime coasts of pirates and restored the dominion of the sea to the Roman people. But the pirates could always boast of having captured two Roman praetors, and Julius Caesar, when a youth on his way to Rhodes to pursue his studies, also fell into their hands. However, he was more lucky than many another Roman who, when captured, was hung up to the yardarm, and the pirate ship went proudly on her way. In the declining years of the Roman Empire, the Goths came down from the north to the Mediterranean, where they got together fleets became very powerful and crossed to Africa, made piratical raids on the coast, and carried on long wars with the Romans. Presently, the Saxons in the northern waters of Europe made piratical descents on the coasts of France, Flanders, and Britain. Meanwhile, in the south, the Saracens descended upon Cyprus and Rhodes, which they took, seized many islands in the archipelago, and thence proceeded to Sicily to capture Syracuse, and finally overran the whole of Barbary from Egypt in the east to the Straits of Gibraltar in the west. From there they crossed to Spain and reduced the greater power thereof, until under Ferdinand and Isabella these Moors were driven out of Spain and compelled to settle once more on the north coast of Africa. They established themselves notably at Algiers, took to the sea, built themselves galleys, and, after living a civilized life in Spain for 700 years, became, for the next three centuries, the scourge of the Mediterranean. A terror to ships and men, inflicted all the cruelties which the fanaticism of the Muslim race is capable of, and cast thousands of Christians into the bonds of slavery. In many ways, these terrifying Moorish pirates of which to this day some still go afloat in their craft off the north coast of Africa, became the successors of those Cilician and other corsairs of the classical age. In due course, we shall return to note the kind of piratical warfare which these expatriated Moors waged for the most of 300 years. But before we come to that period, let us examine into an epoch that preceded this. End of chapter 1 Chapter 2 of Daring Deeds of Famous Pirates. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Daring Deeds of Famous Pirates by Edward Kebble Chatterton. Chapter 2 The North Sea Pirates. I am anxious to emphasize the fact that piracy is nearly as old as the ship herself. It is extremely improbable that the Egyptians were ever pirates, for the reason that, excepting the expedition to Punt, they confined their navigation practically to the Nile only. But as soon as men built seagoing vessels, then the instinct to rob and pillage on sea became as irresistible as on land. Might was right, and the weakest went to the bottom. Bearing this in mind, and remembering that there was always a good deal of trade from the continent up the Thames to London, especially in corn, and that there was considerable traffic between Gaul and Britain across the English Channel, it was but natural that the sea rovers of the North should exist no less than in the South. After Rome had occupied Britain, 
She established a navy, which she called the Classis Britannica, and it cannot have failed to be effective in policing the narrow seas and protecting commerce from wandering corsairs. We know very well that after Rome had evacuated Britain, and there was no navy to protect our shores, came the Angles and Saxons and Jutes. We may permissibly regard these Northmen, who pillaged and plundered till the time of William the Conqueror and after, as pirates. In the sense that a pirate is one who not merely commits robbery on the high seas, but also makes descents on the coast for the purpose of pillage, we may call the Viking seamen pirates. But strictly speaking, they were a great deal more than this, and the object of this book is concerned rather with the incidents of the sea than the incursions into the land. Although the Vikings did certainly commit piracy both in their own waters and off the coast of Britain, yet their depredations in this respect, even if we could obtain adequate information thereof, would sink into insignificance before their greater conquests. For a race of men who first swoop down onto a strange coast, vanquish the inhabitants, and then settle down to live among them, are rather different from a body of men who lie in wait to capture ships as they proceed on their voyages. The growth of piracy in English waters certainly owed much to the sink ports. In these havens dwelt a privileged class of seamen, who certainly for centuries were a very much favored community. It was their privilege to do that which in the Mediterranean Cicero had regarded with so much disfavor. These men of the Cinque Ports, according to Matthew of Paris, were commissioned to plunder as they pleased all the merchant ships as they passed up and down the English Channel. This was to be without any regard to nationality, with the exception that English ships were not to be molested. But French, Genoese, Venetian, Spanish, or any others could be attacked at the will of the sink port seamen. Some persons might call this sort of thing by the title of privateering, yet it was really piracy and nothing else. You can readily imagine that with this impetus thus given to a class of men who were not particularly prone to lawfulness, the practice of piracy on the waters that washed Great Britain grew at a great rate. Thus, in the 13th century, the French, the Scotch, Irish, and Welsh fitted out ships, hung about the narrow seas till they were able to capture a well-laden merchantman as their fat reward. So before long, the English Channel was swarming with pirates, and during the reign of Henry III, their numbers grew to an alarming extent. The net result was that it was a grave risk for commodities to be brought across the Channel, and so, therefore, the price of these goods rose. The only means of remedy was to increase the English fleet, and this at length was done in order to cope with the evil. But matters were scarcely better in the North Sea, and English merchant ships sailed in perpetual fear of capture. During the Middle Ages, pirates were always hovering about for any likely ship, and the wool trade especially was interfered with. Matters became somewhat complicated when, as happened in the reign of Edward II, peaceable English ships were arrested by Norway for having been suspected, erroneously, of slaughtering a Norwegian knight, whereas the latter had been actually put to death by pirates. We marvel not a little, wrote Edward II, in complaint to Aquinas, king of Norway, and are much disquieted in our cogitations, considering the grievances and oppressions which, as we have been informed by pitiful complaints, are at this present, more than in times past, without any reasonable cause inflicted upon our subjects, which do usually resort unto your kingdom for traffic's sake. For the fact was that one nation was as bad as the other, but that whenever the one had suffered, 
than the other would lay violent hands on a ship that was merely suspected of having acted piratically. Angered at the loss to their own countrymen, they were prompted by revenge on alien seamen found in their own waters and even lying quietly in their own havens with their cargoes of herrings. As an attempt to make the North Sea more possible for the innocent trading ships, the kings of England at different dates came to treaties with those in authority on the other side. Richard II, for example, made an agreement with the king of Prussia. In 1403, full restitution and recompense were demanded by the Chancellor of England from the Master General of Prussia, for the sundry piracies and molestations offered of late upon the sea. Henry IV, writing to the Prussian Master General, admitted that as well our as your merchants have, by occasion of pirates, roving up and down the sea, sustained grievous loss. Finally, it was agreed that all English merchant ships should be allowed liberty to enter Prussian ports without molestation but it was further decided that if in the future any Prussian cargoes should be captured on the North Sea by English pirates, and this merchandise taken into an English port, then the harbor master or governor was, if he suspected piracy, to have these goods promptly taken out of the English ship and placed in safe keeping. Between Henry IV and the Hanseatic towns, a similar agreement was also made which bound the cities of Lübeck, Bremen, Hamburg, Sund, and Greifswald that convenient, just, and reasonable satisfaction and recompense might be made unto the injured and endamaged parties for all injuries, damages, grievances, and drownings or manslaughters done and committed by the pirates in the narrow seas. It would be futile to weary the reader with a complete list of all these piratical attacks, but a few of them may here be instanced. About Easter time in the year 1394, a Hanseatic ship was hovering about the North Sea when she fell in with an English merchantman from Newcastle on Tyne. The latter's name was the Godazir and belonged to a quartet of owners. She was, for those days, quite a big craft, having a burden of 200 tons. Her value, together with that of her sails and tackle, amounted to the sum of 400 pounds. She was loaded with a cargo of woolen cloth and red wine, being bound for Prussia. The value of this cargo, plus some gold and certain sums of money found aboard, aggregated 200 marks. The Hanseatic ship was able to overpower the Godazir, slew two of her crew, captured ship and contents, and imprisoned the rest of the crew for the space of three whole years. A hull craft belonging to one Richard Horace and named the Shipper Berlin of Prussia was in the same year also attacked and robbed by Hanseatic pirates, goods to the value of 160 nobles being taken away. The following year, a ship named the John Tutbury was attacked by Hanseatics when off the coast of Norway, and goods consisting of wax and other commodities to the value of 476 nobles were captured. A year later, and pirates of the same federation captured a ship belonging to William Terry of Hull, called the Cog, with thirty woolen broadcloths and a thousand narrow cloths, to the value of two hundred pounds. In 1398, the Trinity of Hull, laden with wax, oil, and other goods, was captured by the same class of men off Norway. Dutch ships, merchant craft from the port of London, fishing vessels, Prussian traders, Zealand, Yarmouth, and other ships were constantly being attacked, pillaged, and captured. In the month of September of the year 1398, 
a number of Hanseatic pirates waylaid a Prussian ship whose skipper was named Rohrbeck. She carried a valuable cargo of woolen cloth, which was the property of various merchants in Colchester. This the pirates took away with them, together with five Englishmen whom they found on board. The latter they thrust into prison as soon as they got them ashore, and of these, two were ransomed subsequently for the sum of twenty English nobles, while another became blind owing to the rigors of his imprisonment. In 1394, another Prussian ship, containing a number of merchants from Yarmouth and Norwich, was also captured off the Norwegian coast with a cargo of woolen goods and taken off by the Hanseatic pirates. The merchants were cast into prison and not allowed their liberty until the sum of 100 marks had been paid for their ransom. Another vessel, laden with the hides of oxen and sheep, with butter, masts and spars and other commodities to the value of 100 marks, was taken in Long Sound, Norway. In June 1395, another English ship, laden with salt fish, was taken off the coast of Denmark, the value of her hull, inventory, and cargo amounting to 170 pounds. The crew consisted of a master and 25 mariners, whom the pirates slew. There was also a lad found on board, and him they carried into Wismar with them. The most notorious of these Hanseatic pirates were two men, named respectively Godkins and Sturtebecker, whose efforts were as untiring as they were successful. There is scarcely an instance of North Sea piracy at this time in which these two men or their accomplices do not figure. And it was these same men who attacked a ship named the Dogger. The latter was skippered by a man named Gervais Cat, and she was lying at anchor while her crew were engaged fishing. The Hanseatic pirates, however, swept down on them, took away with them a valuable cargo of fish, beat and wounded the master and crew of the dogger, and caused the latter to lose their fishing for that year, being in damage thereby to the sum of two hundred nobles. In the year 1402, other Hanseatic corsairs, while cruising about near Plymouth, captured a Yarmouth barge named the Michael, the master of which was one Robert Rigways. She had a cargo of salt and a thousand canvas cloths. The ship and goods being captured, the owner, a man named Hugh Upfen, complained that he was the loser to the extent of 800 nobles, and the master and mariners assessed the loss of wages, canvas, and armor at 200 nobles. But there was no end to the daring of these corsairs of the north. In the spring of 1394, they proceeded with a large fleet of ships to the town of Norburn in Norway, and having taken the place by assault, they captured all the merchants therein, together with their goods and cattle, burnt their houses, and put their persons up to ransom. Twenty-one houses, to the value of 440 nobles, were destroyed, and goods to the value of 1,815 pounds were taken from the merchants. With all this lawlessness on the sea and the consequent injury to overseas commerce, it was none too soon that Henry IV took steps to put down a most serious evil. We cannot but feel sorry for the long-suffering North Sea fishermen, who, in addition to having to ride out bad weather in clumsy, leaky craft and having to work very hard for their living, were liable at any time to see a pirate ship approaching them over the top of the waves. You remember the famous Dogger Bank incident a few years ago, when one night the North Sea trawlers found themselves being shelled by the Russian Baltic fleet. Well, in much the same way were the medieval ancestors of these hardy fishermen surprised by pirates when least expecting them, and when most busily occupied in pursuing their legitimate calling. The fisherman was like a magnet to the pirates, because his catch of fish 
had only to be taken to the nearest port and sold. That was the reason why, in 1295, Edward had been induced to send three ships of Yarmouth across the North Sea to protect the herring ships of Holland and Zealand. The following incident well illustrates the statement that, in spite of all the efforts which were made to repress piracy, yet it was almost impossible to attain such an object. The month is July and the year 1327, the scene being the English Channel. Picture to your mind a beamy, big-bellied, clumsy ship with one mast and one great square sail. She has come from Waterford in Ireland, where she has taken on board a rich cargo, consisting of wool, hides, and general merchandise. She has safely crossed the turbulent Irish Sea. She has wallowed her way through the Atlantic swell around Land's End and found herself making good headway up the English Channel in the summer breeze. Her port of destination is Bruges, but she will never get there. For from the eastward have come the famous pirates of the Sink ports, and off the Isle of Wight they fall in with a merchant ship. The rovers soon sight her, come up alongside, board her, and relieve her of forty-two sacks of wool, twelve dickers of hides, three pipes of salmon, two pipes of cheese, one bale of cloth, to say nothing of such valuable articles as silver plate, mazer cups, jewels, sparrow hawks, and other goods of the total value of six hundred pounds. Presently, the pirates bring their spoil into the downs below Sandwich and dispose of it as they prefer. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of Daring Deeds of Famous Pirates This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Painter Daring Deeds of Famous Pirates by Edward Keeble Chatterton Chapter 3 Piracy in the Early Tudor Times The kind of man who devotes his life to robbery at sea is not the species of humanity who readily subjects himself to laws and ordinances. You may threaten him with terrible punishments, but it is not by these means that you will break his spirit. He is like the gypsy or the vagrant. He has in him an overwhelming longing for wandering and adventure. It is not so much the greed for gain which prompts the pirate, any more than the land tramp finds his long marches inspired by wealth. But some impelling blind force is at work within, and so not all the treaties and agreements, not all the menaces of death, could avail to keep these men from pursuing the occupation which their fathers and grandfathers had for many years been employed in. Therefore, piracy was quite as bad in the 16th century as it had been in the Middle Ages. The dwellers on either side of the English Channel were ever ready to pillage each other's ships and property. About the first and second decade of the 16th century, the Scots rose to some importance in the art of sea robbery, and some were promptly taken and executed. In vain did Henry VIII write to Francis I, saying that complaints had been made by English merchants that their ships had been pirated by Frenchmen pretending to be Scots, for which redress could not be obtained in France. In 1531, matters had become so bad and piracy was so prevalent that commissioners were appointed to make inquisitions concerning this illegal warfare round our coasts. Viscount Lyle, Vice-Admiral of England, and others were appointed to see to the problem. So cunning had these rovers become that it was no easy affair to capture them. But in this same year, a notorious pirate named Kelwanton was taken in the Isle of Man, while another, de Melton by name, who was one of his accomplices, fled with the rest of the crew in the ship to Grimsby. 
Sometimes the very ships which had been sent by the king against the pirates actually engaged in pillage themselves. There was at least one instance about this time of some royal ships being unable to resist the temptation to plunder the richly laden Flemish ships. But after complaint was made, the royal reply came that the Flemings should be compensated and the plunderers punished. It was all very well to set a thief to catch a thief, but there were few Englishmen of any experience who had not done some piracy at some time of their career, and when they at last formed the crews of preventive ships and got wearied of waiting for pirate craft to come along, it was too much to expect them to remain idle on the seas when a rich merchantman went sailing past. Sometimes the pirates would waylay a whole merchant fleet, and if the latter were sailing light, would relieve the fleet of their victuals, their clothes, their anchors and cables and sails. But it was not merely to the North Sea nor to the English Channel that the English pirates confined themselves. In October 1533, they captured a Biscayan ship off the coast of Ireland, and during the reign of Henry VIII, there was an interesting incident connected with a ship named the Santa Maria de Say. This craft belonged to one Peter Alves, a Portingdale, who hired a mariner, William Philip, to pilot his ship from Tenby to Bill Haven. But while off the Welsh coast, a piratical bark named the Fertescues, containing 35 desperate corsairs, attacked the Santa Maria and completely overpowered her. Alves they promptly got rid of by putting him ashore somewhere on the Welsh coast, and they then proceeded to sail the ship to Cork, where they sold her to the mayor and others, the value of the captured craft and goods being 1,524 crowns. Alves did not take this assault with any resignation, but naturally used his best endeavours to have the matter set right. From the King's Council, he obtained a command to the Mayor of Cork for restitution. But such was the lawlessness of the time that this was of no avail. The Mayor, whose name was Richard Gollis, protested that the pirates told him they had captured the ship from the Scots and not from the Portingale, and he added that he would spend £100 rather than make restitution. But stricter vigilance caused the arrest of some of these pirates. Six of them were sentenced to death in the Admiralty Court at Boulogne. Eleven others were condemned to death in the Guildhall, London. And in 1537, a ship was lying at Winchelsea, engaged to Bell the Mayor, for £35 for the piracies committed in her, for she had been captured after having robbed a Gascon merchantman of a cargo of wines. The finest of the French sailors for many a century, until even the present day, have ever been the Bretons. And just as in the 18th century the most expert sailormen on our coasts were the greatest smugglers, so in Tudor times the pick of all seamen were sea rovers. About the time of Lent, 1537, a couple of Breton pirate ships caused a great deal of anxiety to our West countrymen, one of the two had robbed an English ship off the Cornish coast and pillaged his cargo of wine. From Easter time till August, these rovers hung about the Welsh coast, sometimes coming ashore for provisions, and most probably also to sell their ill-gotten cargoes, but for the most part remaining at sea. It would seem from the historical records that originally there had been only one Breton ship that had sailed from Saint-Malo, but having the good fortune to capture a fishing craft belonging to Milford Haven, the crew had been split up into two. Presently the numbers of these French pirates increased till there was quite a fleet of them cruising about the Welsh coast. A merchant ship that had loaded a fine cargo at Bristol, bound across the Bay of Biscay, had been boarded before the voyage had been little more than begun. For week after week these men robbed every ship that came past them, but especially were they biding their time waiting for the English, Irish and Welsh ships who were wont about this period of the year to come to St James's Fair at Bristol. However, in the meanwhile, the men of the West were becoming much more alert and were ready for any chance that might occur. 
and a Bristol man named Bowen, after 14 Breton pilots had come ashore near Tenby to obtain victuals, acted with such smartness that he was able to have the whole lot captured and put into prison. And John Winter, another Bristolian, knowing that the pirates were hovering about for those ships bound for the fair, promptly manned a ship, embarked fifty soldiers, as well as the able seamen, and cruised about ready to sweep down on the first pirate ship which showed up on the horizon. The full details of these men and what they did would make interesting reading if they were obtainable, but we know that of the above-mentioned fourteen, one, John du Lacerac, was captain of the Breton craft. On being arrested, he stoutly denied that he ever spoiled English ships. That was most certainly a barefaced lie, and presently Peter Dromoy, one of his own mariners, confessed that he himself had robbed one Englishman, whereupon Lacerac made a confession that, as a matter of fact, he had taken ship's ropes, sailors wearing apparel, five pieces of wine, a quantity of fish, a gold crown in money, and eleven silver half-pence or pence, as well as four daggers and a couverture. It was because the English merchants complained that they lost so much of their imports and exports by depredations from the ships of war belonging to Biscay, Spain, the Low Countries, Normandy, Brittany, and elsewhere, that Henry the Eighth had been prevailed upon to send Sir John Dudley, his vice-admiral, to sea with a small fleet of good ships. Dudley's orders were to cruise between the Downs on the east and St. Michael's Mount on the west, in other words, the whole length of the English Channel, according as the wind should serve. In addition, he was to stand off and on between Ushant and Scilly, and so guard the entrance to the Channel. Furthermore, he was to look in at the Isle of Lundy in the Bristol Channel, for both Lundy and the Scillies were famous pirate haunts, and after having done so he was to return and keep the narrow seas. Dudley was especially admonished to be on the lookout to succour any English merchant ships, and should he meet with any foreign merchant craft which, under the pretence of trading, were actually robbing the king's subjects, he was to have these foreigners treated as absolute pirates and punished accordingly. For the state of piracy had become so bad that the king can no longer suffer it. So also Sir Thomas Dudley, as well as Sir John, was busily employed in the same preventive work. On the 10th of August of that same year, 1537, he wrote to Cromwell that he had at Harwich arrested a couple of Frenchmen who two years previously had robbed a poor English skipper's craft off the coast of Normandy, and this Englishman had in vain sued in France for a remedy, since the pirates could never be captured. But there were so many of these corsairs being now taken that it was a grave problem as to how they should be dealt with. If they were all committed to ward, wrote Sir Thomas, as your letters direct, they would fill the jail. Then he adds, they would fain go and leave the ship behind them, which only contains ordnance and no goods or victuals to find themselves with. If they go to jail, they are like to perish of hunger, for Englishmen will do no charity to them. They are as proud knaves as I have talked with. Eleven days later came the report from Sir John Dudley of his experiences in the Channel. He stated that while on his way home, he encountered a couple of Breton ships in the vicinity of St. Helens, Isle of Wight, where he believed they were lying in wait for two Cornish ships that were within Porchmouth Haven, laden with tin to the value of £3,000. Portsmouth is, of course, just opposite St. Helens, and on more than one occasion in naval history was the latter found a convenient anchorage by hostile ships waiting for English craft to issue forth from the mainland. But when these Breton pirates espied Dudley's ships coming along under sail, they made in with Porchmouth, where Dudley's men promptly boarded them and placed them under arrest, with the intention of bringing them presently to the Thames. Dudley had no doubt whatever that these were pirates, but at a later date the French ambassador endeavoured to show 
that there was no foundation for such a suspicion. These two French crafts, he sought to persuade, were genuine merchantmen who had discharged their cargo at saint Valery's, that is to say, saint Valery sur somme but had been driven to their Isle of Wight by bad weather, adding, doubtless as a subtle hint, that they had actually rescued an Englishman chased by a Spaniard. It is possible that the Frenchmen were telling the truth, though unless the wind had come southerly and so made it impossible for these bluff-bowed craft to beat into their port, it is difficult to believe that they could not have run into one of their own havens. At any rate, it was a yarn which Dudley's sailors found not easy to accept. This was no isolated instance of the capture of Breton craft. In the year 1532, a Breton ship named the Michel, whose owner was one Hayman Gillard, her master being Nicholas Barbe of Saint-Malo, was encountered by a crew of English seamen who entertained no doubts whatsoever as to her being anything else than a pirate. Their suspicions were made doubly sure when they found her company to consist of nine Bretons and five Scots. They arrested her at sea, and when examined, she was found well laden with wool, cloth, and salt hides. Some French pirate ships even went so far as to wear the English flag of St. George, with the red cross on a white ground. This not unnaturally infuriated English seamen, especially when it was discovered that the Bretons had also carried Englishmen as their pilots and chief mariners, and were training them to become experts in piracy. But there were times when English seamen and merchants were able to get their own back, with interest, as the following incident will show. At the beginning of June in the year 1538, an English merchant, Henry Davy, freighted a London ship named the Clement, which was owned by one Greenbury, who lived in Thames Street, and dispatched her with orders to proceed to the bay in Bretagne. She set forth under the command of a man named Lillock, the ship's purser being William Scarlet, a London cloth worker. Seven men formed her crew, but when off Margate they took on board nine more. They then proceeded down channel and took on board another four from the shore, but espying a Flemish ship of war, they deemed it prudent to get hold of the coast of Normandy as soon as possible. In the main sea, by which I understand the English Channel, near the mainland of the continent, they descried coming over the waves three ships, and these were found to be Breton merchantmen. This caused some discussion on board the Clement, and Davy, the charterer, who had come with the ship, remarked to the skipper Lillick that they had lost as much as sixty pounds in goods, which had been captured by Breton pirates at an earlier date, and had never been able to obtain compensation in France, in spite of all their endeavours. Any one who has any imagination, and a knowledge of seafaring human nature, can easily picture Lillick and his crew cordially agreeing with Davy's point of view, and showing more than a mere passive sympathy. The upshot of the discussion was that they resolved to take the law into their own hands and capture one of these three ships. The resolution was put into effect, so that before long they had become possessed of the craft. The Breton crew were rowed ashore in a boat and left there, and after collecting the goods left behind, the Englishmen stowed them in the hold of the Clement. A prize crew, consisting of a man whose name was Cumleys, and four seamen, were placed in charge of the captured ship, which now got under way. The Clement too resumed her voyage, and made for Perrin in Cornwall, where she was able to sell, at a good price, the goods taken out of the Breton. The gross amount obtained was divided up among the captors, and though the figures may not seem very large, yet the sum represented the equivalent of what would be today about ten times that amount of money. Henry Davy, being the charterer, received seventeen pounds. The master, the mate, the quartermaster, and the purser received each thirty shillings, while the mariners got twenty shillings apiece. Lillick and nine of the crew then departed, while Davy, Scarlet, 
Leverett the carpenter and two others got the ship under way, sailed up channel, and brought the Clement back to the Thames, where they delivered her to the wife of the owner. But Englishmen were not always so fortunate, and the North Sea pirates were still active, in spite of the efforts which had been made by English kings in previous centuries. In 1538, the cargo ship George Modi put to sea with goods belonging to a company of English merchant adventurers, consisting of Sir Ralph Warren, good Mr. Locke and Rowland Hill, and others. She never reached her port of destination, however, for the Norwegian pirates pillaged her and caused a loss to the adventurers of ten thousand pounds, whereupon, after complaint had been made, Cromwell was invoked to obtain letters from Henry the Eighth to the kings of Denmark, France and Scotland, that search might be duly made. There was, in fact, a good deal of luck even yet as to whether a ship would ever get to the harbour whither she was sent. In September 1538, we find Walter Herbert complaining that twice since Candlemas he had been robbed by Breton pirates. But, a week later, it is recorded that some pirates, who had robbed peaceable ships bound from Iceland, had been chased by John Chatterton and others of Portsmouth, and captured about this time. And it was not always that Englishmen dealt with these foreigners in any merciful manner, regardless of right or wrong. I have already emphasised the fact that, as regards the question of legality, there was little to choose between the seamen of any maritime nation. Rather, it was a question of opportunity, and the very men who today complained bitterly of the robbery of their ships and cargoes might tomorrow be found performing piracy themselves. A kind of sea vendetta went on, and in the minds of the mariners, the only sin was that of being found out. So we notice that in the spring of 1539, an instance of a Breton ship being captured by English corsairs, who, according to the recognised custom of the sea, forthwith threw overboard the French sailors. These were all drowned except one who, as if by a miracle, swam six miles to shore. So says the ancient record, though it is difficult to believe that even a strong swimmer could last out so long after being badly knocked about. The Bretons had their revenge this time, for complaint was made to the chief justices, who within fifteen days had the culprits arrested and condemned, and six of them were executed on the 19th of May. Before the end of the month, Francis I wrote to thank the English king for so promptly dealing with the culprits. Bearing in mind the interest which Henry VIII took in nautical matters, and in the welfare of his country generally, recollecting, too, the determination with which he pursued any project to the end, when once his mind had been made up, we need not be surprised to find that a few months later in that year, this resolute monarch again sent ships, this time a couple of barks of 120 and 90 tons respectively, well manned and ordnanced, to scour the seas for these pirate pests that inflicted so many serious losses on the Tudor merchants. A little earlier in that year, Vaughan had written to Cromwell that he had spoken with one who lately had been a common passenger in hoys between London and Antwerp, and knew of certain pirates who intended to capture the merchant ships plying between those two ports. Valuable warning was given concerning one of these roving crafts. She belonged to Hans van Meglin, who had fitted out a ship of the portage of twenty lasts and forty-five tons burthen. She was manned by a crew of thirty, her hull was painted black with pitch. She had no foresprit, and her foremast leaned forward like a loadman's boat. Loadman was the olden word for pilot, the man who hove the lead. Cromwell was advised that this craft would proceed first to awkwardness, the natural landfall for a vessel to make when bound across the North Sea from the Scheld, and thence she would proceed south and lie in wait for ships at the mouth of the Thames. In order to be ready to pillage either the inward or outward-bound craft, which traded with London, this pirate would hover about off White Staple, Whitstable. 
Bourne's informant thought that sometimes, however, she would change her locality to the Melton shore in order to avoid suspicion, and he advised that it would be best to capture her by means of three or four well-manned oyster boats. There was also another Easterling, that is, one from the east of Germany or the Baltic, pirate, who had received his commission from the Grave of Odenburg. This rover was named Francis Beam and was now at Canfar with his ship, waiting for the Grave of Odenburg's return from Brussels with money. But the warning news came in time, and in order to prevent the English merchant ships from falling into the sea rover's hands, the former were ordered by proclamation to remain in Antwerp from Ash Wednesday till Easter. End of chapter 3「Chapter Four of Daring Deeds of Famous Pirates. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Phyllis Vincelli. Daring Deeds of Famous Pirates by Edward Kebble Chatterton. Chapter Four. THE CORSAIRS OF THE SOUTH When, in the year 1516, Hadrian, Cardinal St. Croigan, wrote to Wolsey bitterly lamenting that from Terracina right away to Pisa pirates, consisting of Turks and African Moors, were swarming the sea, he was scarcely guilty of any exaggeration multifarious and murderous though the pirates of northern europe had long since shown themselves yet it is the mediterranean which throughout history and more especially during the sixteenth century has earned the distinction of being the favorite and most eventful sphere of robbery by sea you may ask how this came about it was no longer the case of the old Cilicians or the Balearic Islanders coming into activity once more. On the contrary, the last mentioned people, far from being pirates in the 16th century, were actually pillaged than pillagers. A new element had now been introduced, and we enter upon a totally different sphere of the piratical history. Before we seek to inquire into the origin and development of this new force which comes across the pages of history, let us bear in mind the change which had come over the Mediterranean. During the classical times, piracy was indeed bad enough, because, among other things, it interfered so seriously with the corn ships which carried the means of sustenance. But in those days, the number of freight ships of any kind was infinitesimal compared with the enormous number of fighting craft that were built by the Mediterranean nations. And however much Greece and Rome labored to develop the warlike galley, yet the evolution of the merchant ship was sadly neglected. Partly, no doubt because of the risks which a merchant ship ran, and partly because the centuries of fighting evoked little encouragement for a ship of commerce. During the centuries which followed the downfall of the Roman Empire, it must not be supposed that the sea was bereft of pirates. As we have already seen, the decay of Rome was commensurate with the revival of piracy but with the gradual spread of southern civilization, the importance of and the demand for commercial ships, as differentiated from fighting craft, increased to an unheard-of extent. No one requires to be reminded of the rise to great power of Venice and Genoa and Spain. They became great overseas traders within limits, and this postulated the ships in which goods could be carried. 
So it came to this that crossing and recrossing the Mediterranean there were more big-bellied ships full of richer cargoes and traversing the sea with greater regularity than ever had been in the history of the world. And as there will always be robbers when given the opportunity, either by sea or by land, irrespective of race or time, so when this amount of wealth was now afloat, the sea-robber had every incentive to get rich quickly by a means that appealed in the strongest terms to an adventurous temperament. In Italy, the purely warlike ship had become so obsolete that in the opinion of some authorities, it was not till about the middle of the ninth century that these began to be built, at any rate as regards that great maritime power Venice. She had been too concerned with the production and exchange of wealth to center her attention on any species of ship other than those which would carry freights. But so many defeats had she endured at the hands of the Saracens and pirates that ships specially suitable for combat had from the year 841 to be built. The Saracens hailed from Arabia, and it is notable that at that time the Arabian sailors who used to sail across the Indian Ocean were far and away the most scientific navigators in the whole world, many of their Arabic terms still surviving in nautical terminology to this day. Indeed, the modern mariner, who relies so much on nautical instruments, scarcely realizes how much he owes to these early seamen. Just as the Cilicians and others had in olden times harassed the shores of the Mediterranean, so now the Saracens made frequent incursions into Sardinia, Corsica, Sicily, as well as intercepting the ships of the Adriatic. Let us remember that both in the north and south of Europe, the sailing seasons for century after century were limited to that period which is roughly indicated between the months of April and the end of September. Therefore, the pirate knew that if he confined his attentions to that period and within certain sea areas, he would be able to encompass practically the whole of the world's seaborne trade. These sailing periods were no arbitrary arrangement. They were part of the maritime legislation, and only the most daring and at the same time most lawless merchant skippers ventured forth in the off-season. Realizing that the mariner had in any lengthy voyage to contend not merely with bad weather, but probably with pirates, the merchant pilots were instructed to know how to avoid them. For instance, their main object should be to make the merchant ship as little conspicuous on the horizon as possible. Thus, after getting clear of the land, the white sail should be lowered and a black one hoisted instead. They were warned that it was especially risky to change sail at break of day, when the rising sun might make this action easily observable. A man was to be sent aloft to scan the sea, looking for these rovers, and keep a good look out. That black sail was called the wolf, because it had the color and cunning of such an animal. At night, too, similar precautions were employed against any danger of piratical attack, strict silence being absolutely enforced, so that the boatswain was not even allowed to use his whistle, nor the ship's bell to be sounded. Everyone knows how easily a sound carries on the sea, especially by night, so the utmost care was to be exercised lest a pirate hovering about might have the rich merchant ship's presence betrayed to her avaricious ears. But the Saracens, 
whose origin I have just mentioned, must not be confused with the barbarian corsairs. It is with the latter, the grand pirates of the South, that I pass on now to deal. So powerful did they become that it took the efforts of the great maritime powers of Europe till the first quarter of the nineteenth century before they could exterminate this scourge. And even today, in this highly civilized century, if you were to be becalmed off the coast of North Africa in a sailing yacht, you would soon find some of the descendants of these barbarian corsairs coming out with their historic tendency to kill you and pillage your ship. If this statement should seem to any reader somewhat incredible, I would refer him to the captain of any modern steamship who habitually passes that coast, and I would beg also to call to his attention the incident a few years ago that occurred to the famous English racing yacht Elsa, which was lying becalmed somewhere between Spain and Africa. But for a lucky breeze springing up, her would-be assailants might have captured a very fine prize. I shall use the word Moslem to mean Mussulman or Mohammedan or Moor, and I shall ask the reader to carry his mind back to the time when Ferdinand and Isabella turned the Moors out from Spain and sent them across the Straits of Gibraltar back to Africa. For seven hundred years these Moors had lived in the Iberian Peninsula. It must be admitted in fairness that these Moors were exceedingly gifted intellectually, and there are ample evidences in Spain to this day of their accomplishments. On the other hand, it is perfectly easy to appreciate the desire of a Christian government to banish these Mohammedans from a Catholic country. Equally comprehensible is the bitter hatred which these Moors forever after manifested against all Christians of any nation, but against the Spanish more especially. What were these Spanish Moors now expatriated to do? They spread themselves along the North African coast, but it was not immediately that they took to the sea. When, however, they did so accustom themselves, it was not as traders, but as pirates of the worst and most cruel kind. The date of their expulsion from Granada was 1492, and within a few years of this they had set to work to become avenged. The type of craft which they favored was of the galley species, a vessel that was of great length in proportion to her extreme shallowness, and was manned by a considerable number of oarsmen. Sail power was employed but only as auxiliary rather than of main reliance. Such a craft was light, easily and quickly maneuvered, could float in creeks and bays close in to the shore, or could be drawn up the beach if necessary. In all essential respects, she was the direct lineal descendant of the old fighting galleys of Greece and Rome. From about the beginning of the 16th century to the Battle of Lepanto in 1571, the Moslem corsair was at his best as a sea rover and a powerful racial force. And if he was still a pest to shipping after that date, yet his activities were more of a desultory nature. Along the barbarian coast at different dates he made himself strong, though of these strongholds Algiers remained for the longest time the most notorious. In considering these Moslem corsairs, one must think of men who were as brutal as they were clever, who became the greatest galley tacticians which the world has ever seen. Their greed and lust for power and property were commensurate with their ability to obtain these. 
let it not be supposed for one moment that during the grand period these Moorish pirate leaders were a mere ignorant and uncultured number of men. On the contrary, they possessed all the instincts of a clever diplomatist, united to the ability of a great admiral and an autocratic monarch. Dominating their very existence was their bitter hatred of Christians, either individually or as nations. And though a careful distinction must be made between these barbarian corsairs and the Turks, who were often confused in the 16th century accounts of these rovers, yet from a very early stage the Moorish pirates and the Turks assisted each other. You have only to remember that they were both Moslems. To remind yourself that the downfall of Constantinople in 1453 gave an even keener incentive to harass Christians, and to recollect that though the Turks were great fighters by land, yet they were not seamen. They had an almost illimitable quantity of men to draw upon, and for this, as well as other reasons, it was to the Moors' interests that there should be a close association with them. During the 15th and especially the 16th centuries, there was in general European use a particular word which instantly suggested a certain character that would stink in the nostrils of any Christian, be he under the domination of Elizabeth or Charles V. This word was renegade, which of course is derived from the Latin nego, I deny. Renegade, or, as the Elizabethan sailors often used it, renegado signifies an apostate from the faith, a deserter or turncoat. But it was applied in those days almost exclusively to the Christian who had so far betrayed his religion as to become a Moslem. In the 15th century, a certain Balkan renegade was exiled from Constantinople by the Grand Turk. From there, he proceeded to the southwest, took up his habitation in the island of Lesbos in the Aegean Sea, married a Christian widow, and became the father of two sons, named respectively Yuruj and Ker Adin. The renegade being a seaman, it was but natural that the two sons should be brought up to the same avocation. Having regard to the ancestry of these two men, and bearing in mind that Lesbos had long been notorious for its piratical inhabitants, the reader will in no wise be surprised to learn that these two sons resolved to become pirates too. They were presently to reach a state of notoriety which time can never expunge from the pages of historical criminals. For the present, let us devote our attention to the elder brother, Rouge. We have little space to deal with the events of his full life, but this brief sketch may suffice. The connection of these two brothers with the banished Moors is that of organizers and leaders of a potential force of pirates. Uruj, having heard of the successes which the Moorish galleys were now attaining, of the wonderful prizes which they had carried off from the face of the sea, felt the impulse of ambition and responded to the call of the wild. So we come to the year 1504, and we find him in the Mediterranean longing for a suitable base whence he could operate, where, too, he could haul his galleys ashore during the winter and refit. A Daring Attack Yuruj, with his one craft, attacked the two galleys of Pope Julius II laden with goods from Genoa. His officers remonstrated with Uruj on the desperate venture, but to enforce his commands and prevent any chance of flight, he had the oars thrown overboard. 
he then attacked and overcame the galleys. For a time, Tunis seemed to be the most alluring spot in every way, and strategically it was ideal for the purpose of rushing out and intercepting the traffic passing between Italy and Africa. He came to terms with the Sultan of Tunis, and, in return for one-fifth of the booty obtained, Yuruj was permitted to use this as his headquarters, and from here he began with great success to capture Italian galleys, bringing back to Tunis both booty and aristocratic prisoners for perpetual exile. The women were cast into the Sultan's harem, the men were chained to the benches of the galleys. One incident alone would well illustrate the daring of Arouge, who had now been joined by his brother. The story is told by Mr. Stanley Lane Poole in his History of the Barbarian Corsairs that one day, when off Elba, two galleys belonging to Pope Julius II were coming along laden with goods from Genoa for Civita Vecchia. The disparity and the daring may be realized when we state that each of these galleys was twice the size of Eurusia's craft. The papal galleys had become separated, and this made matters easier for the corsair. In spite of the difference in size, he was determined to attack. His Turkish crew, however, remonstrated and thought it madness but Yuruj answered this protestation by hurling most of the oars overboard, thus making escape impossible. They had to fight or die. This was the first time that Turkish corsairs had been seen off Elba, and as the papal galley came on and saw the turbaned heads, a spirit of consternation spread throughout the ship. The Corsair galley came alongside, there was a volley of firing, the Turkish men leapt aboard, and before long the ship and the Christians were captured. The Christians were sent below, and the papal ship was now manned by Turks, who disguised themselves in the Christians' clothes. And now they were off to pursue the second galley. As they came up to her, the latter had no suspicion, but a shower of arrows and shot, followed by another short, sharp attack, made her also a captive. Into Tunis came the ships, and the capture amazed both barbarian corsair and the whole of Christendom alike. The fame of Yuruj spread, and along the whole coast of North Africa he was regarded with a wonder mingled with the utmost admiration. He became known by the name Barbarossa. Owing to his own physical appearance, the Italian word rosa signifying red, and barba meaning a beard. He followed up the success by capturing next year a Spanish ship with five hundred soldiers and there were other successes, so that in five years he had eight vessels. But Tunis now became too small for him, so for a time he moved to the island of Jerba, on the east coast of Tunis, and from there he again harassed Italy. Such was the fame of Barbarossa that he was invited to help the Moors. It chanced that the Moslem king of Bougea had been driven out of his city by the Spaniards, and the exile appealed to Barbarossa to assist him in regaining his own. The reward offered to the Turk was that, in the event of victory, Barbarossa should henceforth be allowed the free use of Bougea, the strategic advantage of the port being that it commanded the Spanish Sea. The Turk accepted the invitation on these terms, and having now a dozen galleys with ample armament, in addition to 1,000 Turkish soldiers, as well as a number of renegades and moors, 
he landed before the town in August of 1512. Here he found the king ready with his 3,000 troops, and they proceeded to storm the bastion in which an all-too-weak Spanish garrison had been left. Still, for eight days the Spaniards held out, and then when a breach was made and a fierce assault was being carried out, Barbarossa had the misfortune to have his left arm amputated. So, Bougea being now left alone, Barbarossa and his brother put to sea again. They had not won the victory, but they had captured a rich Genoese galley full of merchandise. Barbarossa took her back with him to his headquarters, and while he recovered from his wounds, his brother, Kier ed din acted in his stead. Not unnaturally, the Genoese were angered at the loss of their fine galliot and sent forth Andrea Doria, the greatest Christian admiral, with a dozen galleys to punish the Turks. The Christians landed before Tunis, drove Kier ed din back into Tunis, and took away to Genoa one half of Barbarossa's ships. Kier ed din now proceeded to Jerba to build other ships as fast as possible, and as soon as his wounds allowed him, Barbarossa here joined him. Meanwhile, the Moors were still chafing at their inability to get even with the Spaniards, and once more an attempt was made to take Bougea, though unsuccessfully, and the corsairs' ships were burnt lest they might fall into the hands of the enemy. At length the Barbarossas resolved to quit Tunis and Jerba, for they had now chosen to settle at Gigil, sixty miles to the east of Bougea. Their fame had come before them. The inhabitants were proud to welcome the brother corsairs who had done many wonderful things by land and sea, and before long the elder Barbarossa was chosen as their sultan. In 1516 died Ferdinand, and about this time the Algerine Moors declined any longer to pay tribute to Spain. To Barbarossa came an invitation to aid these inhabitants of Algiers in driving the Spanish garrison from their fort. The invitation was accepted. Six thousand men and sixteen galleots were got together. Arrived before the fortress of Algiers, Barbarossa offered a safe conduct to the garrison if they would surrender, but the latter's reply was merely to remind the corsair of Bougea. Then for twenty days Barbarossa battered away at the fortress, but without making a breach, and meanwhile the Moors began to regret that they had asked the red beard to aid them but it would be less easy to turn them out now that once these daredevils had set foot on their territory. Barbarossa knew this and waxed insolent. The Algerines made common cause with the soldiers in the fortress, and a general rising against the red beard was planned. But they had reckoned without their guest, for Barbarossa had spies at work, and became informed of this plot. Whilst at prayers one Friday in the mosque, Barbarossa had the gates closed, the conspirators brought before him one by one, and then after twenty-two of them had been put to death, there was an end to this plotting against the corsair of Lesbos. Barbarossa increased in power, in the number of his galleys, in the extent of his territory, and in the number of his subjects, so that by now he had become sultan of Middle Barbary. Practically the whole of that territory marked on our modern maps of Algeria was under his sway. Step by step, leaping from one success to another, ignoring his occasional reverses, he had risen from a mere common pirate to the rank of a powerful sultan. 
So potent had he become, in fact, that he was able to make treaties with other barbarian sultans, and all the summer season his galleys were scouring the seas, bringing back increased wealth and more unfortunate Christian prisoners. Richly laden merchant ships from Genoa, from Naples, from Venice, from Spain, set forth from home, and neither the ships nor their contents were ever permitted to return or to reach their ports of destination. However, the time came when the Christian states could no longer endure this terrible condition of affairs, and Charles V was moved to send a strong force to deal with the evil. Ten thousand seasoned troops were sent in a large fleet of galleys to northern Africa, and at last the wasp was killed. For Barbarossa, with his fifteen hundred men, was defeated, and he himself was slain while fighting boldly. Unfortunately, the matter ended there, and the troops instead of pressing home their victory and wiping the barbarian coast clean of this moorish dirt left algiers severely alone and returned to their homes had they instead ruthlessly sought out this lawless piratical brood the troublesome scourge of the next three centuries would probably never have caused so many European ships and so many English and foreign sailors and others to end their days under the lash of tyrannical monsters. End of chapter 4「Deeds of Famous Pirates. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Shasta, Oakland, California. Daring Deeds of Famous Pirates by Edward Kebble Chatterton the wasps at work if barbarossa was dead his sagacious brother caradine was ready to take up his work and he proceeded on more scientific principles he began by sending an ambassador to constantinople and begged protection for the province of algiers this having been granted he was appointed officially in fifteen nineteen governor of algiers his next step was to reinforce his garrisons at different parts of the coast and so secure his territory from attacks by sea and in order to make for safety on the southern or landward side he entered into alliances with the leading arabian tribes of country he was thus about as secure as it was possible for human diplomacy and organization to achieve his ships could still go on their piratical cruises and return with little enough risk in vain did the spaniards send an armada against him the men indeed landed but they were driven back and a storm springing up did the rest gradually more and more seaports fell into the nest of this corsair so there were plenty of harbors to run for plenty of safe shelters whither to bring the valuable prizes it was not merely the middle or the eastern end of the mediterranean which was now harassed but the west end those were the days you will remember when spain was developing the rich resources of the new world so there was a great opportunity for the barbarian pirates to go out 
some little distance into the atlantic and capture the west india men homeward bound for cadiz with gold and other treasures and in addition to these prizes no less than the merchantmen of italy Care Edeen occasionally made raids on the Spanish coast or even carried off slaves from the Balearic Islands. From end to end, these Algerine corsairs were thus masters of the Mediterranean. No commercial ship could pass on her voyages in any safety. Even Spanish flagships found themselves being brought captive into algiers true the small spanish garrison still remained in algiers and because it was immured within a very strong fortress it held out the time now came for this to be attacked with great vigor for a period of fifteen days it was bombarded and at length after a most stubborn resistance it was overcome the stronghold was then pulled down and christian prisoners who in the summer season had rowed chained to their seats in the corsair galleries were in the off-season employed to build with these stones the great mole to protect the harbor of algiers from the western side it was a stupendous undertaking and seven thousand of these unhappy creatures accomplished the work in most of two years nothing succeeds like success and the corsair prospered in power and possession to such an extent that he was pre-eminent this naturally attracted to his dominion many thousands of other followers and there was thus established not a mere small colony of pirates but a grand corsair kingdom where the industry of sea robbery was well organized with its foundries and dockyards and with every assistance to agriculture and a firm hard government to keep the land in fit and proper cultivation and now yet another invitation came to care edeen andrea doria had defeated the turks at patras and in the dardanelles like the policy of the corsairs after each victory the christian admiral employed the infidel captives to work at the oars of his galleys thus it was that the sultan of turkey solomon the magnificent realizing that the christian admiral was draining the best turkish seafaring men determined to invite Karadin to help him against andrea doria so one of the sultan's personal guard was dispatched to algiers requesting barbarossa to come to constantinople and place himself at the head of the ottoman navy barbarossa accepted this as he had accepted other invitations seeing that it was to his own interest and in august fifteen thirty three left algiers with seven galleys and eleven other craft on the way he was joined by sixteen more craft belonging to a pirate named delizov but before they had got to the end of the voyage delizov was killed in an attack on a small island named biba there followed some friction between the men of the deceased pirate and those of barbarossa and finally one dark night the ships of delizov stole away from barbarossa's fleet eventually 
this sultan of algiers with his ships arrived at constantinople the case stood thus the ottoman subject was an excellent man to fight battles by land but not by sea barbarossa was a true fighting seaman therefore let him do for us that which we ourselves cannot do he was only three years short of becoming an oxygenarian yet this veteran corsair was as able as he was wicked and so after the ottoman dockyards in the following year had provided him with additional ships barbarossa set forth from constantinople and began by sacking reggio burning christian ships and carrying off their crews thence he laid west the coast until he came to naples and altogether made eleven thousand christians prisoners and returned to the bosphorus with an abundance of spoil and slaves sardinia too was depleted of wealth and humanity till it was almost bereft of both and at last the fleet arrived before tunis to the amazement of the inhabitants to condense a long story it may be said at once that after some fighting tunis found itself now in submission to him who was also sultan of algiers and commander-in-chief of the ottoman fleet but trouble was brewing again christendom was moved to action the successes of this all-conquering king of corsairs were endangering the world so the great charles v set on foot most elaborate preparations to cope with the evil the preparations were indeed slow but they were sure and they were extensive but there was just one disappointing fact when francis i king of france was invited to take his share in this great christian expedition it is as true as it is regrettable to have to record the fact that not only did he decline but he actually betrayed the news of these impending activities to barbarossa this news was not welcome even to such a hardened old pirate but he set to work in order to be ready for the foe employed the christian prisoners in repairing the fortifications of tunis summoned help to his standard from all sides all united in the one desire to defeat and crush utterly any christian force that might be sent against the followers of mohammed spies kept him informed of the latest developments and from algiers came all the men that could possibly be spared and finally when all preparations had been made there was on the one side the mightiest christian expedition about to meet the greatest aggregation of moslems by the middle of june the invaders reached the african coast and found themselves before tunis it was to be a contest of christian forces against infidels it was to represent an attempt once and for all to settle with the greatest pirate even the mediterranean had ever witnessed it was if possible to set free the horde of brother christians from the tyrannous cruelty of a despotic corsair of those who now came over the sea many had lost wife or sister or father 
or son or brother at the hands of these heathens for once at last this great christian armada had the sea to itself the wasps had retreated into their nest so the attack began simultaneously from the land and from the sea the men on shore and those in the galleys realized they were battling in no ordinary contest but in a veritable crusade twenty five thousand infantry and six hundred lancers with their horses had been brought across the sea in sixty-two galleys a hundred and fifty transports as well as a large number of other craft the moslems had received assistance from along the african coast and from the inland tribes twenty thousand horsemen as well as a large quantity of infantry were ready to meet the christians the emperor charles v was himself present and andrea doria the greatest christian admiral was there opposed to the greatest admiral of the moslems needless to say the fight was fierce but at last the christians were able to make a breach in the walls not once but in several places and the fortress had to be vacated tunis was destined to fall into christian hands barbarossa realized this now full well what hurt him most was that he was beaten at his own game his own beloved galleys were to fall into the enemy's hands presently the corsairs were routed utterly and barbarossa with only about three thousand of his followers escaped by land now inside tunis were no fewer than twenty thousand christian prisoners these now succeeded in freeing themselves of their fetters opened the gates to the victorious army and the latter unable to be controlled massacred the people they had been sent against right and left the twenty thousand christians were rescued the victory had been won the corsair had been put to flight and merely hassan a mere puppet was restored to his kingdom of tunis by charles v on conditions amongst which it was stipulated that merely hassan should liberate all christian captives who might be in his realm give them a free passage to their homes and no corsair should be allowed again to use his ports for any purpose whatsoever this was the biggest blow which barbarossa had ever received but brute though he was cruel tyrant that he had shown himself enemy of the human race though he undoubtedly must be reckoned yet his was a great mind his was a spirit which was only impelled and not depressed by disasters at the end of a pitiful flight he arrived farther along the african coast at the port of bona where there remained just fifteen galleys which he had kept in reserve all else that was his had gone ships arsenal men but the sea being his natural element and piracy his natural profession he began at once to embark but just then there arrived fifteen of the christian galleys so barbarossa not caring for conflict drew up his galleys under the fort of bona 
and the enemy deemed it prudent to let the corsair alone and withdrew soon after barbarossa put to sea and disappeared when andrea doria with forty galleys arrived on the scene too late just as on an earlier occasion already narrated the christian expedition made the mistake of not pressing home their victory and so settling matters with the pirates for good and all algiers had been drained so thoroughly of men that it was really too weak to resist an attack but no the christians left that alone although they took bona about the middle of august charles re-embarked his men and satisfied with the thrashing he had given these pirates returned home but barbarossa proceeded to algiers where he got together a number of galleys and waited till his former followers or as many as had survived battle and the african desert returned to him if moslem piracy had been severely crushed it was not unable to revive and before long barbarossa with his veterans was afloat again looting ships at sea and carrying off more prisoners to algiers for this piracy was like a highly infectious disease you might think for a time that it was stamped out that the world had been cleansed of it but in a short time it would be manifest that the evil was as prevalent as ever once more he was summoned to visit solomon the magnificent once more the arch corsair sped to constantinople to receive instructions to deal with the conquering christians andrea doria was at sea burning turkish ships and only this sultan of algiers could deal with him so away barbarossa went in his customary fashion raiding the adriatic towns sweeping the islands of the archipelago and soon he returned to constantinople with eighteen thousand slaves to say nothing of material prizes money was obtained as easily as human lives and the world marvelled that this corsair admiral this scourge of the sea this enemy of the christian race should after a crushing defeat be able to go about his dastardly work terrifying towns and ships as though the expedition of charles v had never been sent forth but matters were again working up to a crisis if the corsair admiral was still afloat so was andrea doria the great christian admiral at the extreme southwest corner of the epirus on the balkan side of the adriatic and almost opposite the heel of italy lies prevesa hither in fifteen sixty nine came the fleets of the cross and the crescent respectively the christian ships had been gathered together at the island of corfu which is thirty or forty miles to the northwest of prevesa barbarossa came assisted by all the great pirate captains of the day and among them must be mentioned dragut about whom we shall have more to say later but prevesa from a spectacular standpoint was disappointing it was too scientific too clearly marked by strategy and too little distinguished by fighting if the reader 
has ever been present at any athletic contest where there has been more skill than sport he will know just what i mean it is the spirit of the crowd at the cricket match when the batsman is all on the defensive and no runs are being scored it is manifested in the spectator's indignation at a boxing match when neither party gets in a good blow when there is an excess of science when both contestants fairly matched and perhaps overtrained and nervous of the other's prowess hesitate to go in for hard hitting so that in the end the match ends in a draw it was exactly on this wise at Prevasa. Andrea Doria and Barbarossa were the two great champions of the ring. Neither was young. Both had been trained by years of long fighting. They were as fairly matched as it was possible to find a couple of great admirals. Each realized the other's value both knew that for spectators they had the whole of europe both christian and moslem victory to the one would mean downfall to the other and unless a lucky escape intervened one of the two great admirals would spend the rest of his life rowing his heart out as a galley slave certainly it was enough to make the boxers nervous and hesitating they were a long time getting to blows and there was but little actually accomplished there was an unlucky calm on the sea and the galleon of venice was the centre of the fighting which took place it was the splendid discipline on board this big craft it was the excellence of her commander and the unique character of her great guns which made such an impression on Barbarossa's fleet that although the galleon was severely damaged, yet at the critical time when the corsairs might have rushed on board and stormed her as night was approaching, for once in his life the great nerve of the corsair king deserted him no one was more surprised than the venetians when they found the pirate not pressing home his attack true the latter had captured a few of the christian ships but these were a mere handful and out of all proportion to the importance of the battle he had been sent forth to crush andrea doria and the christian fleet he had failed so to do next day with a fair wind andrea doria made away the honour of the battle belonged to the galleon of venice but for barbarossa it was a triumph because with an inferior force he had put the christian admiral to flight doria's ship had not been so much as touched and yet barbarossa had not been taken prisoner that was the last great event in the career of Curradin, and he died in fifteen forty eight at constantinople as one of the wickedest and cruelest murderers of history the greatest pirate that has ever lived and one of the cleverest tacticians and strategists the mediterranean ever bore on its waters there has rarely lived a human being so bereft of the quality of mercy and his death was received by christian europe with a sigh of the greatest relief in the whole history of piracy there figure remarkably 
clever and consummate seaman like many another criminal they had such tremendous natural endowments that one cannot but regret that they began badly and continued the bitterest critic of this moslem monster cannot but admire his abnormal courage resource his powers of organization and his untamable determination the pity of it all is that all this should have been wasted in bringing misery to tens of thousands in dealing death and robbery and pillage End of chapter five chapter six of daring deeds of famous pirates this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org daring deeds of famous pirates by edward kebble chatterton galleys and gallantry but there was a third great barbarian corsair to complete this terrible trio uruge and ker Edine, we have known there is yet to be mentioned dragut who succeeded to the latter he too was a moslem who had been born in a coast village of asia minor opposite the island of rhodes his early life is that of most pirates he went to sea when quite young was devoted to his profession was filled with ambition became an expert pilot and later became a skipper of his own craft then feeling the call of the wild he devoted himself to piracy and rose to notoriety but the turning point in his career came when he joined himself in the service of Caradine, who appointed dragut to the entire command of a dozen of the corsair king's galleys henceforth his life was that of his master ravaging the italian coasts pillaging mediterranean ships and dragging thousands of lives away into slavery two years after the battle of prevasa dragout was in fame second only to caradin and another doria the nephew of andrea was sent forth to capture this new wasp of the sea doria succeeded in throwing his net so well that off the corsican coast he was able to bring back dragut as prisoner and for the next four years the ex-corsair was condemned to row as a slave in a christian galley until on a day his late master Caridon came sailing into genoa during his active pillaging life he had obtained plenty of riches so it was nothing for him to pay three thousand ducats and thus redeem from slavery a man who had been particularly useful to his own schemes and from this day until dragut fell fighting in fifteen sixty five he followed in the footsteps of the man who brought him his release when caradin died the turkish sultan appointed dragut as admiral of the ottoman fleet like barbarossa dragut's first object was to obtain a base in northern africa and eventually he was able to capture the town of africa or Mehedia to the east of tunis his next proceeding 
was to fortify this place the news came to the ears of charles v that this had happened the two barbarosas were dead but there was another almost as pernicious was this pestilence of priory ever to cease andrea doria was an old man now but he was bidden by charles to go after dragut and he went nor was he sorry for the opportunity of wiping out his own undistinguished action at Pervasa. dragut was away carrying the coasts of spain and his nephew asa was left in charge of africa meanwhile doria searched for him along the african coast came to africa but after losing some men and with great damage to his own ship doria as the season was getting late returned home but the following june doria with his fleet arrived off Mehadia, besieged the city and after an expenditure of great effort took it capturing asa Mehadia was lost but dragut was still at large he repaired to constantinople and thence to jerba the island off the east coast of tunis hither also came andrea doria and hemmed the corsair in at last the pirate was in a trap but like many another clever rascal he found a way out with consummate cleverness what he did may briefly be summed up as follows outside were the waiting christian fleet which was merely amused by the sight of a new fort becoming daily greater but these earthworks were just so much bluff for dragut by means of these was able to conceal what was being done on the other side with marvellous ingenuity he had caused a road to be made across the island to the sea on the other side he had laid down a surface of well-greased planks and under the further cover of darkness had made his men drag his galleys across till they were launched into the sea on the opposite coast the rest was easy and the corsair fleet once more escaped having fooled doria in a manner that amazed him to add impudence to insult dragut at once captured a sicilian galley on its way to doria containing muley hassan sultan of tunis the latter was promptly sent as a present to the sultan of turkey who allowed him to end his days in prison of the rest of the acts of this corsair we have but little space to speak it is sufficient if we say that he well bore the mantle which had fallen to him from the shoulders of barbarossa he continued his scourging of the seas he fought gallantly he laid waste and he captured prisoners for slavery power and dominion came to him as to his predecessors and before long he was the ruler of tripoli and more than ever the enemy of the christian race finally he died at the siege of malta but he in turn was succeeded by ali basha of algiers who conquered the kingdom of tunis captured multi's galleys and showed that the old corsair spirit was still alive 
But the day of reckoning was at hand, and there was to be settled in one of the most momentous events of history a debt that had long been owing to the Christians. Of all the decisive battles of the world, few stand out more conspicuously than the Battle of Lepanto. In spite of all the great maritime expeditions which had been sent to put down piracy in the Mediterranean, the evil had recurred again and again. There were two reasons why Christian Europe was determined to beat these corsairs. Firstly, the latter were natural enemies because they were Muslims, but secondly, they were the worst type of pirates. All the losses of Christian lives, goods, and ships merely increased the natural hatred of these Mohammedans. And in Lepanto, we see the last great contest in which these truculent corsairs fought as a mighty force. Thereafter, there were repeated piratical attacks by these men, but they of a more individualistic nature than proceeding from an enormous organization. Lepanto was fought sixteen years before the Elizabethans defeated the Armada. Before we say anything of the contest itself, it is necessary to remind the reader that whereas in the contest which took place in the waters that wash england the bulk of the ships were sail propelled and had high freeboard with some exceptions yet at lepanto it was the reverse the fighting ships of the mediterranean from the very earliest times had always been of the galley type even though it contained variations of species and never was this characteristic more clearly manifested than at the battle of which we are now to speak there were galleys and galleasses but though the former were certainly somewhat big craft yet the latter were practically only big additions of the galley the value of lepanto is twofold it proved to the world that the great ottoman empire was not invincible on sea it showed also that in spite of all that the cleverest corsair seamen could do there were sufficient unity and seamanlike ability in christian europe to defeat the combined efforts of organized piracy and mohammedanism no one can deny that ali basha distinguished himself as a fine admiral at this battle yet he was not on the side of victory when he found himself defeated there fell simultaneously the greatest blow which organized piracy had received since it established itself along the southern shores of the mediterranean lepanto was no mere isolated event it was the logical outcome of the conflict between christianity on the one hand and mohammedanism with piracy on the other it is as unfair to omit the consideration of moslemism from the cause of this battle as it were to leave out the fact of piracy the solidarity of the christian expedition was formed by what was called the holy league embracing the ships of the papal states spain and venice the unity of the opposing side was ensured by the fidelity of the barbarian corsairs to the sultan of turkey in supreme command of the former 
was don john of austria son of that charles v who had done so much to oust these corsair wasps the christian fleet numbered about three hundred of which two-thirds were galleys and they collected at messina the scene where the battle was to take place was already historic it was practically identical with that of prevasa of which we have already spoken and with that of the classical actium in thirty one b c though exactly it was a little to the south of where prevasa had been fought just as in the latter ter edine had fought against andrea doria so now dragut was to fight against john andrea doria the moslem strength may be gauged from the statement that it contained two hundred and fifty galleys plus a number of smaller ships but just as prevasa had been marked by little fighting but much manoeuvring so lepanto was distinguished by an absence of strategy and a prevalence of desperate hard hitting whatever strategy was displayed belonged to ali basha the galaxies of the christian side dealt wholesale death on into the moslems though andrea's own flagship suffered severely in the fight spanish venetian and maltese galleys fought most gallantly but ali basha after capturing the chief of the maltese craft was obliged to relinquish towing her and himself compelled to escape from the battle at least five thousand christians perished at lepanto but six times that amount were slaughtered of the moslems together with two hundred of the latter's ships the corsairs had rendered the finest assistance but they had failed with distinction christian craft had won the great day and never since that autumn day in fifteen seventy one have the pirates of barbary attained to their previous dominion and organized power ali returned to constantinople and even the next year was again anxious to fight his late enemies though no actual fighting took place still another year later Tunis was taken from the Turks by Don John of Austria. For nine years after the event of Lepanto, Ali Basha lived on and, like his predecessors, spent much of his time harrying the Christian coastline of southern Italy. There were many pirates for long years after his death, but with the decease of ali basha clothed the grand period of the moslem corsairs it had been a century marked by the most amazing impudence on the part of self-made kings and tyrants but if it showed nothing else it made perfectly clear what enormous possibilities the sea offered to any man who had enough daring and self-confidence in addition to that essential quality of sea sense from mere common sailormen these four great corsairs the two barbarossas dragut and ali basha rose to the position of autocrats and admirals mere robbers and bandits though they were yet the very mention of their names sent a shudder through christendom and it was only the repeated and supreme efforts of the great european powers which could reduce these pirate kings into such a condition that honest ships 
could pursue their voyages with any hope of reaching their destined ports surely in the whole history of lawlessness there never were malefactors that prospered for so long and to such an extent we have spoken in this chapter of gellies and gellius's before we close let us add a few words of explanation to facilitate the reader's vision bearing in mind the interesting survival of the galley type throughout mediterranean warfare it must not be forgotten that in detail this type of craft varied in subsequent centuries there remained however the prevailing fact that she relied primarily on oars and that she drew comparatively little water and had but little freeboard in proportion to the caravels caracks and ocean-going ships of war and commerce the great virtue of the galley consisted in her mobility her greatest defect lay in her lack of sea-keeping qualities for the galley's work was concerned with operations within a limited sphere with the land not far away in other words she was suited for conditions the exact opposite of that kind of craft which could sail to the west indies or go round cape horn the life of a galley slave was one of dreadful hardship they were chained five or six to an oar fed on the scantiest of food and a boatswain walked up and down a gangway in the centre wielding his terrible lash on those who incurred his anger the amazing feature of these galleys was the large number of oarsmen required but this was an age when human life was regarded more cheaply than to-day slaves could be had by raiding towns or capturing ships the work of pulling at the oar was healthy if terribly hard a minimum of food and the stern lash of the boatsman as he walked up and down the gangway that ran fore and aft down the centre of the ship kept the men at their duty and their shackles prevented them from deserting but when their poor wearied bodies became weak they were thrown overboard before their last breath had left them the prints which are still in existence show that the number of oarsmen in a sixteenth century galley ran into hundreds two or three hundred of these galley slaves would be no rare occurrence in one craft they retained the beak and the arrangement of the yards from the time of the romans at the stern sat the commander with his officers when these craft carried cannon the armament was placed in the bows by the sixteenth or at any rate the seventeenth century the galley had reached her climax and it was not thought remarkable that her length should be about one hundred and seventy feet and her breadth only about twenty feet she may be easily studied by the reader on referring to an accompanying illustration whether used by christian or corsair by maltese knights or moslem turks they were not very different from the picture which is here presented with five men to each heavy oar with seamen to handle the sails when employed with soldiers to fight the ship she was practically a curious kind of raft or floating platform irrespective of religion or race it was customary for the sixteenth-century nations 
to condemn their prisoners to row chained to these benches thus for example when spaniards captured elizabethan seamen the latter were thus employed just as venetian prisoners were made to row in moslem galleys convicted criminals were also punished by this means the difference between the old and new was never better seen than in the late sixteenth century when the big-bellied man-of-war with sails and guns were beginning to discard the old boarding tactics it was the gun and not the sword on which they were now relying but the galley was dependent less on her gunnery than on boarding it was her aim to fight not at a distance but at close quarters to get right close alongside and then pour her soldiers on to the other ship and obtain possession the galleus of the mediterranean although the sword was somewhat largely used signified an attempt to combine the sea qualities of the big-bellied ship with the mobility of the galley compromises are however but rarely successful and though the galleus was a much more potent fighting unit yet she was less mobile if a better sea craft she began by being practically a big galley with a forecastle and a stern console in another deck she ended in being less clumsy than the contemporary ship of the line which relied on sails and guns any one who cares to examine the contemporary pictures of the spanish galleasses used by the armada against england in the reign of elizabeth can see this for himself it is true that even as far north as amsterdam in the seventeenth century the galley was employed and there are many instances when she fought english ships in the channel off portsmouth and elsewhere for a time some lingered on in the british navy but they were totally unsuited for the waters of the north sea and english channel and gave way to the sail-propelled ships of larger displacement end of chapter six chapter seven of daring deeds of famous pirates this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by shasta oakland california daring deeds of famous pirates by edward kemmel chatterton piracy in elizabethan times but although the mediterranean was the sphere of the barbarian corsairs yet this sea lawlessness was not confided to that area the narrow seas were just about as bad as they had been in the middle ages and elizabeth with the determination for which she was famous took the matter in hand as early as the year fifteen sixty four she commanded sir peter carew to fit out an expedition to clear the seas of any pirates and rovers that haunted the coast of devonshire and cornwall yet it was an almost impossible task for the men of these parts especially had gotten the sea fever fishing was less profitable than it might be but to capture ships instead of fish was a very paying industry and had just that amount of adventure which appealed to the elizabethans and bear in mind that 
as in the case of the later smugglers these men had at their backs for financial support the rich landowners who found the investment tempting it was because the colonies in the new world were yielding such wondrous treasure that the english pirates found the spanish ships so well worth waiting for and pillaging again and again did philip make demands to elizabeth that this nuisance should be stopped insisting that in no case should a convicted english pirate be pardoned he requested that her majesty's officers in the west of england ports should cease from allowing these marauders to take stores aboard or even frequent these harbors rewards he begged should even be offered for their capture and all persons on shore who aided these miscreants should be punished severely it was because of philip's complaint no less than of the complaint of her own merchants that the queen was compelled to adopt severe measures she despatched more ships to police the seas but with what advantage up came a ship bound from flanders to spain with a cargo of tapestry clocks and various other articles for philip the english pirates could not let such a prize go past so they stopped the ship and plundered her the queen's next effort was to cause strict inquiries to be made along the coast in order to discover the haunts of these northern corsairs harbor commissioners were appointed says lindsay to inquire and report on all vessels leaving or entering port and all landed proprietors who had encouraged the pirates were threatened with penalties but it was an impossible task as i will explain first of all consider the fact that after centuries of this free sea roving no government no amount of threats could possibly transform the character of the english seaman if for instance tomorrow parliament were to make it law forbidding the north sea fishermen to proceed in their industry nothing but shells from men o war would prevent the men putting to sea years of occupation would be too strong to resist so it was with the seamen in the elizabethan age it began by that hatred of their french neighbors it was encouraged by the privileges which the sink ports enjoyed though it was in the blood of the english seamen quite apart from any royal permission but there was in the time of elizabeth's still a further difficulty those privateers whom the law had permitted to go forth sea roving had become too strong to be suppressed privateering strictly consists of a private ship or ships having a commission to seize or plunder the ships of an enemy in effect it amounts to legalized piracy and any one can realize that in a none too law-abiding age such as the sixteenth century the dividing line between piracy and privateering was so fine that it was almost impossible to say which pillaging was legal and which was unjustifiable that alone was sufficient reason for the frequent releases of alleged pirates at this time true the crown allowed privateering though the commissions were limited only to the attacks on our acknowledged enemies yet it was futile to expect 
that these rude devonshire seamen would have any respect to legal finesse to control these men adequately was too much to expect french and spanish and flemish merchantmen regardless of nationality were alike liable to fall into the english pirates hands some of the backers were making quite a handsome income and who shall say that some of those fine elizabethan mansions in our country were not built out of such illegal proceeds the mayor of dover for instance with some of the leading inhabitants of that port had captured over six hundred prizes from the french to say nothing of the number of neutrals which he had pillaged this was in the year fifteen sixty three and already he had plundered sixty-one spanish ships and there was the valuable trade passing to and from antwerp and london which was a steady source of revenue for the pirates of this time you cannot be surprised then at that important incident in fifteen sixty four that did so much to enrage the english seamen and help matters forward to the climax in the form of the spanish armada for what happened Philip, seeing how little elizabeth was doing to put down this series of attacks on his treasure ships had in the year mentioned suddenly issued an order arresting every english ship and all the english crews that happened to be found within his own harbors it was a drastic measure but we can quite understand the impetuous and furious spaniard acting on this wise during elizabeth's reign there were of course some pirates who had the bad fortune to be arrested one little batch suspected included a captain hayden richard Digel, and a man named corbett included in the same gang were robert hitchens philip redhead roger saster and others the first three mentioned succeeded in fleeing away beyond capture but the remainder admitted their guilt hitchens was a man about fifty years old and a native of devonshire but both he and his companions protested that they had been deceived by Haydn and beagle they had undertaken a voyage to rochelle presumably in a merchant ship whereas the trip turned out to be nothing else than a piratical expedition their version of the incident was that in june fifteen sixty four they captured a flemish ship and to her were transferred thirteen scots who were forming part of this supposedly merchant ship the flemish ship with the scots on board now sailed away as there was some disagreement with the rest of the party they proceeded to ireland where their skipper joined them and they also committed robberies on the coast of spain having captured a ship with a cargo of wine they proceeded to that extreme southwest corner of ireland which even in this twentieth century is still a wild lonely spot and rarely visited by any craft excepting the british navy an occasional cable laying ship and sometimes a coaster or two bearhaven is a mighty fjord which goes out of bantry bay on the one side rise high rocky hills on the other lies the island of bear it is a safe clear anchorage and a wild inaccessible spot here the captured ship was taken and the wines sold 
an arrangement was made with the lord o'sullivan by which the pirates could rely on his assistance for corbett with one ship and a man named lucingham who had charge of another ship were prevented by o'sullivan from falling into the hands of elizabeth's ships that had been sent to capture them lessingham however had been slain by a piece of ordnance as he was in the act of waving his cap towards the queen's ship at bearhaven but corbett was yet alive it was alleged that Haydn and Corbett had agreed jointly to fit out the John of Sandwich, giving her all the necessary guns, with the hope of being able to capture a good ship wherewith to provide Corbett. But whilst in the English Channel a storm had sprung up, and the ship had sprung a leak, they were therefore forced into Alderney, where this vessel became a wreck and Haydn, corbett beagle as well as fourteen others made their escape in a small pinnace it was discovered that robert hitchens had been all his life given to piracy so after having been arrested in the channel isles he was executed at low water mark near st martin's point guernsey and there his body was left in chains as a warning to others the rest of the prisoners were afterwards ordered by elizabeth to be set free after a good and sharp admonition to beware hereafter to fall again into the damage of our laws they were bidden to return to their native places and to get their living by honest labor it is a proof that the crown really valued her seamen by an interesting proclamation that was made in fifteen seventy two when there was a likeliness of war the queen went so far as to promise pardon for all piracies hitherto committed by any mariners who should now put their ships into her naval service and we must not forget that at a later date the first tidings of the armada's advent were brought into plymouth by a patriotic english pirate named fleming fleming wrote john smith the great elizabethan traveller and founder of the english colony of virginia was an expert and as much sought for as any other pirates of the queen's reign yet such a friend to his country that discovering the spanish armado he voluntarily came to plymouth yielded himself freely to my lord admiral and gave him notice of the spaniards coming which good warning came so happily and unexpectedly that he had his pardon and a good reward as in all lands writes this delightful elizabethan where there are many people there are some thieves so in all seas much frequented there are some pirates the most ancient within the memory of threescore years was one callus who most refreshed himself upon the coast of wales clinton and purser his companions who grew famous till queen elizabeth of blessed memory hanged them at wapping now this john callus or callus after his arrest wrote a letter of repentance to walsingham saying i bewail my former wicked life and beseech god and her majesty to forgive me if she will spare my life and use me in her service by sea with those she can trust best either to clear the coast of other wicked pirates or otherwise as i know their haunts roads creeks and maintainers so well 
i can do more therein than if she sent ships abroad and spent twenty thousand pounds thinking thereby to obtain pardon callus accordingly forwarded particulars of his fellow pirates their maintainers and victuallers of me and my companies this list contained the names and addresses of the purchasers and receivers of good which had been pillaged from two portuguese one french a spanish and a scotch ship which callus and a captain sturgis of rochelle had pirated if he were given his liberty this loquacious corsair further promised that he would also bring in a danish ship which he had pirated he promised also to warn walsingham to take care that sullivan bear of bearhaven does not practice any treason toward her majesty there as he alleged that sullivan had told callus in the former's castle at bearhaven that james fitzmorris and a number of frenchmen were determined to land there if they could obtain pilots to guide them thither the old pirate further alleged that they had tried to persuade himself to join them and become their guide promising him large gifts but i would not join any rebel of her majesty he wrote grandiloquently hoping her mercy in time to come last march he went on while he was riding at anchor at torbay he met a frenchman commanded by captain moliner who came aboard callus ship and sought information regarding the irish coast and the best harbors callus informed him the best were cork and kinsel his inquirers then asked whether bearhaven and dingle were not good places where to land they told me if i would go over with them to france i need not fear the queen for any offence i had done the french king would pardon him for anything callus had done against his majesty's subjects and would give him three thousand crowns to begun his subject and be sworn his man as well as a yearly fee during life i asked him why his master wanted to use me and he said his master shortly meant to do some service on the coast of ireland and wanted pilots callus protested that he had declined this invitation to which the other man was reported to have replied that he would never have such a chance of preferment offered him in england but though this made a very fine yarn the authorities were too well aware of callus's past history to give it too much credence the misery of a pirate although many are as sufficient seamen as any yet in regard of his superfluity wrote the founder of virginia you shall find it such that any wise man would rather live amongst wild beasts than them therefore let all unadvised persons take heed how they entertain that quality and i could wish merchants gentlemen and all setters forth of ships not to be sparing of a competent pay nor true payment for neither soldiers nor seamen can live without means but necessity will force them to steal and when they are once entered into that trade they are hardly reclaimed poverty as well as the love of adventure and the lust for gain had certainly to be reckoned among the incentives to this life so steadily had the evil grown that on seven august fifteen seventy nine york complained to lord burleigh 
that the sea had never been so full of pirates and a plymouth ship which had set out from st malo bound for dartmouth had been robbed and chased on to the rocks none the less the persons of credit who had been appointed in every haven creek or other landing-place round the coast in order to deal with the evil were doing their best and three notable pirates had some time before been arrested and placed in york castle together with other pirates but the practice of piracy as we have seen was the peculiar failing of no country exclusively though in certain parts of the world and in certain centuries pirates were more prevalent than elsewhere the very men who in the english channel might have attained disgrace and wealth as sea robbers might also when he went into the mediterranean be himself pillaged by those barbarian corsairs of whom we spoke just now many an exciting brush did the mariners of england encounter with these men and many were the sad tales which reached england of the cruelties of these moslem tyrants an interesting account of such an adventure is related by master roger bodingham the incident really happened seven years before elizabeth came to the throne but it may not be out of place here to deal with it after having set forth from gravesend in the great bark oucher bound for the islands of candia and chio in the levant the ship arrived at messina in sicily but it was made known that a good many moslem galleys were in the levant and the rest of the voyage would be more than risky the outer's crew got to know of this so that bodenham was not likely to get further on his way and deliver his cargo at chio then he writes i had no small business to cause my mariners to venture with the ship in such a manifest danger nevertheless i won them to go with me except three which i set on land but these presently begged to come aboard again and were taken and the ship got under way a greek pilot was taken on board and when off chio three turkish pirates were suddenly espied these were giving chase to a number of small boats which were sailing rigged with a latine sail it happened that in one of the latter was the son of the pilot and at this greek's request bodingham steered toward the turks and caused the outer's gunner to fire a demi culverin at the chaser that was just about to board one of the boats this was such a good shot that the turk dropped astern presently all the little boats came and begged that they might be allowed to hang on to the outer's stern till daylight after clearing from chio bodenham took his ship to candia and messina but whilst on the way thither and in the very waters where the battle of lepanto was presently to be fought he found some of the turkish galliots pirating some venetian ships laden with muscatels and good samaritan that he was bodingham succeeded in driving off the moslem aggressors and rescuing the merchantmen i rescued them he writes briefly and had but a barrel of wine for my powder and shot end of chapter seven chapter eight of daring deeds of famous pirates this is a librivox recording 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Shasta, Oakland, California. Daring Deeds of Famous Pirates by Edward Kebel Chatterton elizabethan seamen and turkish pirates but a much more adventurous voyage was that of a ship called the three half moons which with a crew of thirty-eight men and well found in arms the better to encounter their enemies withal set out from portsmouth in the year fifteen sixty three in some ways the story reads like mere romance but it has been so thoroughly well vouched for that there is not a particle of suspicion connected with it having set forth bound for the south of spain they arrived near the straits of gibraltar when they found themselves surrounded by eight turkish galleys it should be mentioned that the elizabethans used the word turk somewhat loosely to mean moslems it was rapidly made clear that only two alternatives were possible flight was out of the question and either the outer must fight to a finish or she must be sunk but being english and a gallant crew they decided to fight now amongst those on board were the owner the master the master's mate the boatswain the purser and the gunner as officers when their desperate situation was realized the owner exhorted his men to behave valiantly to be brave and to bear a reverse with resignation then falling on their knees they all commended themselves to god and prepared for the fight then stood up one grove the master being a comely man with his sword and target holding them up in defiance against his enemies so likewise stood up the owner the master's mate the boatswain purser and every man well appointed now likewise sounded up the drums trumpets and flutes which would have encouraged any man had he never so little heart or courage in him but next let us introduce to the reader john fox the ship's gunner a man of marvellous resource as we will see presently fox saw that the guns were arranged to the best effect and that the turks were receiving a hot fire but three times as fast as the english shot came the infidel's fire and the fight raged furiously with eight galleys to one big ship the turks advanced and then came the time for the english bowmen to let fly their arrows which fell thickly among the rowers simultaneously the english poured out from their guns a hotter fire than ever and the turks fell like ninepins but meanwhile the outer was receiving serious damage below her water-line and this the turks seeing the infidels endeavoured now to board the ship as they leapt on board many of them fell never again to rise the others engaging in a tremendous conflict on the outer's deck for the englishman 
writes the narrator in fine robust elizabethan language showed themselves men indeed in working manfully with their brown bills and halbards where the owner master boatswain and their company stood to it lustily that the turks were half dismayed but chiefly the boatswain shrewd himself valiant above the rest for he fared among the turks like a wood lion for there was none of them that either could or durst stand in his face till at last there came a shot from the turks which break his whistle asunder and smote him on the breast so that he fell down bidding them farewell and to be of good comfort encouraging them likewise to win praise by death rather than to live captives in misery and shame the englishmen showed themselves men indeed against the moors especially the boatswain who was brought down by a bullet in his chest but overcome by numbers the brave crew were overwhelmed and the survivors condemned to the oars such was the fine gallantry of these brave men but they were fighting against heavy odds the turks pressed them sorely and not one of the company but behaved as a man except the master's mate who shrunk from the skirmish like a notable coward esteeming neither the value of his name nor accounting of the prison example to his fellows nor having respect to the miseries whereunto he should be put the rest of the crew covered themselves with glory but at length it was of no avail for the turks won the day then in accordance with the historic custom of the sea the crew of the oucher were placed in the galleys set to row at the oars and they were no sooner in them but their garments were pulled over their ears and torn from their backs for the galley slave was always condemned to row stark naked at length the galleys reached their stronghold at the port of alexandria which was well protected in those days by means of fortifications the reader will recollect that it was stated some time back that the sailing season was confined only to the late spring and summer and that in the winter the ships were laid up the close time now approaching the christian prisoners were brought ashore at alexandria and cast into prison until the time came round again for the season of piracy at this port says the elizabethan chronicler the turks do customably bring their galleys on shore every year in the winter season and there do trim them and lay them up against the springtime in which road there is a prison wherein the captives and such prisoners as serve in the galleys are put for all that time until the seas be calm and passable for the galleys every prisoner being most grievously laden with irons on their legs through their great pain so the voyage of the oucher had come to a tragic ending but after a time the news of this incident evidently reached england for both the master and the owner were ransomed by their friends from their prison the rest had to bear their ill-treatment and semi-starvation as best they would 
but he who bore it all with wonderful endurance was the gunner john fox and being somewhat skilful in the craft of a barber by reason thereof made great shift in helping his fare now and then with a good meal in the course of time the keeper of the prison became rather fond of him and allowed him special privileges so that he could walk as far as the sea and back when he liked but he was warned always to return by night and he was never allowed to go about without his shackles on his legs later on six more of the prisoners were allowed a light privilege the life sped wearily on and now for fourteen sorry years this durance vile had continued it was the year fifteen seventy seven and the winter season had come round again and the galleys drawn up the beach the masts and sails thereof were brought ashore and properly housed till once more the spring should return and the turkish masters and mariners were now nested in their own homes as the narrative quaintly words it the galley slaves had again resumed their long bondage ashore and now there were no fewer than two hundred and sixty-eight wretched christians there languishing in captivity having been captured from sixteen different nations it was then that john fox man of resource that he was resolved that escape must be made and his fellow prisoners also released if you consider such a project as the release of nearly three hundred prisoners from the hands of these turkish pirates the idea seems entirely impracticable and utterly visionary to john fox however it seemed otherwise and this is how he set to work after pondering over a method for a very long time and saying many prayers that his scheme might be successful he betook himself to a fellow prisoner a spanish christian named peter unticaro who had been in captivity no less than thirty years this man was lodged in a certain victualling house near the roadstead he had never attempted escape during all those years so was treated with less suspicion and trusted fox and unticaro had often discussed their bondage however and at last the englishman took the risk of making him his confidant and also one other fellow-prisoner these three men put their heads together and fox unfolded a method of escape their chances of meeting were but few and short but at the end of seven weeks they had been able to agree on a definite plan five more prisoners were now taken into their confidence whom they thought they could safely trust the last day of the old year came round and these eight men agreed to meet in the prison and inform the rest of the prisoners of the plan on the thirty first of december then this was done it needed but little persuasion to cause these two hundred odd to join in the scheme and fox having delivered unto them a sort of files which he had gathered together for this purpose by the means of peter unticaro admonished them to be ready at eight o'clock the next night with their fetters filed through so on the next day fox with his six companions 
resorted to the house of peter Monticaro. in order to prevent any suspicions of a dark deed they spent the time in mirth till the night came on and the hour of eight drew nigh fox then sent unticaro to the keeper of the road pretending that he had been sent by one of the turkish officials ordering him to come at once the keeper promptly came and before doing so told the warders not to bar the gate as he should not be long away in the meantime the other seven prisoners had been able to arm themselves with the best weapons they could find in the house of the spaniard and john fox was able to lay his hands on a rusty old sword-blade without either hilt or pommel but he managed to make it effective by now the keeper had arrived but as soon as he came to the house and saw it silent and in darkness he began to be suspicious john fox was ready for him and before the keeper had retraced his steps more than a few yards the englishman sprang out and calling him a villain and a bloodsucker of many a christian's blood lifted up his bright shining sword of ten years rust and killed him on the spot they then marched quietly in the direction of the warders of the road and quickly dispatched these six officials fox then barred the gate and put a cannon against it to prevent pursuit so far all had worked with remarkable smoothness they next proceeded to the jailer's lodge where they found the keys of the fortress and prison by his bedside they also found some better weapons than the arms they were using but there was also a chest full of ducats to three of the party this wonderful sight proved irresistible fox would not have anything to do with the money for that it was his and their liberty which he sought for to the honour of his god and not make a martyr of the wicked treasure of the infidels but Anticaro and two others helped themselves liberally and concealed the money between their skin and their shirt these eight men armed with the keys now came to the prison whose doors they opened the captives were ready and waiting fox called on them to do their share and the whole band between two and three hundred poured forth to each section did fox bestow some duty the eight prison warders were put to death but some of the prisoners fox had wisely sent down to the water where they got ready for sea the best galley called the captain of alexandria whilst some were getting her launched others were rushing about bringing her masts and sails and oars and the rest of her inventory from the winter quarters the whole place was seething with suppressed excitement meanwhile there was a warm contest going on at the prison before all the warders were slain the latter had fled to the top of the prison and fox with his companions went after them with ladders blood and slaughter were all round them three times was fox shot but by a miracle the shot only passed through his clothing on each occasion but as if by way of punishment for their greed undicaro and his two companions who had taken the ducats were killed outright being not able to wield themselves being so pestered with the weight and unease carrying of the wicked and profane treasure in this conflict one of the turks was run through with a sword and not yet dead 
fell from the top of the prison wall to the ground such a noise did he then begin to make that the alarm was raised and the authorities were amazed to find the christian prisoners were paying their ransoms by dealing death to their late masters alexandria was now roused and both a certain castle as well as a strong fortress were bestirring themselves to action it seemed as if the prisoners after all their years of suffering after having brought about so gallant an escape were now to fail just as victory was well in sight it was a saddening thought but there was one road of escape and one only whilst some of the prisoners were still running down to the sea carrying munitions some additional oars victuals, and whatever else were required for the galleys others were getting ready for pushing off the last of the christians leaped aboard the final touch was given to the gear and up went the yards and the sails were unloosed there was a good breeze and this the swiftest and best of all alexandria's ships was speeding on at a good pace but ashore the turks have already got to their guns and the roar of cannon is heard from both the castle and fortress the sea is splashing everywhere with turkish ball and the smoke is swept by the breeze off the shore five and forty times did these guns fire and never once did a shot so much as graze the galley although she could see the splashes all around her on and still on sailed this long lean galley increasing her speed all the time till at length by god's mercy she with her long-suffering crew who by years of involuntary training had learnt to handle her to perfection were at last out of range of any turkish cannon in the distance they could see their late masters coming down to the beach like unto a swarm of bees and bustling about in a futile endeavour to get their other galleys ready for the sea but it was of little avail the christians had long been preparing for flight in the captain so the turks found it took an unbearable time in seeing out the oars and masts and cables and everything else necessary to a galley's inventory lying hidden away in winter quarters they had never suspected such a well-planned escape as this nothing was ready all was confusion and even when the galleys were at last launched and rigged the weather was so boisterous there was such a strong wind that no man cared about taking charge of these fine weather craft just at that time so the escaping galley got right away and then as soon as they were a safe distance away fox summoned his men to do what nelson was to perform less than three centuries later at almost this very spot you remember how after the glorious battle of the nile when the british fleet had obtained such a grand victory over the french nelson sent orders through the fleet to return thanksgiving to almighty god for the result of the battle all work was stopped and men who had spent the whole night risking death and fighting for their lives dishevelled and dirty with sweat and grime now stood bareheaded and rendered their thanks so it was now on the galley captain fox called to them all willing them to be thankful unto almighty god for their delivery 
and most humbly to fall down upon their knees beseeching him to aid them unto their friend's land and not to bring them into any other danger sith he had most mightily delivered them from so great a thraldom and bondage it must have been a momentous occasion men who after being prisoners for thirty years and less men who had just come through a night of wild excitement men who had fought with their arms and sweated hard to get their galley ready for sea men who even at the last minute had barely escaped being blown into eternity by the turkish cannon now halted in their work and made their thanksgiving whilst most of them hardly could realize that at length they were free men and the time of their tribulation was at an end and then they resumed their rowing and instead of working till they dropped for faintness each man helped his neighbor when weariness was stealing over the oarsmen never did a more united ship's company put to sea one object alone did they all possess to come to some christian land with the least possible delay they had no charts but fox and his english fellow seamen knew something about astronomy and by studying the stars in the heavens they roughly guessed the direction in which they ought to steer with such haphazard navigation however they soon lost their position when variable winds sprang up those light draught ships made a good deal of leeway and as the wind had been from so many points of the compass they were now in a new maze but troubles do not come singly they were further troubled by their victuals giving out so that it seemed as if they had escaped from one form of punishment only to fall into a worse kind of hardship as many as eight died of starvation but at last on the twenty-ninth day after leaving alexandria the others picked up the land again and found it was the island of candia their distance made good had thus been about three hundred and fifty miles northwest which works out at about twelve miles a day but though this is ridiculously small it must be borne in mind that their courses were many and devious that to row for twenty-nine consecutive days was a terrible trial for human endurance and latterly they were rowing with empty stomachs they came at length to gallipoli in candia and landed here the good abbot and monks of the convent of Amerciates received them with welcome and treated them with every christian hospitality they refreshed these poor voyagers and attended to their wants until well enough to resume their travels two hundred and fifty-eight had survived and good nourishment with kindly treatment on land restored their health and vigour we need not attempt to suggest the warmth of the welcome which these poor prisoners received and the congratulations which were showered upon them in having escaped from the hands of the turks it was in itself a remarkable achievement that so many had come out alive as a token and remembrance of this miraculous escape fox left behind as a present to the monks the sword with which the englishmen had slain the keeper of the prison esteeming it a precious jewel it remained hanging up in a place of honour in the monastery when the time came for the captain to get under way again she coasted 
till she arrived at Toronto, in the heel of Italy, and so concluded their voyage. They were once again in Christian land and away from their oppressors. The galley they sold at this port and immediately started to walk on foot to Naples. Yes, they had escaped, but by how little may be gathered from the fact that the Christians, having started their long walk in the morning, there arrived that same night seven turkish galleys but the latter were too late their captors were now inland having reached naples without further adventure the christians separated and according to his nationality made for their distant homes but fox proceeded first to rome arriving there one easter eve where he was well entertained by an Englishman who brought the news of this wonderful escape to the notice of the Pope. Fox was without any means of livelihood, and it was a long way to walk to the English Channel, so he determined to try his luck in Spain. The Pope treated the poor man with every consideration, and sent him on his journey with a letter to the king of spain we in his behalf do in the bowels of christ desire you wrote his holiness that taking compassion of his former captivity and present penury you do not only suffer him freely to pass throughout your cities and towns but also succor him with your charitable alms, the reward whereof you shall hereafter most assuredly receive. Leaving Rome in April 1577, Fox arrived in Spain, apparently the following August. The Spanish king appointed him to the office of gunner in the royal galleys at a salary of eight ducats a month. Here he remained for about two years, and then, feeling homesick, returned to England in 1579. Who, being come to England, as we read in Halkiot, went unto the court and showed all his travel unto council, who, considering of the state of this man, in that he had spent and lost a great part of his youth in thraldom and bondage extended to him their liberality to help to maintain him now in age to their right honour and to the encouragement of all true-hearted christians such then was the happy ending of fox's travels sixteen years after his ship had set forth from portsmouth he had shown himself not merely to be a man of exceptional physical endurance but a man of considerable resource and a born leader of men in times of crisis and despair we may well relish the memory of such a fine character End of chapter 8。Chapter 9 of Daring Deeds of Famous Pirates。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Shasta, Oakland. California. Daring Deeds of Famous Pirates by Edward Kebble Chatterton. The Stuart Navy Goes Forth Against the Pirates. After the death of Queen Elizabeth and the respite from the Anglo Spanish naval fighting, there was little employment for those hundreds of our countrymen who had taken to the sea during the time of drake 
fighting the Spaniards or lying in wait for treasure ships bound from the West Indies to Cadiz was just the life that appealed to them. But now that these hostilities had passed, they felt that their means of livelihood were gone. After the exciting sea life with Drake and others, after the prolonged armada fighting, it would be too tame for them to settle down to life ashore. Fishing was not very profitable, and there was not sufficient demand for all the men to ship on board merchant ships. So numbers of these English seamen, unfortunately, took to piracy. Some of them, it would be more truthful to say, resumed piracy and found their occupation haunting the English Channel, the Skillies being a notorious nest for pirates. Notwithstanding the number of these robbers of the sea, who were always on the lookout, yet, says our friend Smith of Virginia, it is incredible how many great and rich prizes the little barks of the west country daily brought home in regard of their small charge but the strenuous measures which were being now taken in the narrow seas by the north european governments made piracy in this district less remunerative than hitherto in the mediterranean these unemployed seamen knew that piracy was a much better paid industry. They knew that the Moors would be glad to avail themselves of the services of such experienced seamen. So they betook themselves to Barbary. At first, be it remembered, these Englishmen had established themselves as North African pirates on their own without any connection with the moors smith mentioned that ward a poor english sailor and dansker a dutchman here began some time before the moors scarcely knew how to sail a ship an englishman named easton made such a profit that he became says smith a narquis in savoy and Ward lived like a bashaw in Barbary. From these men, the Moors learned how to become good sea fighters. Besides Englishmen, there came also French and Dutch adventurers to join them. Attracted by this mode of life, but very few Spaniards or Italians ever joined their throng after a time however disagreements arose and the inevitable dissensions followed they then became so split up and disunited that the moors and turks began to obtain the upper hand over them and to compel them to be their slaves furthermore they made these expert european sailors teach themselves how to become distinguished in the nautical arts this many an accursed renegado or christian turned turk did till they have made those sally men or moors of barbary so powerful as they be to the terror of all the straits other english pirates hovered about off the irish coasts and three men named respectively jennings harris and thompson in addition to some others were captured and hanged at wapping a number of others were captured and pardoned by james i a contemporary account of rowing in a barbarian galley in the time of elizabeth has been preserved to us written by one thomas sanders i and six more of my fellows he writes 
together with fourscore Italians and Spaniards, were sent forth in a galliot to take a Greekish carmacel, which came into Africa to steal negroes, and went out of Tripolis unto that place, which was two hundred and forty leagues thence. But we were chained three and three to an oar, and we rode naked above the girdle, and the boatswain of the galley walked abaft the mast, and his mate afore the mast, and when their devilish choler rose, they would strike the Christians for no cause, and they allowed us but half a pound of bread a man in a day without any other kind of sustenance water excepted we were then also cruelly manacled in such sort that we could not put our hands the length of one foot asunder the one from the other and every night they searched our chains three times to see if they were fast riveted and the same man related the unhappy experience of a venetian and seventeen captives who after enduring slavery for some time at the hands of the sultan of tripoli succeeded in getting a boat and got right away to sea away they sped to the northward and at length they sighted malta their hopes ran high their confidence was now undoubted on they came nearer and nearer to the land and now they were with only a mile of the shore it was beautifully fine weather and one of them remarked in this petto de dio adesso venio a pitia terra in the despite of god i shall now fetch the shore but the man had spoken with an excess of confidence for presently a violent storm sprang up so that they were forced to up helm and to run right before the gale which was now blowing right on to the tripolitan coast arrived off there they were heartbroken to find that they were compelled to row up and down the very coastline which they had imagined they had escaped from for three weeks they held out as best they could but the weather being absolutely against them and their slender victuals being at length exhausted they were compelled to come ashore hoping to be able to steal some sheep the barbarian moors however were on the watch and knew that these unlucky men would be bound to land for supplies therefore a band of sixty horsemen were dispatched who secreted themselves behind a sand hill near the sea there they waited till the christians had got well inland a good half mile then by a smart movement the horsemen cut off all retreat to the sea whilst others pursued the starving voyagers and soon came back with them they were brought back to the place whence they had so recently escaped the sultan ordered that the fugitives should some of them have their ears cut off while others were most cruelly thrashed the enterprising voyages of the english ships to the levant in the sixteenth century had been grievously interfered with by the algerine galleys roving about the mediterranean especially in proximity to the straits of gibraltar they would set out from england with goods to deliver and then return with mediterranean fruits and other commodities but so often were these valuable ships and cargoes 
captured by the hateful infidels that the english merchants who had dispatched the goods became seriously at a loss and were compelled to invoke the aid of elizabeth who endeavored by means of diplomacy to obtain the release of these ships and to prevent such awkward incidents recurring to give the names of a few such ships and to indicate the loss in regard to ships freights and of men held captive in slavery we have only to mention the following the solomon of plymouth had been captured with a load of salt and a crew of thirty-six men the elizabeth of guernsey was seized with ten englishmen and a number of bretons her value being two thousand florins the maria martin under the command of thomas moore with a crew of thirty-five had been taken while returning from protasso in moria her value was fourteen hundred florins the elizabeth stokes of london under the command of david philly of london whilst bound for Petrasso, had been also captured but her value was twenty thousand or thirty thousand florins the nicholas of london under the command of thomas foster had also been seized at a loss of about five thousand florins so also in like manner could be mentioned the judith of london the jesus of london the swallow of london but england of course was not the only country which suffered by these piratical acts in sixteen seventeen france was moved to take serious action and sent a fleet of fifty ships against these barbarian corsairs off st tropez they captured one of these roving craft and later on met another which was captured by a french renegado of rochelle the latter defended himself fiercely for some time but at length seeing that the day was going against him he sunk his ship and was drowned together with the whole of his crew rather than be captured by the christians and from now onwards right up to the nineteenth century there were at different dates successive expeditions sent against these rovers by the chief european powers many of these expeditions were of little value some were practically useless while others did only ephemeral good thus you will remember the only active service which the navy of our james the first ever saw was in sixteen twenty when it was sent against the pirates of algiers but they had become so successful and so daring that they were not easily to be tackled not content now with roving over the mediterranean not satisfied with those occasional voyages out through the gibraltar straits into the atlantic they now if you please had the temerity to cross the bay of biscay and to cruise about the approaches of the english channel these algerine pirates actually sailed as far north as the south of ireland where they acted just as they had for generations along the mediterranean that is to say they landed on the munster shore committed frightful atrocities and carried away men women and children into the harsh slavery which was so brutally enforced in their barbarian territory what good did the jacobean expeditions which was sent out you may naturally ask 
the answer may be given in the fewest words although the fleet contained six of our royal ships and a dozen merchantmen yet it returned home with no practical benefit the whole affair having been a hopeless muddle in sixteen fifty five blake the great admiral of cromwell's time was sent to tackle these pirate pests it was a big job but there was no one at that time better suited for an occasion that required determination tunis was a very plague spot by its piratical colony and its captives made slaves it had to be humbled to the dust and blake with all the austerity and thoroughness of a puritan officer was resolved to do his duty to christendom but tunis was invulnerable so it was a most difficult undertaking he spent the early spring of this year cruising about the neighborhood biding his time and being put to great inconvenience by foul winds and tempestuous weather he found that these tunis pirates were obstinate and wilful they were unprepared to listen to any reason intractable and insolent it was impossible to treat with them force was the only word to which they could be made to hearken these barbarous provocations wrote blake in giving an account of his activities here did so far work upon our spirits that we judged it necessary for the honor of the fleet our nation and religion seeing they would not deal with us as friends to make them feel us as enemies and it was thereupon resolved at a council of war to endeavor the firing their ships in porto farina tunis itself being invulnerable blake entered the neighboring harbor this porto farina very early in the morning the singular thing was that he was favored with amazingly good luck a fair wind in and a fair wind out but let me tell the story in the admiral's own words accordingly the next morning very early we entered with the fleet into the harbor and anchored before their castles the lord being pleased to favor us with a gentle gale off the sea which cast all the smoke upon them and made our work the more easy after some hours dispute we set on fire all their ships which were in number nine and the same favorable gale still continuing we retreated out again into the road we had twenty-five men slain and about forty besides hurt with very little other loss it was also remarkable by us that shortly after our getting forth the wind and weather changed and continued very stormy for many days so that we could not have effected business had not the lord afforded that nick of time in which it was done but these attacks by the powers were regarded by the pirates as mere pin-pricks for it was nothing to them that even all their galleys should be burnt such craft were easily built again and there was an overwhelming amount of slave labor and plenty of captive seamen to rig these ships as soon as finished so the evil continued and the epidemic spread as before in sixteen fifty eight these barbarian corsairs attacked a ship called the diamond homeward bound from lisbon to venice 
she was laden with a valuable cargo and her captain saw that he would not be able to defend his ship against three galleys so rather than let her fall into piratical hands he determined to destroy her he placed an adequate quantity of powder and then laying a match to the same he jumped into his longboat from which presently he had the pleasure of seeing his enemies blown into space by the terrific explosion just as these infidels were in the act of boarding the diamond ten years later sir thomas allen was sent during the summer with a squadron once more to repress algerine piracy he arrived before algiers and was so successful that he compelled the release of all the english captives which had been accumulating there indeed it is amazing to count up so many of these expeditions from england alone thus in the early spring of sixteen seventy one we find sir edward sprague sent out to the mediterranean for the same purpose the following account is condensed from his own dispatch and is of no ordinary interest on the twentieth of april sprague was cruising in his flagship the revenge about fifteen or twenty miles off algiers when he met his other ships the mary hampshire portsmouth and the advice which were all frigates these informed him that several algerine war craft were at Oji. he called a council of war at which it was agreed that sprague should make the best of his way there with the mary the portsmouth pink and his fireships and he should endeavor to destroy these corsairs in their own lair the hampshire and the portsmouth were left to cruise off algiers till further orders should reach them the wind was now easterly and one of his ships named the dragon had been gone five days as she was busy chasing a couple of algerine corsair craft but as the wind for some days had been from the southwest sprague was in hopes that the chase would have carried the ships to the eastward and thus forth the algerines into boji and so on the twenty third of april the dragon returned to sprague having been engaged for two days in fighting the two algernine craft unfortunately her commander captain herbert whom the reader will remember by his later title when he became the earl of torrington had been shot in the face by a musket shot and nine of his men had also been wounded with small shot the wind continued easterly until twenty eighth april but at eight o'clock that night it flew round to southwest and the weather became very gusty and rainy this called sprague's little eagle fireship to become disabled and she was dismasted by the wind but on the last day of april sprague got her fitted with masts again and re-rigged for luckily he had with him a corn ship captured from the corsairs and her spars together with some topmasts and other spars caused the fire ship to be ready again for service unfortunately the same bad weather caused the warwick to spring her mast an accident that frequently befell the ships of the sixteenth and seventeenth centuries so she bore away to the christian shore my brigantine at the same time bore away and is yet 
i have no news of her the same day this admiral arrived in Bogi bay but here again he had bad luck just as he was within half a shot of the enemy's castles and forts the wind dropped and it fell a flat calm then the breeze sprang up but it blew off shore so the time passed on the second of may the winds were still very fluky and after twice in vain attempting to do anything with these varied puffs sprague resolved to attack by night with his ship's boats and his smallest fireship the water close to the forts was very shallow and the english fireship could be rowed almost as well as a ship's longboat so about midnight he dispatched all the boats he could as well as the eagle fireship under the command of my eldest lieutenant master nugent it was a dark night and the high land was very useful for its obscuring effects nugent leaving one of the long boats with the fire ship in addition to the fire ship's own boat now rowed off to reconnoitre the enemy having first given the fire ship's captain orders to continue approaching until he should find himself in shoal water he was then immediately to anchor nugent had then rowed off and had scarcely left the fireship one minute when after proceeding but a little way over the leaden waters he found himself quite close to where the english squadron was anchored he had thus lost his bearings in the dark and at once steered off again to find the fireship when to his great amazement he suddenly saw the latter burst out into a sheet of flame that of course was another piece of ill luck for it entirely upset all the carefully laid plans and instantly alarmed the enemy it would have been useless to have attempted a boat attack that night so the effort was postponed what had happened was this the little fire ship had been all ready when by an accident the gunner had fired off his pistol this had caused the ignition and so the ship had been lost without any good being done it was a thousand pities as owing to her shallow draught she had been relied upon for getting right close in with this warning the enemy the next day unrigged their ships which lay in their harbour then gathered together all the yards the topmasts and spars generally off these ships together with their cables all this they made into a boom which was buoyed up by means of casks sprague and his fleet watched this being done for there was no wind or as he expressed it we had no opportunity of wind to do anything upon them on the eighth of may they noticed that the corsairs ashore were reinforced by the arrival of horse as well as foot shoulders which the englishmen suspected rightly had come from algiers the bougie corsairs greeted this arrival with wild cheering and by firing of the guns in their ships and castles as well as by the display of colors about noon just as sprague was anxious to reopen operations he was harassed by a flat calm luckily however at two p m a nice breeze sprang up and the revenge dragon advice and mary 
advanced and let go in three and a half fathoms nearer in mooring stem and stern so that their broadsides might face Uji's fortifications the position was roughly thus looking toward Uji, sprague's six ships were moored roughly in a half circle in the following order from left to right first came the portsmouth then the garland the dragon the mary the advice and finally the revenge flagship these were all so to speak in the foreground of the picture in the background were the enemy's ships on the left whilst on the right were the castles and fortifications in the middle distance on the left was the boom defence already noted the revenge was in four fathoms being close up to the castles and walls and the fight began for two hours these ships bombarded bougie's ships and fortresses sprague then decided to make a boat attack his ships still remaining at anchor he therefore sent away his pinnace under the command of a man named harman a reformado seaman of mine a reformado by the way was a volunteer serving with the fleet without a commission yet with the rank of an officer harman was sent because sprague's second lieutenant had been hurt by a splinter in the leg lieutenant pin was sent in command of the mary's boat and lieutenant pierce had charge of the dragon's boat the project was to cut the boom and this was bravely done by these three boats though not without some casualties eight of the mary's boat's crew and her lieutenant were wounded with small shot and the admiral's pinnace seven were killed outright and all the rest were wounded except harman of the dragon's boat's crew ten were wounded as well as her lieutenant and one was killed but the boom had been cut and that was the essential point that being done the admiral then signaled to his one remaining fireship, the little Victory, to do her work. She obeyed and got in so well through the boom that she brought up athwart the enemy's bolt sprits, their ships being aground and fast to the castles. The Victory burnt very well indeed and destroyed all the enemy's shipping ten in all of these ten seven were the best ships of the algerine fleet and of the three others one was a genoese prize and the other had been a ship the pirates had captured from an english crew the commander the master's mate the gunner and one seaman of the fire ship had been wounded badly in the fight but the victory was complete and undoubted on the tenth of may a dutchman who had been captive with the corsairs for three years escaped by swimming off to the revenge and sprague had him taken on board the dutchman informed the english admiral that the enemy admitted that at least three hundred and sixty turkish soldiers had lost their lives in this engagement by fire and gunshot as they could not get ashore from the ships there were in all about nineteen hundred men in addition to those three hundred who came that morning from algiers the dutchman for himself thought the losses far exceeded the number assessed by the enemy he stated that the castles and the town itself had been badly damaged and as all their medicine chests were on the ships and so burnt 
it was impossible for the enemy to dress the wounds of their injured old tricky their admiral is likewise wounded wrote sprague among the enemy's killed was dansker a renegado and our losses consisted only of seventeen killed and forty-one wounded End of chapter nine Chapter Ten of Daring Deeds of Famous Pirates. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Shasta, Oakland, California. Daring Deeds of Famous Pirates by Edward Cabell Chatterton the good ship exchange of bristol a satirical english gentleman who lived in the reign of charles the second and described himself as formerly a servant in england's navy published a pamphlet in sixteen forty eight in which he complained bitterly of the inability of the present government even in spite of the expense of vast quantities of money to clear england's seas of ireland's pirates the latter belonged at this time especially to waterford and wexford a large amount of money he bewailed had been and was still being spent to reduce half a dozen inconsiderable pirates and yet the pirates are not reduced neither are the seas guarded one of these pirates had in february sixteen forty seven in one day taken three small ships and one pinnace of a total value of nine thousand pounds one of these ships whilst defending herself had lost her master and one of her mates as well as five mariners besides other members of her crew wounded and this author of a cordial for the calentior asks if the present government with such an expenditure cannot reduce half a dozen pirates how will england's commonwealth be wasted if the french the danes the dutch or all of them shall infest england's seas well we know now that in time england's navy did actually defeat each of these the dutch french and danes and although the pirates were a real and lasting trouble both in the narrow seas and in the mediterranean yet as the reader has now seen it was no easy matter to crush them more than for a short period in sixteen seventy five we find sir john narborough with a squadron sent to chastise the pirates of tripoli which were interrupting our overseas trade at dead of night he arrived before tripoli manned his ship's boats and sent them into the port under his lieutenant mr cloudsley shovel who in later times was to achieve such naval fame the latter in the present instance seized the enemy's guard boat and so was able to get right in undiscovered he then surprised four tripolitan ships which were all that happened to be in port and having burnt these he returned to narborough's squadron having successfully accomplished that which he was sent to perform without the loss of a man france too at this time having risen to the status of a great naval power was performing her share in putting down this perpetual nuisance in sixteen eighty one 
as the barbarian corsairs had for some time interrupted the french trade across the mediterranean duquesne was sent with a fleet against them he was able to destroy eight galleys in the port of Sio in the archipelago and threw in so many bombs that at length he subjected the corsairs to terms finally in sixteen eighty four he had obtained from them all the french captives and had caused the pirates to pay five hundred thousand crowns for the prizes they had taken and in sixteen eighty two admiral herbert had again been sent out by england against the algernine pirates and now before we leave this period i want to put before the reader the interesting story which centers round the bristol ship named the exchange which was so happily rescued from the algernon parts the story begins on the first of november sixteen twenty one when two ships were sent on their voyage from plymouth the larger of these was the george bonaventure about seventy tons burden the smaller of the two was the nicholas of twenty tons burden and her skipper's name was john rawlins of whom we shall have much to say these two vessels after being freighted by plymouth merchants proceeded down channel past Rochant, and after a fair passage found themselves across the bay round the spanish coast and off trafalgar by the eighteenth of november but the next morning just as they were getting into the straits of gibraltar the watch descried five ships under sail coming towards them as fast as they could in a moment the english ships rightly guessed these were pirate craft and immediately began to escape but in spite of all their efforts the pirates came the more quickly there were five of them in all and the first came right to windward of the english craft the second came up on our luff and presently the remainder also came along their admiral was one calfeter whose ship was described as having upon her main topsail two topgallant sails one above another for of these five ships two were prizes one being a small london ship and the other a west country ship which homeward bound with a cargo of figs and other goods had had the misfortune to fall into the hands of these rovers so the george bonaventure was taken and the turkish vice-admiral whose name was villa rise now called upon the nicholas to strike sail also and rawlins seeing it was useless to do otherwise obeyed the same day before nightfall the turkish admiral sent twelve of the george bonaventure's crew ashore together with some other englishmen whom he had taken prisoners from another previous ship the admiral was doubtless nervous lest with so many english seamen a mutiny might break out so some were set upon a strange land to fare as best they might villa rise the vice-admiral ordered rawlins and five of his company to go aboard villa rise's ship leaving three men and a boy on the nicholas to the latter were sent thirteen turks and moors a right proportion to overmaster the other four in case mutiny should be meditated the ships then set a course for algiers the next night a heavy gale sprang up so that they lost sight of the nicholas and the pirates were afraid their own ships would likewise perish 
On the 22nd of November, Rawlins arrived at Algiers, but the Nicholas had not yet come into port. In this piratical stronghold he found numerous Englishmen now as slaves, and there were a hundred handsome English youths who had been compelled to turn Turks. For these inhuman Moslems, these vipers of Africa, these monsters of the sea, having caught a Christian in their net, would next set about trying to make him change his Christianity for Mohammedanism. If he refused, he would be tortured without mercy until some of them, unable to endure these terrible sufferings any longer, yielded and declared they would become Turks, being yet Christians at heart. These poor, ill-treated English slaves, though bowed down with their own troubles, welcomed this latest batch, and says the contemporary narrator, like good Christians, they bade us be of good cheer and comfort ourselves in this, that God's trials were gentle purgations, and these crosses were but to cleanse the dross from the gold and bring us out of the fire again more clear and lovely. But if these Algerine pirates and taskmasters were ordinarily cruel toward English seamen, they were now the more embittered than ever, for they were still smarting from the injury they had received in May of that year when Sir Robert Mansell's fleet had attempted to fire their ships in the mole. Tortures and all manner of cruelties were dealt out to them by the infuriated Moslems, and there was but little respect for the dignity of humanity. Some of these men, from the George Bonaventure and the Nicholas, were sold by auction to the highest bidder, and the bargainers would assemble and look the sailor men over critically, as if they were at a horse fair, for the Nicholas had arrived safely on the 26th of November. The Bashaw was allowed to take one of these prisoners for himself, the rest being sold. Rawlins was the last to be put up for sale, as he had a lame hand. He was eventually bought by Villa Rise for the sum which, in the equivalent of English money, amounted to seven pounds ten shillings the nicholas carpenter was also bought at the same time these and other slaves were then sent into villa rise's ship to do the work of shipwrights and to start rigging her but some of these algerines became exceedingly angry when they found rawlins because of his lame hand could not do as much work as the other slaves there was a loud complaint and they threatened to send him up country far into africa where he should never see christendom again and be banished for life in the meanwhile there lay at algiers a ship called the exchange of bristol which had some time previously been seized by the pirates here she lay unrigged in the harbor till at last one john goodale an english turk with his confederates understanding she was a good sailor and might be made a proper man of war bought her from the turks that took her and got her ready for sea now the overseer happened to be an english renegado named ramatham rise but his real name was henry chandler and it was through him that goodale became master of the nicholas they resolved that as there were so many english prisoners 
they should have only english slaves for their crew and only english and dutch renegados as their gunners but for soldiers they took also moslems on board one of the saddest aspects of this turkish piracy is the not infrequent mention of men who either from fear or from love of adventure had denied their religion and nationality to become renegades it is easy enough to criticize those who were made so to act by compulsion and heart-rendering tortures such as placing a man flat on the ground and then piling weights on the top of his body till life's breath was almost crushed out of him or thrashing him without mercy till he would consent to become a moslem the ideal man of course will in every instance prefer martyrdom to saving his life by the sacrifice of principles but when the matter is pressed home to us as individuals we may well begin to wonder whether we should have played the man as some of our ancestors did or whether we should after much torturing have succumbed to the temptation of clinging to life at the critical moment of those renegades some were undoubtedly thorough-paced rascals who were no credit to any community but mere worthless men without a spark of honor such as these would as soon become moslems as christians provided it suited their mode of life but it was the knowledge of the sufferings of the other english prisoners which with the loss of ships and merchandise caused the government repeatedly to send out these punitive expeditions one would have thought that the only effective remedy would have been to have left the permanent mediterranean squadron to patrol the north african coast and to chase the corsairs throughout at least the entire summer season but there were many reasons which prevented this the ships could not be spared there were the long drawn out anglo-dutch wars and it was not english ships and seamen exclusively that were the objects of these attacks but if by any means some continuous arrangement between the christian powers had been possible whereby the north african coast could have been systematically patrolled there is little doubt but that endless effort time money lives ships commerce and human suffering might have been saved to-day for instance if piracy along that shore were ever to break out again in a serious manner with ships such as might harass the great european liners trading to the mediterranean the matter would speedily be settled if not by the british mediterranean squadron at least by some international naval force as the boxer troubles in china were dealt with nine english slaves and one frenchman worked away refitting the exchange and in this they were assisted by two of rawlins own seamen named respectively Rowe and davies the former hailed from plymouth the latter from foy or as we spell it nowadays f o w e y now both ramathon rise alias chandler the captain and goodell the master were both west country men so they were naturally somewhat favorably disposed to row and davies and promised them good usage if they did their duty efficiently for these men were to go in the exchange as soon as she was ready for sea roving 
let us remind the reader that the position of the captain in those days was not quite analogous to what we are accustomed to-day rather he was the supreme authority aboard for keeping discipline he was a soldier rather than a sailor and usually was ignorant of seamanship and navigation he told the master where he wished the ship to go and the latter saw that the sailors did their work in trimming sheets steering the ship and so on but the navigator was known as the pilot so too the master gunner was responsible for all the guns shot powder matches and the like ramatha rise the captain and goodell the master now busying themselves getting together a crew for this square-rigged exchange had to find the right kind of men to handle her what they needed most was a good pilot or navigator who was also an expert seaman for neither ramathon rise nor goodell were fit to be entrusted with such a task as soon as the ship should get beyond the straits of gibraltar and out of sight of land they therefore asked davies if he knew among these hundreds of prisoners of any englishman who could be purchased to serve in the capacity of pilot davies naturally thought of his former skipper and after searching for him some time found him and informed his two new taskmasters that he understood that villa rise would be glad to sell rawlins and for all he had a lame hand continued davies yet had he a sound heart and noble courage for any attempt or adventure so at last rawlins was bought for the sum of ten pounds and he was sent to supervise the fitting out of the exchange especially to look after the sales by the seventh of january sixteen twenty two the exchange with her twelve good cannon her munitions and provisions was ready for sea and the same day she was hauled out of the mole in her went a full ship's company consisting of sixty-three turks and moors as soldiers nine english slaves one frenchman four hollanders and two english soldiers as gunners as well as one english and one dutch renegado the good ship with this miscellaneous crew put to sea it was better than slaving away ashore but it was galling to john rawlins a fine specimen of an english sailor to have to serve under these dogs rawlins you must understand was one of those hot-tempered blunt and daring seamen such as had made england what she was in the time of elizabeth forceful direct a man of simple piety of great national pride he was also a sailor possessing considerable powers of resource and organization as we shall presently see the exchange was as fine and handsome a ship as england had built during the elizabethan or early stuart period as she began to curtsy to the swell of the mediterranean sea the slaves were at work looking after the guns and so on rawlins in his brusque fierce manner which is so typical of drake and many another sailor of the late sixteenth or early seventeenth century was working and raging at the same time while he was busying himself among his fellow countrymen pulling ropes and looking after the cannon 
he complained in no measured terms of the indignity of having to work merely to keep these moslem brutes in a life of wickedness he broke out into a torrent of complaint as the other slaves besought him to be quiet lest they should all fare the worse for his distemperature however he had firmly resolved to effect an escape from all this and after mentioning the matter cautiously to his fellow-slaves he found that they were similarly minded from now onwards there follows one of the best yarns in the history of piracy and the story is as true as it is exciting on the fifteenth of january the morning tide had brought the exchange near to cape de gata and they were joined by a small moslem ship which had followed them out of algiers the day after this craft now gave information that she had sighted seven small vessels in the distance six of them being satis a sati was a very fast decked species of galley with a long sharp prow and two or three masts each setting a latine sail the seventh craft was a polaca a three-masted type of mediterranean ship which usually carried square sails on her mainmast but latine sails on her fore and mizzen though some of these vessels had square sails on all three masts before long the exchange also sighted these seven and made towards them but when she had separated the polaca from the rest this craft rather than surrender to the infidels ran herself ashore and split herself on the rocks and her crew made their way inland as near as she dare go the exchange followed in shore and let go anchor when in the shallows both she and the other moslem ship sent out boats with many musketeers and some english and dutch renegades who rowing off to the stranded polaca boarded her without opposition seven guns were found on board but after these had been hurled into the sea the polaca was so lightened that she was floated safely off she was found to have a good cargo of hides and logwood the latter to be used for dyeing purposes in the pillaging of this craft there arose a certain amount of dissension among the pirates and eventually it was decided to send her and the moslem ship which had joined them back to algiers nine turks and one english slave were accordingly taken out of the exchange and six out of the moslem craft to man the polaca till she reached algiers the exchange now alone with a fair wind proceeded through the straits into the atlantic which the turks were wont to speak of as the mar granada notwithstanding anything which has been said in this book so far it must be borne in mind that the turk was essentially not a seaman he had no bias that way he was certainly a most expert fighter however it was not till the renegade english dutch and other sailors settled among them notably those barbarossas and other levantine sailors that the moslems learnt how to use the sea had it not been for these teachers they would have continued like the ottomans strong as land fighters but disappointing afloat these algerine corsairs in the exchange had no sea sense 
and they did not relish going beyond the Gibraltar Straits. So long as they were within sight of land, and in their oared galleys they were given such able seamen-like leaders as the Barbarossas, able to acquit themselves well in any fighting, but to embark in an ocean-going full-rigged ship such as the exchange and to voyage therein beyond their familiar landmarks was to place them in a state of grave concern these moslem never went to sea without their hoshia or wizard and this person would by his charlatanism persuade these incapable mariners what to do and how to act every second or third night after arriving at the open sea this wizard would go through various ceremonies consult his book of wizardry and from this he would advise the captain as to what sails ought to be taken in or what sail to be set the whole idea was thoroughly ludicrous to the rude common-sense devonshire seamen who marveled that these infidels could be so foolish the exchange was wallowing on her way when there suddenly went up a cry a sail a sail presently however it was found only to be another of these moslem corsairs making towards the exchange after speaking each other the ships parted the exchange now going north passed cape st vincent on the lookout for the well-laden ships which passed between the english channel and the straits of gibraltar all this time the english slaves were being subjected to the usual insults and maltreatment the desire to capture the exchange positively obsessed john rawlins and his active brain was busy devising some practical scheme he resolved to provide ropes with broad specks of iron so that he might be able to close up the hatchways gratings and cabins roughly his plan was to shut up the captain and his colleagues and then on a signal being given the englishmen being masters of the gunner room with the cannon and powder would blow up the ship or kill their taskmasters one by one if they should open their cabins it was a daring plan and worthy of a man like rawlins but in all attempts at mutiny it is one thing to conceive a plan and it is another matter to know whom to entrust with the secret in this respect rawlins was as cautious as he was enterprising and he felt his way so slowly and carefully that nothing was done hastily or impetuously or with excess of confidence End of chapter 10chapter eleven of daring deeds of famous pirates this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by shasta oakland california daring deeds of famous pirates by edward kebble chatterton a wonderful achievement rawlins knew he could rely on his fellow countrymen but at first he hesitated to say anything to the four hollanders at last however he found them anxious to join in with the scheme and his next effort was equally successful for he undermined the English 
renegado gunner and three more his associates last of all the dutch renegados of the gunner room were won over and persuaded by the four hollanders the secret had been well kept and rawlins resolved that during the captain's morning watch he would make the attempt now where the english slaves lay in the gun-room there were always four or five crowbars of iron hanging up when the time was approaching when the mutiny should take place rawlins was in the act of taking down his iron crowbar when he had the misfortune to make such a noise with it that it woke up the turkish soldiers and they in alarm roused the other moslems everything was in pitch darkness and it was uncertain as to what would happen presently the turkish boatswain came below with a candle and searched all the parts of the ships where the slaves were lying but he found nothing suspicious other than the crowbar which had apparently slipped down he then went and informed the captain who merely remarked that there was nothing to cause uneasiness as the crowbar not infrequently slipped down but with this unlucky beginning rawlins deemed it best to postpone the undertaking for the present he had intended with the aid of his friends knife in hand to press upon the gunner's breast and the other english renegados and either force them to help or else cut their throats die or consent this was to be the prevailing force and the watchword was to be for god and king james and st george for england in the meantime the exchange continued on her northerly voyage farther and farther away from the coast of barbary still cautious but keen rawlins went about the ship's company and now had persuaded the gunners and the other english renegades to fall in with his project this was one of the riskiest moments of his enterprise but it resulted that there were reciprocal oaths taken and hands given to preserve loyalty to each other yet once again was rawlins to be disappointed for after the renegado gunner had solemnly sworn secrecy he went up the hatchway on deck for a quarter of an hour after which he returned to rawlins in the gunner room then to rawlins surprise in came an infuriated turk with his knife drawn this he presented in a menacing manner to rawlins body the latter cleverly feigning innocence inquired what was the matter and whether it was the turk's intention to kill him to this the turk answered no master be not afraid i think he doth but jest but it was clear to rawlins that the other man had broken his compact and rounded on him so drawing back rawlins drew out his own knife and also stepped toward the gunner's side so that he was able to snatch the knife from the gunner's sheath the turk seeing that now the englishman had two knives to his one threw down his weapon protesting that all the time he had been joking the gunner also whispered in rawlins ear that he had never betrayed the plan nor would he do such a thing 
however rawlins thought otherwise and kept the two knives with him all the night very ingenious was the way in which this rawlins was weaving his net gradually but surely around the ship he succeeded in persuading the captain to head for cape finestra pretending that thereabouts they would be likely to come upon a ship to be pillaged this was perfectly true though the englishman's intention was to get the exchange farther and farther from the straits of gibraltar so that it became less and less likely that the corsairs would send out reinforcements on the sixth of february when about thirty-six miles off the cape a sail was descried the exchange gave chase and came up with her making her strike all her sails whereby we knew her to be a bark belonging to torbay near dartmouth she was laden with a cargo of salt and her crew consisted of nine men and a boy but it came on bad weather so the exchange did not then launch her boat but ordered the torbay ship to let down her boat her master with five men and the boy now rowed off to the exchange leaving behind his mate and two men in the bark the turkish captain now sent ten moslems to man her now among these ten were two dutch and one english renegados who were in our confederacy just as the latter were about to hoist out their boat from the exchange rawlins was able to have a hurried conversation with them he quickly warned them it was his intention that night or the next to put his plan into action and he advised these men to inform the mate and the two men of the torbay bark of this plot and then make for england bearing up the helm whilst the turks slept and suspected no such matter rawlins reminded them that in his first watch about midnight he would show them a light by which the men on the bark might know that the plan was already in action so the boat was let down from the exchange and rowed off to the torbay bark the confederates then told the mate of their intention and he entirely approved of the plan though at first amazed by its ingenuity the fact was that the idea was really much simpler than was at first apparent being sailors the english had the helm of the ship for the turks being only soldiers and ignorant of sea affairs could not say whether their vessel were sailing in the direction of algiers or in the opposite direction they knew nothing of navigation and practically nothing of seamanship so they were in spite of all their brutality more at the mercy of the christians than they had realized but resolved the plotters if by any chance these moslems should guess that the ship was sailing away from algiers then they would at once cut the turks throats and then throw their bodies overboard it will be remembered that the master and some of the torbay bark's crew were now in the exchange and rawlins made it his business to approach these men tactfully and ask them to share in the plan this they resolved to do so far so good now the number of turks 
had been gradually diminishing since the beginning of the cruise for first of all nine turks and one english slave had been sent back to algiers with the polaka prize and now some more had been sent off to the torbay bark had the exchange's captain fully realized how seriously he was diminishing the strength of his own force he could scarcely have done such a foolish thing but throughout the whole plot he was without ever suspecting it being fooled by a clever schemer rollins had all the tact and foresight of a diplomatist combined with the ability to know when to strike and the power to strike hard and all this time while the captain himself was diminishing the number of moslems and simultaneously adding to the number of englishmen by the arrival of the torbay ship rollins in the most impudent manner was going about the ship winning every one except the turkish soldiers over to his side one knows not which to admire most his wonderful courage or his consummate skill for had he made one single error in reposing confidence in the wrong man the death of the Englishman would have been both certain and cruel. And the following step in Rollins's diplomatic advance was even more interesting still. When morning came again, it was now the 7th of February, the Torbay Prize was quite out of sight. This annoyed the captain of the exchange intensely and he began both to storm and to swear he commanded rollins to search the seas up and down but there was not a vestige of the bark she was beyond the horizon in course of time the captain abated his wrath and remarked that no doubt he would see her again in algiers and that all would be well this remark rather worried rollins as he began to fear the captain would order the exchange to return to the straits of gibraltar but rollins did not allow himself to worry long and he proceeded below down into the hold here he found that there was a good deal of water in the bilges which could not be sucked up by the pump he came on deck and informed the captain the latter naturally asked how this had come about that the pump would not discharge this and rollins explained that the ship was too much down by the head and needed to have more weight aft to raise her bows more out of the water he therefore ordered rollins to get the ship trimmed properly the captain was swallowing the bait most beautifully presently he would be hooked rollins explained that we must quit our cables and bring four pieces of ordnance further aft and that would cause the water to flow to the pump the captain being quite ignorant of the ways of a ship ordered these suggestions to become orders and so two of the guns which usually were forward were now brought with their mouths right before the binnacle in the ship were three decks rollins and his mates of the gunner room were warned to be ready to break up the lower deck and the english slaves who always lay in the middle deck were likewise told to watch the hatchways rollins himself persuaded the gunner to let him have as much powder as would prime the guns and quietly warned his confederates to begin the mutiny as soon 
as ever the gun was fired when they were to give a wild shout and hand on the password the time appointed for the crisis was two p m and about that time rawlins advised the master gunner to speak to the captain that the soldiers might come on poop deck and so bring the ship's bows more of the water and cause the pump to work better to this suggestion the captain readily agreed so twenty turkish soldiers came aft to the poop while five or six of the confederates stole into the captain's cabin and brought away various weapons and shields after that rawlins and his assistants began to pump the water later on having made every preparation and considered all details in order to avoid suspicion the members of the gunner room went below and the slaves in the middle deck went about their work in the usual way then the nine english slaves and john rawlins the five men and one boy from the torbay bark the four english renegades the two dutch and the four hollanders lifting up our hearts and thanks to god for the success of the business set to work on the final act of the cleverly conceived plot about noon roe and davis were ordered by rawlins to prepare their matches while most of the turks were on the poop wigging down the stern to bring the water to the pump the two men came with the matches and at the appointed time roe fired one of the guns which caused a terrific explosion immediately this was followed by wild cheering on the part of the confederates the explosion broke down the binnacle and compasses and the soldiers were amazed by the cheering of the christian slaves and then they realized what had happened that there had been a mutiny that the ship had been surprised the turks were mad with fury and indignation calling the mutineers dogs they began to tear up planks of the ship and to attack the confederates with hammers hatchets knives boats oars boat hook and whatever came into their hands even the stones and bricks of the cook room or galley were picked up and hurled at rawlins party but the carefully arranged plot was working out perfectly below the slaves had cleared the decks of all the turks and moors and rawlins now sent a guard to protect the powder and the confederates charged their muskets against the remaining turks killing some of them on the spot the moslems who had been such tyrannical taskmasters now actually called for rawlins so he guarded by some of his adherents went to them the latter fell on their knees and begged for mercy who had shown no mercy to others rawlins knew what he was about and after these tyrants had been taken one by one he caused them to be killed while other turks leapt overboard remarking that it was the chance of war others were manacled and then hurled overboard some poor had yet to be killed outright and then at length the victory and annihilation were complete a careful plotting and good organization and a firmness at the proper time the whole scheme had been an entire success it happened that when the explosion had taken place 
the captain was in his cabin writing and at once rushed out but when he saw the confederates and how matters stood and that the ship was already in other hands he at once surrendered and begged for his life he reminded rawlins how he had redeemed him from villa rise and that he had since treated him with great consideration rawlins had to admit that this was so so he agreed to spare the captain his life as before mentioned the captain was an english renegade whose real name was henry chandler he being the son of a chandler in southwark so this man was brought back to england as well as john goodell richard clark the gunner alias jaffar in turkish george cook gunner's mate alias ramadan in turkish john brown alias mom in turkish and william winter the ship's carpenter alias mustafa in turkish besides all the slaves and hollanders with other renegados who were willing to be reconciled to their true savior as being formally seduced with the hopes of riches honor preferment and such like devilish baits to catch the souls of mortal men and entangle frailty in the terriers of horrible abuses and imposturing deceit the englishmen now set to work and cleared the ship of the dead moslem bodies and then rawlins assembled his men and gave praise to god using the accustomed service on shipboard and for want of books lifted up their voices to god as he put into their hearts or renewed their memories and after having sung a psalm they embraced each other for playing the men in such a deliverance the same night they washed the ship of the carnage put everything in order repaired the broken quarter which had been damaged by the explosion set up the binnacle again and made for england on the thirteenth of february the exchange arrived at plymouth where they were welcomed like the recovery of the lost sheep or as you read of the loving mother that runneth with embraces to entertain her son from a long voyage and escape of many dangers as for the torbay bark she too had got back to england having arrived at penzance two days before her story is brief but not less interesting the mate had been informed of rawlins plan and he and his friends had agreed but the carrying out of this had been a far simpler and neater matter than that which had taken place on the exchange for once again mere landsmen had been fooled at the hands of seamen it happened on this wise they made the turks believe that the wind had now come fair and that the prize was being sailed back to algiers this they believed until they sighted the english shore when one of the turks remarked that that land is not like cape st vincent to this the man at the helm replied very neatly yes and if you will be contented and go down into the hold and turn the salt over to windward whereby the ship may bear a full sail you shall know and see more to-morrow suspecting nothing the five turks then went quietly down but 
as soon as they had gone below into the hold the renegados with the help of two englishmen nailed down the hatches and kept the rascals there till they reached penzance but one of the other turks was on deck and at this incident he broke out into great rage this was but short-lived for an englishman stepped up to him dashed out his brains and threw his body overboard all the other prisoners were brought safely to england and lodged either in plymouth jail or exeter either to be arraigned according to the punishment of delinquents in that kind or disposed of as the king and council shall think meet we need not stop to imagine the joy of welcoming back men who had been lost in slavery we need not try to guess the delight of the west countrymen that at last some of these renegados had been brought back to be punished in england there is not the slightest doubt of this story of the exchange being true but it shows that even in that rather disappointing age which followed on immediately after the defeat of the armada there were at a time when maritime matters were under a cloud not wanting english seamen of the right stamp men of courage and action men who could fight and navigate a ship as in the spacious days of queen elizabeth happily the type of man which includes such sailor characters as rollins is not yet dead the anglo-saxon race still rears many of his caliber and it needs only the opportunity to display such nerve daring enterprise and tactful action End of chapter 11Chapter 12 of Daring Deeds of Famous Pirates. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Alan Dove. Daring Deeds of Famous Pirates by Edward Kebble Chatterton. Chapter 12 The Great Sir Henry Morgan. About the year 1636, a certain London mariner named Dunton had an experience somewhat similar to that which we related in the last chapter concerning Rawlins. Dunton had the bad luck to be taken by the Salee pirates, who then sent him out as master and pilot of a Salee pirate ship containing twenty-one moors and five Flemish renegados. The instructions were that Dunton should sail to the English coast and there capture Christian prisoners. He had arrived from Barbary in the English Channel and was off Hurst Castle by the Needles, Isle of Wight, when he was promptly arrested as a pirate and sent to Winchester to be tried by law. He was given his release at a later date, but his ten-year-old boy was still a slave with the Algerines. Now about the year when this was taking place, there was born into the world Henry Morgan, who has become celebrated in history and fiction as one of the greatest sea rovers who ever stepped aboard a ship. His career is one of continual success, of cruelties, and amassing of wealth. He was a buccaneer and a remarkably clever fellow who rose to the position of governor-general of one of our most important colonial possessions. Adventures are to the adventurous, and if ever there was a Britisher who longed for and obtained a life of excitement, here you have it in the story of Henry Morgan. It would be easy enough to fill the whole of this book and more with his activities afloat, but as our space is limited and there are still many other pirates of different seas to be considered, it is necessary to confine ourselves to the main facts of his career. The date of his birth is not quite certain, but it is generally supposed to belong to the year 1635. He first saw light in Glamorganshire, and his existence was tinged with adventure almost from the first, for whilst he was a mere boy he was kidnapped and sold as a servant at Barbados. Thus it was that he was thrust on to the region of the West Indies, and in this corner of the world, so rich in romance, so historic for its association with Spanish treasure ships of Elizabethan times, so reminiscent of Drake and others, 
he was to perform deeds of daring, which as such are not unworthy to be ranked alongside the achievements of the great Elizabethan seaman. But he differed from Drake in one important respect. The Elizabethan was severe even to harshness, but he was a more humane being than Morgan. All the wonderful things which the Welshman performed are overshadowed by his cruel, brutish atrocities. In a cruel, inhuman age, Morgan unhappily stands out as one of the wickedest sailors of his time. And yet, although we live in an epoch which is somewhat prone to whitewashing the world's most notorious criminals, yet we must modify to popular judgment which prevails in regard to Morgan. To say that he was a pirate and nothing else is not accurate. At heart, he certainly was this. But as Sir John Lawton, our greatest modern naval historian, has already pointed out, he attacked only those who were the recognized enemies of England. I admit that in practice, especially in the case of men of such piratical character as Henry Morgan, the difference between privateering and piracy is very slight. The mere possession of a permission to capture the ships belonging to other people is nothing compared to a real sea-robbing intention. Morgan was lucky in having been required for a series of certain peculiar emergencies. His help happened at the time to be indispensable, and so he was able to do legally what otherwise he would have done illegally. All those seizures were legalized by the commission which he was granted at various times. But this is not to say that without those commissions he would not have acted in a somewhat similar manner. We are accustomed to speak of Morgan and his associates as buccaneers. Now let us understand at once the meaning of this term. Originally the word meant one who dried and smoked meat on a boucan. A boucan was a hurdle made of sticks on which strips of beef, newly salted, were smoked by the West Indians. But the name of buccaneers was first given to the French hunters of Santo Domingo, who prepared their meat according to this Indian custom. From the fact that these men who so prepared the flesh of oxen and wild boars were also known for another characteristic, namely piracy, the name was applied in its widest sense to those English and French sea rovers of the 17th and 18th centuries who employed their time in depredating Spanish ships and territory of the Caribbean Sea. Hence, from signifying a man who treated his food in a certain fashion, the word buccaneer came to mean nothing more or less than a robber of the sea. After young Morgan had finished his time in service at Barbados, he joined himself to these buccaneer robbers after arriving at Jamaica. It should be added that Morgan's uncle, Colonel Edward Morgan, went out from England in 1664 to become Governor General of Jamaica, but his death occurred in the following year. There are gaps in Morgan's life, and there has been some confusion caused by others possessing the same surname. But it appears pretty certain now that in the year 1663, Henry Morgan was at sea in command of a privateer. Even by this time, he had begun to be an expert in depredation and in sacking some of the Caribbean towns, and striking terror into the hearts of the wretched inhabitants. We may pass over these minor events and come to the time when, his uncle having died, Sir Thomas Modiford was sent out from England as lieutenant governor. Bear in mind that intense hatred of the Spanish prevailed at this time, which had not been by any means quenched by the defeat of the Armada. To put it mildly, the Caribbean Sea was an Anglo-Spanish cockpit where many and many a fight had taken, and was still to take, place. Modiford wanted the island of Curacoa to be taken, and there was then no better man to do the job than a very celebrated buccaneer named Edward Mansfield. Sir Thomas therefore commissioned Mansfield to seize this island. He got together a strong naval expedition and accomplished the task early in the year 1666, Henry Morgan being in command of one of Mansfield's ships. Off the Nicaraguan coast lies an island which has been called at different times Santa Catalina or Providence Island. This had been taken from the English by the Spaniards more than 20 years before, and Morgan was also present when Mansfield now recaptured it. A small garrison was left to occupy it, and Mansfield returned with his ships to Jamaica. But before long, Santa Catalina fell again into the hands of the Spaniards, and Mansfield died. It is now that Morgan's career begins to come into the limelight, for after Mansfield's decease, the buccaneers, bereft of their leader, thought the matter over and decided to make Morgan his successor and the commissions which Mansfield had been accustomed to receive from Modiford now fell to the Welshman. The first of these duties occurred when Modiford became aware of a rumor that the Spaniards were contemplating an invasion of Jamaica. It was nothing more than a rumor, but as governor he decided to find out the truth. He therefore dispatched Morgan to ascertain the facts. He was directed to get ten ships together and to carry five hundred men in this fleet. 
The ships gathered on the south side of Cuba, and then, having accomplished their voyage, Morgan landed his men and found that the people had fled from the coast, driving all their cattle away. Morgan marched inland, plundered the town of Puerto Principe, and then was able to send information to Modiford that considerable forces were being collected and that an expedition against Jamaica was, in truth, being planned. He had fulfilled his commission as instructed. His next big achievement occurred when he sailed to the mainland in order to attack Portobello, where levies were being made to attack Jamaica. Several Englishmen were known also to be confined here in grim dungeons, and if any further incentive were required, this would certainly rouse the ire and sharpen the keenness of Morgan and his men. Portobello relied for its defense on three forts, and it was likely to be no easy work to compel these to yield. But Morgan succeeded in his object, and this is how he went to work. Arrived in the vicinity of Portobello, he left his ships and, under the cover of night, proceeded towards the shore with his men in about two dozen canoes. By three o'clock in the morning, his force had crept into the shore and landed. The first fort was assaulted by the aid of ladders, and the garrison was slaughtered. So, too, the second fort was attacked. Hither the Spanish governor had betaken himself. For a time it offered a stout resistance, but Morgan had a number of ladders so made that they were wide enough to allow several men to climb up abreast of each other. By this means the castle walls were overcome, the castle itself taken, and the governor slain. The third fort surrendered, the town was sacked, and then, for over a fortnight, the buccaneers indulged themselves, as was their wont in debauchery. I have no intention of suggesting the details, either of these excesses, nor of the abominable tortures to which the inhabitants were now subjected, in order to compel them to reveal the places where their treasures were hidden. Not even the most unprincipled admirer of the buccaneers could honestly find it possible to defend Morgan and his associates against the most serious charges on the ground of common justice. Morgan may not have been any worse than some of his contemporaries at heart, but whatever else he was, he was an unmerciful tyrant. As for his enemies, we cannot regard them with much admiration either. This Dago crowd were morally not much better than the Welshmen, and though sometimes they put up a good fight, they were too often cowards. In this present instance, they adopted that futile and weak plan of buying off the aggressor. You will remember that, unfortunately, our ancestors adopted this plan many hundreds of years ago when they sought to ward off the Viking depredators by buying peace. It was a foolish and an ineffectual method both then and in the 17th century in the case of Morgan. For what else does such an action mean than a confession of inferiority? Peace at this price is out of all proportion to the ultimate value obtained, and the condition is merely a temptation to the aggressor to come back for more. Stripped of any technicality, Morgan blackmailed these Panamanians to the extent of 100,000 pieces of eight and 300 negroes. On these conditions, which were agreed upon, he consented to withdraw. So, very well rewarded for his trouble, Morgan returned joyfully to Jamaica, and for some time the buccaneers were able to indulge themselves in the pleasures which this booty was capable of affording them. You will generally find that a buccaneer, a highwayman, a gambler, a smuggler, or any kind of pirate by land or by sea is a spendthrift. There are certainly exceptions, but this is the rule. A man who knows that he can easily get more money when he runs short shows no reserve in spending, provided it affords him gratification. So with these buccaneers. At length they came to the end of their resources and were ready to go forth again. It is true that Modiford had been in two minds after Morgan's return from Portobello. He rejoiced at the success of his arms, but he was nervous of the consequences. The Welshman had certainly exceeded his commission, and there might be trouble, as a result, at headquarters. And yet there was work to be done, and Morgan was the only man who could do it. So once more, Modiford had to commission him to carry out hostilities against the Spaniards. To the eastward of Jamaica lies the island of Santo Domingo, or as it was known in those days, Hispaniola. If you were to examine a chart of Hispaniola, you would see in the southwest corner a bay and a small island. The latter is known as Vache Island. This was to be the meeting place where Morgan was now to collect his ships. Apart from being a good anchorage, it was a convenient starting place if one wished to attack either the mainland of Central America or Cuba. In the present instance, the objective was in the latter. The ships got underway, Morgan arrived at the scene of operations, and positively ravaged the Cuban coast, again striking terror wherever he went. But, important as this was, it is not to be reckoned alongside the achievement which he performed in the early part of 1669. On the north coast of South America is a wide gulf which opens out into the Caribbean Sea. 
but as this gulf extends southward, the shores on either side narrow so closely that the shape resembles the neck of a bottle. The town here is named Maracaibo. But a little distance still farther south, the shores on either side recede considerably like the lower portion of a bottle, and there extends a vast lagoon which takes its name from the town mentioned. It is obvious to anyone that the strategical point is at the neck, and when I mentioned that here the navigation was both tricky and shallow, and that the channel was protected by a strong castle, the reader will instantly appreciate that anyone who tried to bring his ships into the lake would have a very difficult task. Now in the month of March, Morgan, with eight ships and 500 men, had arrived off this entrance. With great daring and dogged determination, he was able to force his way in through this narrow entrance. He not only dismantled the fort, but he sacked the town of Maracaibo in his own ruthless manner. Then he followed up his attack by scouring the neighboring woods and put the captured and terrified inhabitants to cruel tortures in order to compel them to reveal the hiding places of their valuables. He captured many a prisoner and at length, very well satisfied with his success, after the lapse of three weeks, decided to advance still farther. He had got his ships through the most difficult portion and now he intended to navigate the lagoon itself. At length he arrived at a town called by the inhabitants Gibraltar, after the European place of that name. Here Morgan again satiated himself with plunder, with cruelties, and with debauchery until the time came for him to take his ships away with all the booty they could carry. But the serious news reached them that awaiting them off the entrance to the gulf were three Spanish men of war. Still more serious was the information that the castle at Maracaibo had now been efficiently manned and armed. That was more than awkward, for without the permission of the fort it was quite impossible for his ships to make their exit in safety. The situation would have puzzled many a fine strategist. Here was the buccaneer positively trapped with no means of escape. But Morgan was quite equal to the occasion, and he set to work. His first object was to gain time, and so he began by opening negotiations with the Spanish Admiral Don Alonso del Campo y Espinosa. He knew these negotiations would prove fruitless, as indeed they did. But in the meantime, Morgan had been busily employing his men in getting ready a fire ship. In our modern days of steel hulls, fire ships play no part in naval tactics. But in the time of oak and hemp, this mode of aggression continued till very late. The fire ship would first be filled with combustible material, and then released, the wind or current taking her down onto the enemy's ships. The grapnel irons projecting from her side would foul the enemy, and it would be no easy matter to thrust the fire ship off until she had done considerable damage by conflagration. This method of warfare was one of the oldest tactics in the history of naval fighting. It was successful over and over again, and the reader can well imagine that the sight of a flaming ship rapidly approaching a fleet of anchored ships with the tide was really terrifying. And even if the attacked ships were underway and not brought up, it made little difference. For the flames would immediately set on fire a ship's sails, and the tarred rigging would soon be ablaze, rendering the attacked ship disabled. Of course it was possible at times for a fleet underway so to maneuver as to get out of the direction towards which the fire vessel was traveling. But Morgan was up to every eventuality. The fire ship he disguised as a man of war, and she was not yet set alight. With this craft looking just like one of his own, he took his fleet to look for the Spanish men of war. On the 1st of May he found them just within the entrance to the lagoon. He now made straight for them, and setting the fire ship alight when quite near, sent her right alongside the Spanish flagship, a vessel of 40 guns. The latter was too late to shake her off, burst into flames, and soon foundered. Another Spanish ship was so terror-stricken that her crew ran ashore, and she was burnt by her own men lest she should fall into the hands of the buccaneers. The third was captured after heavy slaughter. Some of the Spaniards succeeded in swimming ashore, among whom was the Admiral Don Alonso himself. Morgan was able to capture a number of prisoners, and from these men he learned tidings which must have sent a thrill of great joy through his avaricious mind. The sunken ship had gone down with 40,000 pieces of eight. So the buccaneer took steps to recover as much of this treasure as he could, and salved no less than 15,000, in addition to a quantity of melted silver. His next work was to have the prize ship refitted, and her he adopted as his own flagship. So far, so good. But he was still in the lagoon, and the door of the trap was yet closed as before, although the enemy's ships had been now disposed of. 
He again opened negotiations with Don Alonso, and it is surprisingly true that the latter actually paid Morgan the sum of 20,000 pieces of eight and 500 head of cattle as a ransom for Maracaibo. But, on the other hand, Don Alonso declined to demean himself by granting Morgan permission to take his ships out. That, of course, set Morgan's brain working. He was determined to put out to sea, and it was only a question of stratagem. He therefore allowed the Spaniards to gain the impression that he was landing his men so as to attack the fort from the landward side. This caused the Spaniards to move the guns of the fort to that direction, leaving the seaward side practically unarmed. That was Morgan's chance, and he fully availed himself thereof. It was night time, and there was the moon to help him. He waited till the tide was ebbing, and then, allowing his ships to drop down with the current, he held on until he was off the fort, when he spread sail, and before long was well on his way to the northward. It was a clever device for getting out of a very tight corner. So he sailed over the Spanish main with rich booty from Gibraltar, with 15,000 pieces of eight from the wreck, with another 20,000 from Alonso, with a new ship and other possessions. Certainly the voyage had been most fortunate and remunerative. He reached Jamaica in safety, but again Modiford was compelled to reprove him for having exceeded his commission. But the same thing happened as before. The Spaniards were becoming more and more aggressive towards the English in the West Indies, and it was essential that they should be given a severe lesson before worse events occurred. Morgan was the only man for the task, and he was now appointed commander-in-chief of the warships of the Jamaican station and sent forth with full authority to seize and destroy all the enemy's vessels that could be found. He was further to destroy all stores and magazines, and for his pay he was to have all the goods and merchandise which he could lay his hands on, his men being paid the customary share that was usual on buccaneering expeditions. We find him, then, at the middle of August 1670, leaving Port Royal, now better known as Kingston, Jamaica, and as before, his rendezvous was Vache Island. With this as his base, he sent ships for several months to ravage Cuba and the mainland, and as usual, refreshed himself, as an Elizabethan would have said, with the things he was in most need, such as provisions. But he was able also to obtain a great deal of valuable information, and at length sailed in a southwest direction till he came to that island of Santa Catalina, which we mentioned earlier in this chapter as having been taken by the Spaniards. This he now recaptured, and thereafter he was to perform another wonderful feat. The object he had conceived was to capture Panama. It was another bold idea, boldly carried out. First of all, then, he sent from Santa Catalina four of his ships and a boat and nearly 500 men under the leadership of Captain Broadley. These, after a three days' voyage, arrived off Chagres Castle, which is at the mouth of the river Chagres, not far from where the modern Panama Canal comes out. In a remarkably short time, Broadley was able to capture this castle, and presently Morgan arrived with the rest of his expedition. Having made security doubly sure, he proceeded inland, taking his ships up the river Chagres. But after he had gone some distance, it was found that, through a lack of rain, the river had dried considerably. He therefore left 200 men behind to hold the place, and with the rest of his forces he set out to march on foot. He did not hamper his expedition with provisions, as he trusted to obtain supplies from the inhabitants whose dwellings he passed. On the tenth day he had arrived at his destination. Before him lay Panama and the Pacific. But the Spaniards were there on the plain to meet his forces with a considerable strength, consisting of 3,000 infantry and cavalry as well as some guns. But the Spaniards had also ready a unique tactic which seems almost ludicrous. We have already referred slightly to the cattle, which were a feature of this region of the globe. The Spaniards decided to employ such in battle. So between themselves and the English, they interposed a vast herd of wild bulls, which were driven on in the hope of breaking the English ranks. The wild stampede of creatures of this sort is not likely to make for order, but like the boomerang on land and the ram in naval warfare, such a device is capable of being less damaging to the attacked than to the attacker. For, as it happened, many of these bulls were shot dead by the English, and the rest of the animals turned their heads round and made for the Spanish, trampling many of them underfoot. The English gained the day, the Spaniards were put to flight, and although the buccaneers lost heavily, yet the other side had lost 600 dead. The city of Panama was captured early in the afternoon, and yet again Morgan scooped in an amazing amount of booty. There was the same series of tortures, of threats, and there was a total absence of anything noble-minded in the way Morgan went about his way, satisfying his greed for gold. 
But he had just missed one very big haul, and this annoyed him exceedingly, for when the Spaniards saw their men were being defeated, they sent to sea a Spanish galleon which was full of money, church plate, and other valuables, worth far more than ever Morgan had obtained from what was left in Panama. The expedition started on its return journey overland, and after twelve days arrived at Chagres. Here the great quantity of booty was divided up among the crews, but the men were not satisfied with their share, protested that they had been cheated of their full amount, and much discontent ensued. There can be little doubt but that this was so, and that Morgan had enriched himself at the expense of his men. However, he managed to slip away to his ship, followed by only a handful of his former fleet, and once again found himself in Jamaica. Here he received the formal thanks of the governor, but there was trouble brewing, for while Morgan had been away, a treaty had been signed at Madrid concerning Spanish America. It is true that Modiford had, in those days of slow communication, known nothing of it, but he was recalled, and he returned to England a prisoner to answer for his having supported and encouraged buccaneering. The following year, Morgan was also sent to England in a frigate, but Charles II took a great liking to this daredevil, and in 1674 sent him back again to Jamaica, this time with the rank of colonel and with the title of knighthood, to be not a buccaneer but lieutenant governor of Jamaica. If ever there was an instance of the ungodly flourishing, here it is. Fourteen years longer did Morgan continue to live in this island as a rich man possessing social prestige. It is true that he made a good governor, but although he had defeated Alonso, reduced Panama, made a clever escape from Maracaibo, taken Santa Catalina, and been a veritable thorn in the side of the Spaniards, yet he had been a brute, and he died a brute. He was a blackmailer on a large scale, he was unmercifully a tyrant, and he was a profligate. It is only because he attacked the enemies of his own government, and because he was lucky to obtain the commissions demanded by law, that he is prevented from being reckoned as a mere common pirate. But if there is honor among most thieves, what shall we say of Morgan's dishonesty and harshness in cheating the very men who had fought under him of their fair share of plunder when the battle was won? It is, perhaps, hardly fair to judge even a Morgan except by the prevailing standards of his time. But those who care to look up the details of Morgan's private life will find much to condemn, even if there is something to admire in his exceptional cleverness and undoubted courage. The sea is a hard school and makes hard men harder, and in those days when might was right and every ocean more or less in a chaotic state of lawlessness, when poverty or chance or despair or the irresistible longing for adventure drove men to become pirates, there was no living for a soft-hearted sailor. He had to fight or be fought. He had to swim with the tide or else sink. The luckiest and cleverest became the worst terrors of the sea, while the least fortunate had either to submit to the strong or else end their days in captivity. Morgan, having been kidnapped while young, may have been driven to kidnap others by sea, or there may have been other causes at work. One thing, however, is certain. The world is not made the richer by the advent of such a man as this Welsh buccaneer. End of chapter 12「Chapter 13 of Daring Deeds of Famous Pirates. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Heather Eney. Daring Deeds of Famous Pirates by Edward Keeble Chatterton. Blackbeard Teach. The sea rovers whom we know by the name of buccaneers had an origin somewhat similar to that of the Moslem corsairs of Barbary. The reader will not have forgotten that the latter, after being driven out of Spain, settled on the north coast of Africa, and then, after being instructed in the nautical arts by the seamen of different nationalities, rose to the rank of grand corsairs. So, likewise, the buccaneers were at first inoffensive settlers in Hispaniola, but after having been driven from their habitations by the Spaniards, developed an implacable hatred of the latter and devoted themselves to infesting the shores of Spanish America and intercepting ships on their way over the sea. And just as the Moslem corsairs were a mixture of several nations, English, Dutch, Levantin, Italian, and so on, in like manner, the company of buccaneers before long was made up of various European seamen from many a different port. But among the English buccaneers, a special place must be reserved for a Bristol seaman named Edward Teach, better known as Blackbeard Teach. 
just as we remember the great Muslim corsair was known as Redbeard Rouge or Barbarossa. Teach left the west of England and, having arrived in Jamaica, shipped as one of the crew of a privateer during the French War, and was not long in showing that he was made of the right stuff of which those who rove the seas for booty are supposed to be. But it was not until a Captain Benjamin Hornigold gave him the command of a prize which he had taken that Teach began to have his full opportunity. In the spring of 1717, Hornigold and Teach sailed away from the West Indies for North America. Before they had reached their destination, they had captured a vessel with 120 barrels of flour, which they distributed between their two vessels. A little later, they seized two more vessels, from which they obtained a quantity of wine and treasure. The pirates next proceeded to the coast of Virginia where they cleaned ship, and then, after these diversions, they captured a ship bound for Martinique. Hornigold now returned with his prizes to the island of Providence, and presently surrendered himself to the king's clemency. But Teach went about his business as an independent pirate now. The vessel in which he sailed was fitted with forty guns, and he named her the Queen Anne's Revenge, and he began rapidly to accumulate wealth. One day, while cruising near the island of St. Vincent, he captured a large vessel called the Great Allen, pillaged her of what he fancied, and then set her on fire. Only a few days later, the Scarborough Man of War hove in sight, and for several hours the two ships engaged. The former recognized that Teach was a pirate and he was endeavoring to conquer him, but it is a fact that after a time the Scarborough, seeing she was not a match for the Queen Anne's Revenge, deemed it better to retire from the contest, thus allowing Teach to resume his piratical profession. He next found himself encountering a sloop, which was commanded by a Major Bonnet, and Teach and Bonnet agreed to throw in their lot together. But as Blackbeard soon saw that Bonnet was inexperienced in naval matters, The former gave the command of the sloop to one of the crew named Richards, whilst Bonnet transferred to the larger ship, and then the two craft went roaming over the seas with singular success. Indeed, were to one mention every ship that Teach captured, the reader would find the catalogue to be one of mere monotony. The pirate had but to give chase after a sail, hoist his black flag, and the fleeing ship would heave to and surrender. But as I believe the reader would find it more interesting to become acquainted with the more interesting episodes, rather than a complete list of every single engagement, I propose to confine myself to the former. Teach cruised about the West Indies and off the southern portion of what are now the United States. He would anchor off Charleston, South Carolina, wait till an outward bound ship emerged from the harbor, and then promptly seize her, or just to vary matters, he would capture a couple of others as they were about to enter Charleston. The impudence of the man was amazing, and his audacity spread terror in the town and paralyzed the trade of port. No vessel dared to show her nose outside the harbor, and a whole fleet of ships was thus tied up inside, unable to move. And then, like many of these pirates, Teach showed how remarkably clever and resourceful he was. By this time, he had captured quite a large number of prisoners, and it became essential that medicine supplies should be procured by some means. To this end, he had the remarkable impudence to demand a medicine chest from the governor, and this request was made neither diplomatically nor even politely. He asked for it with consummate insolence. He sent some of his own crew ashore together with several of the prisoners demanding these medicinal stores, and it was made quite clear to the governor that if these were not forthcoming and a safe return made to the ships, every prisoner should instantly be put to death and the captured ships burnt to ashes. Whilst these negotiations were being carried on by the little deputation of prisoners, the pirate's crew were swaggering up and down the streets of Charleston, and not a hand dared to touch them. The governor was in a dilemma and listened carefully to the insolent demand, but as he was anxious to prevent human carnage, he got together medicinal supplies to the value of over 300 pounds and sent them aboard. But to show you what sort of a man Teach was, let it be said that as soon as the pirate obtained these goods and the safe return of his own men, 
He pillaged the captured vessels of all their gold and provisions, then put the prisoners back on their respective ships and set sail for North Carolina. On the way thither, Teach began to consider how he could best secure the spoil for himself and a few of his especial friends among the crew. So he pretended that he was about to give his ship's bottom a scrub and headed for the shore where she grounded. He then called to the sloop to come to his assistance. This they attempted, but the sloop also took the ground badly, and both ships became total wrecks. Teach then took the tender, put forty hands therein, had about half of them landed on a lonely sandy island three miles from the shore, where there was neither bird nor beast nor herb for their subsistence. Had it not been for Major Bonnet, who afterwards sent a longboat for them, they would have died. Meanwhile, Teach, now very rich, with the rest of his crew, went and surrendered himself to the governor of North Carolina. Why? Not for any other reason than in order to plan out bigger piracies. For he knew that the governor would succumb to bribery, and by this official's influence, a court of vice-admiralty was held and the Queen Anne's revenge condemned as a lawful prize and the legal property of Teach although it was a well-known fact that she belonged to English merchants. It was not long before Teach was at sea again, and setting a course for Bermudas, he pillaged four or five English and French merchantmen and brought one of the ships back to North Carolina, where he shared the prizes with the governor who had already obliged him. Teach also made an affidavit that he had found this French ship at sea with not a soul on board, so the court allowed him to keep her, and the governor received 60 hogsheads of sugar for his kindly assistance. Teach was very nervous lest someone might arrive in the harbor and prove that the pirate was lying. So on the excuse that this ship was leaky and likely to stop up the entrance to the harbor if she sank, permission was obtained from the governor to burn her. And when that had been done, her bottom was sunk so that she might never exist as a witness against him. But the time came when the piracies of this teach could no longer be endured. Skippers of trading craft had already lost so heavily that it was resolved to take concerted action. The skippers knew that the governor of Virginia was an honorable man, and they laid the matter before him, begging that an armed force might be sent from the men of war to settle these infesting pirates. The governor consulted the men of war captains as to what had best be done, and it was decided to hire two small vessels which could pursue Blackbeard into all those inlets and creeks which exist on the American coast. These were to be manned by men from the warships and placed under the command of Lieutenant May. A proclamation was also issued offering a handsome reward to any who within a year should capture or destroy a pirate. But before we go on to watch the exciting events with which this punitive expedition was concerned, I want the reader to realize something more of the kind of pirate they were to chase. A few actual incidents will reveal his character better than many words. The story is told that on a certain night when Blackbeard was drinking in his cabin with Israel Hands, who was master of the Queen Anne's Revenge, the ship's pilot and a fourth man, Teach suddenly took up a pair of pistols and cocked them underneath the table. When the fourth man perceived this, he went up on deck, leaving Teach, Hands, and the pilot together. As soon as the pistols were ready, Teach blew out the light, crossed his arms, and fired at the two men. The pistol did not harm, but the other wounded hands in the knee. When Teach was asked why he did this, he replied with an oath. If I didn't now and then kill one of you, you would forget who I was. And there is another anecdote which shows his vanity in a curious manner. Like most blackguards, he was anxious to pose as a person who set no limits to his endurance. Those were the days of braggadocio, of pomposity, and hard drinking and hard swearing. It happened on this particular occasion that the ship was doing a passage and Teach was somewhat high-spirited through the effect of the wine, and he became obsessed with the idea of making his crew believe that he was a devil incarnate. Come, he roared to some of his men, let us make a hell of our town and try how long we can bear it. It was obviously the prank of a drunken braggart, but with several others, he went down into the hold of the ship and closed up all the hatches. 
He then filled several pots of brimstone and other combustible matter and set it on fire. Quickly, the hold became so bad that the men were almost suffocated and some of them clamored for the air. The hatches were at last opened and Teach was as proud of having been able to hold out the longest as if he had just captured a well-freighted prize. And finally, you can also appreciate the man's vanity in a totally different manner. His name was derived from his long black beard, which caused him to look exceedingly repellent. But he would sometimes even stick lighted matches under his hat, which, burning on either side of his face, lit up his wild, fierce eyes and made his general appearance so repulsive that he exactly reflected his own character. But to resume our story at the point where we digressed, about the middle of November 1717, Lieutenant Maynard set out in a quest of Blackbeard and four days later came in sight of the pirate. The expedition had been fitted out with every secrecy and care was taken to prevent information reaching Teach. But the tidings had reached Teach's friend, the governor of Bermudas, and his secretary. The latter therefore sent a letter to warn Teach to be on his guard. But Teach had before now been the recipient of false news, and he declined to believe that he was being hunted down. In fact, it was not until he actually saw the sloops which had been sent to catch him that he could realize the true state of affairs. Maynard had arrived with his sloops in the evening of a November day and deemed it wiser to wait till morning before the attack. Teach was so little concerned, however, that he spent the night in drinking with the skipper of a trader. Blackbeard's men fully realized that there would be an engagement the next day, and one of them ventured to ask him a certain question. If, inquired the man, anything should happen to Teach during the engagement, would his wife know where he had buried his money? Blackbeard's reply was short and concise. Nobody but the devil and myself, he answered, knows where it is, and the longest liver shall take all. When the morning came, Maynard weighed anchor and sent his boat to sound the depth of the water where the pirate was lying. Teach then promptly fired at the boat, but Maynard then hoisted his royal colors and made towards Blackbeard as fast as oars and sails could carry him. Before long, both the pirate and two sloops were aground, but Maynard lightened his vessel of her ballast and water and then advanced towards Blackbeard, whereupon the pirate began to roar and rant. Who are you? he hailed. And whence came you? The naval officer quietly answered him. You see from our colors we are no pirates. Blackbeard then bade him send his boat aboard that he might see who he was. But Maynard simply answered this impudent request by replying, I cannot spare my boat, but I will come aboard you as soon as I can with my sloop. The swaggering pirate then raised his glass of grog and instantly drank to the officer, saying, I'll give no quarter, nor take any from you. Maynard replied that he expected no quarter from him, nor for his part did he intend to give any. But whilst this exchange of courtesies went on, the tide had risen and the pirate's ship floated off. As fast as they could, the sloops were being rowed towards Teach's ship, but as the ships drew near, Teach fired a broadside and so killed or wounded 20 of the naval men. A little later, Blackbeard's ship drifted into shore and one of the sloops fell astern. But Maynard, finding that his ship was carried way on and that he would fetch alongside Teach's ship, ordered all his own men below, while he and the helmsman were the only two who remained on deck. The latter he managed to conceal so that only the officer was visible but he ordered his crew to take their pistols, cutlasses, and swords and be ready for any duty immediately, and in order to make it possible for the men to regain the deck in the minimum time, he caused two ladders to be placed in the hatchway. The sloop now came alongside the pirate, whereupon the ladder had case boxes, such as were discharged from cannon, thrown on board, having been first filled with powder, small shot, slugs, and pieces of lead and iron, a quick match was placed in the mouth of these, and then they were dropped onto the sloop's deck. These would, of course, be exceedingly destructive, but inasmuch as the naval crew were below at the time, 
they did but little harm, and when Blackbeard saw that by now there were only a few hands on deck, he believed that these three or four were the sole survivors. He exulted greatly and cried, Let us jump on board and cut to pieces those that are alive. Now one of these case boxes was causing a great cloud of smoke so that Blackbeard was able, together with 14 of his men, to leap on to the sloop's deck without being immediately perceived. But as soon as the smoke began to clear, Maynard ordered his men up from below who were on deck in a flash. Then there began a fierce fight, and between Maynard and Blackbeard there was a magnificent hand-to-hand -hand encounter. At first they exchanged shots, and the pirate was wounded. Then they drew their swords, and each man lunged at each other. Matters were proceeding in an exciting manner, until by ill luck the lieutenant had the misfortune to break his sword. In a moment, Blackbeard would have dealt him a fatal blow had not one of Maynard's men instantly given the pirate a terrible wound in the neck and throat. After this, the onslaught became fiercer and fiercer, both sides were releasing their pent-up rage, and it was by no means certain who would win the fight. There were twelve servicemen against fourteen of the pirates, not counting Maynard or Teach. It is to be stated that neither side lacked bravery, and the greatest valor was displayed on both sides. The deck presented a sickening sight, and blood was seen spilt everywhere. Teach Though he had been wounded by the shot from Maynard and the blow from one of the latter's men, as well as a sundry of other ugly cuts, still fought splendidly. But he was employing the very utmost of his physical resources, and finally, while in the act of cocking his pistol, fell down with a heavy thud to the deck dead. In the meanwhile, eight of his men had also perished, and most of the rest being wounded, they clamored for quarter, a request which was granted seeing that Teach himself had been slain. Maynard severed the pirate's head from his body, and after affixing it to the end of his bowsprit, sailed away to Bathtown in order to obtain medical aid for his wounded men. On ransacking the pirate ship, there were found a number of incriminating documents which showed the close connection between Teach and the governor of Bermudas. After Maynard's men had their wounds attended to, the sloop left Bath Town and with Blackbeard's head still swinging at the bowsprit end, proceeded to Virginia, where there was a great rejoicing that the pirate pest had at last been killed. The prisoners were brought off from the sloop, tried, condemned, and executed, with the exception of two. Of these, one had been taken by Teach from a trading ship only the day before the fight, and he was suffering severely from no less than 70 wounds, but of these he presently recovered. The other man not executed was Israel Hands, who was master of the Queen Anne's Revenge who had remained on shore at Bath Town, where he was recovering from that wound we mentioned just now, which Blackbeard one night, in a playful humor, had dealt him from his pistol in the dark. So the American colonists were able to breathe again, and the trading ships were allowed to go about once more without fear of this scoundrel. The blow had been dealt decisively and neatly. It only remains to add one other fact which well indicates the desperate nature of this pirate. When during the engagement it seemed likely that he would be overcome, he had placed a negro at the gunpowder door with instructions to blow the ship up the moment Maynard's men should come aboard. But inasmuch as Maynard's clever stratagem lured the pirate and his men on board the sloop, a terrible disaster was avoided, which would have involved both ships and doubtless all the men of each contesting party. End of chapter 13. Chapter 14 of Daring Deeds of Famous Pirates. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Shasta, Oakland, California. Daring Deeds of Famous Pirates by Edward Cabell Chatterton. The Story of Captain Kidd. 
we come now to another historical pirate who both in america and england will long be remembered for his very interesting exploits following the modern tendency of endeavoring to whitewash notorious criminals of a bygone age a recent writer has sought to dismiss the idea that kidd was to be numbered among the pirates i admit that at one time this man was an honest seaman and that the force of circumstances caused his career to be completely altered but a pirate he certainly became and no amount of juggling with facts can alter this the story of his life is as follows he was a scotsman who was born in greenock which has given to the world so many fine seamen of different generations and so many handsome new ships both of wood and of steel sailing ships and steam propelled liners have been built here during the past two hundred years by the score after a while we find kidd in north america he became a resident of new york and in sixteen ninety one married a widow he became a prosperous shipmaster sailing out of new york and they say that in his house in liberty street was the first turkey carpet ever seen in new york he was a man well known to the local merchants and for a time had command of a privateer cruising against the french in west indian waters this was the period during which william the third was at war with our french neighbors in the year sixteen ninety five kidd had crossed to england and was in london having command of the brigantine antigua of new york now about this time the king had appointed the earl of bellamont to be governor of new england and new york and the latter was especially instructed to suppress the prevailing piracy which was causing so much distress along the coast lord bellamont who had been governor of barbados suggested that kidd should be entrusted with a man-of-war as he was a most suitable person to send against these sea rovers knowing as he did every inch of the coast and the favorite hiding-places of the pirates but the admiralty did not esteem it suitable for kidd to have a government ship under him and there the matter ended but bellamont was one of those far-sighted men who ever had an eye for the main chance he and his friends were well aware of the enormous amount of money which these pirates accumulated and since the admiralty would not give him a frigate he resolved to form a small syndicate among his friends and fit out a private ship he decided to appoint kidd as captain the latter was not anxious to accept this appointment but bellamont pointed out that if he did not kidd's own vessel would be detained in the thames so at last he consented in order to give the project a certain amount of status and in order to be able to enforce greater discipline over the crew a king's commission was obtained for kidd authorizing him to apprehend seize and take into your custody all pirates freebooters and sea rovers being our subjects or of other nations associated with them but he was also given a 
commission of reprisals as it was then time of war this second commission gave him justification for capturing any french ships he might encounter the ship which had been purchased for him was called the adventure of two hundred and eighty seven tons thirty four guns and seventy or eighty men in the month of may sixteen ninety six we find her sailing out of plymouth sound bound for new york it should be mentioned that kidd and a man named robert livingston had undertaken to pay one-fifth of the expenses while bellomont with the first lord of the admiralty the lord chancellor and certain other gentlemen had put up the other four-fifths of the capital on the voyage out kidd fell in with a french fishing craft off the newfoundland banks and annexed her owing to the second of his commissions just mentioned this was no act of piracy but perfectly legal as a privateer arrived in new york kidd made it known that he needed a number of additional hands as crew and as an incentive he offered each man a share reserving for himself and owners forty shares he got an additional number of men comprising now one hundred and fifty five and then sailed away he had shipped a miscellaneous lot of rascals naval deserters pirates out of employment fugitives from justice brawlers thieves rogues and vagabonds they had signed on attracted by the chance of obtaining plenty of booty he set a course across the atlantic and his first call was at madeira where he took on board wine and other necessaries from there he proceeded to the cape verde islands where he obtained salt and provisions and having all this done steered in a southerly direction rounded the cape of good hope and hauled up into the indian ocean till he found himself off madagascar which was a notorious hunting ground for pirates it was now february of sixteen ninety seven the adventure having left plymouth for new york the previous may but as it happened there were no private ships to be found off madagascar for they were somewhere out at sea looking for spoil therefore after watering and taking on board more provisions he steered to the northeast across the indian ocean till he came to the malabar coast in the month of june his ship was sadly in need of repairs and he was in serious need of further stores he had come a long way from new york to india and his ship had not earned a penny since she left america but he managed to borrow a sum of money from some frenchmen who had lost their ship but had saved their effects and with this he was able to buy materials for putting his ship in a seaworthy condition and now there came a change and from being a privateer he became a pirate once more he crossed the indian ocean and arrived at bab's key which is on an island at the entrance to the red sea he began to open his mind to his crew and to let them understand that he was making a change so far he had acted according to the law and his commission though not a single pirate had he seen he knew 
that the Mocha fleet would presently come sailing that way, and he addressed his men in these words. We have been unsuccessful hitherto, but courage, my boys, we'll make our fortunes out of this fleet. There can be little doubt but that Kidd had been working at this idea as he came across the Indian Ocean. Before a man becomes a robber, either by land or by sea, there is a previous mental process. A man cannot say that he acted on the spur of the moment without confessing that he had been entertaining the suggestion of robbery for some time before. It would seem that Kidd originally had every intention of keeping to the terms and spirit of his two commissions, but as he had been sailing across the world without luck, he became despondent. He thought not merely of himself or of his crew, but of Bellomont and the rest of the syndicate. Time and expenses had been running on, and there was nothing on the credit side beyond that one French ship of a year ago. He was utterly despondent, and as a man down on his luck, thieves on land, so he would now act on sea. The intention was thoroughly wrong, but it was comprehensible. He waited for the Mocha fleet, but it came not, so he had a boat hoisted out and sent her well manned along the coast to bring back a prisoner or at any rate obtain intelligence somehow in a few days the boat returned announcing there were fourteen ships ready to sail english dutch and moorish he therefore kept a man continually on the lookout at the masthead lest the fleet should sail past without being seen, for Kidd was well-nigh desperate. And one evening, about four days later, the ships appeared in sight, being convoyed by two men of war, one English and one Dutch. Kidd soon fell in with them, got among them, and fired at the Moorish ship, which happened to be nearest to him thereupon the two convoys bore down on him engaged him hotly and compelled him to sheer off so as he had begun to play the pirate he resolved to go on he crossed the indian ocean to the eastward yet again and cruised along the malabar coast and at last he got a prize she was a moorish vessel owned by moorish merchants but her master was an englishman named parker and there was also a portuguese named don antonio on board these two men kid forced to join him the former as pilot and the latter as interpreter Thus the commissioned privateer was now a full-fledged pirate. He had sunk deep down into the mire, and he acted with all the customary cruelty of a pirate. He hoisted his prisoners up by the arms, drubbed them with a naked cutlass in order that they might reveal where the money was hidden but all that he obtained was a bale of pepper and a bale of coffee but then he sailed along and touched at tarawar where he discovered that already the news of the assault on the moorish ship had arrived and was being discussed with great excitement by the merchants kid was suspected and two Englishmen came aboard and inquired for Parker and Don Antonio. Kidd 
denied that he knew such persons and as he had taken the precaution to hide them away in a secret place down the hold the visitors still suspicious went ashore without any definite tidings for over a week these two wretched men were kept in their hiding-place and once more kid put to sea a portuguese man-of-war having been sent to cruise after him he engaged her for six hours but as he could not take her and as he was the swifter sailor he cleared off soon afterwards he became possessor of a moorish ship by a very subtle quibble which indicated the man's astuteness the vessel was under the command of a dutch skipper and as soon as kidd gave her chase the pirate hoisted french colors when the merchant ship saw this she also showed the french ensign the adventure soon overtook her and hailed her in french the merchant ship having a frenchman on board answered in that language kid ordered her to send her boat aboard and then asked the frenchman a passenger if he had a pass for himself the latter replied in the affirmative kid then told the frenchman he must pass as captain and he added you are captain his intention was simply this remembering the terms of his commission he was untruthfully insisting that the merchantman was french and therefore legally his prize it was a barefaced quibble and one wonders why so unprincipled a man should deem it necessary to go out of his way to make such a pretense so he relieved the ship of her cargo and sold it later on presently as he began to suffer from qualms of conscience and declined to attack a dutch ship with which they came up his crew mutinied and one day whilst a man named moore his gunner was on deck discussing the dutch ship moore so far lost control of his tongue as to accuse kidd of having ruined them all the pirate answered this complaint by calling him a dog taking up a bucket and breaking the man's skull therewith so that he died the next day kidd now cruised about the malabar coast plundering craft taking in water and supplies from the shore and pillaging when he liked and now he came up with a fine four hundred ton moorish merchantman named the queda whose master was an englishman named wright for it was by no means rare for these eastern owners to employ english or dutch skippers as the latter were such good seamen and navigators kid as before chased her under french colours and having got abreast of her compelled her to hoist out her boat and send it aboard he then informed wright he was to consider himself a prisoner and he learnt that there were only three europeans on board two dutch and one frenchman the rest being either indians or armenians the last mentioned were also part owners of the cargo kidd set the crew of this vessel ashore at different places along the coast and soon sold about ten thousand pounds worth of the captured cargo so that each man had about two hundred pounds while kidd got eight thousand pounds putting part of his own crew into the queda kidd took the adventure and the prize southwards to madagascar and when he 
had come to anchor a ludicrous incident occurred for there came off to him a canoe containing several englishmen who had previously known kidd well they now saluted him and said they understood that he had come to take them and hang them which would be a little unkind in such an old acquaintance but kidd at once put them at their ease swearing he had no such intention and that he was now in every respect their brother and just as bad as they and calling for alcohol he drank their captain's health the men then returned on board their ship resolution but by now after all her travels backwards and forwards over the ocean the adventure had become very leaky and her two pumps had to be kept going continuously so kidd transferred all the tackle and guns from her to the queda and in future made her his home he then divided up the spoil on the sharing principle as before about a hundred of his men now deserted him and with his forty men and about twenty thousand pounds in his ship he put to sea bound at last for america again for he was under orders to report to Belmont at the end of the cruise he arrived at the west indies called at one of the leeward islands and learnt that the news of his piracies had spread over the civilized world and he was wanted as a pirate the date was now april sixteen ninety nine he handed over the queda to a man named bolton who was a merchant at antigua and bought from him a sloop named the san antonio into which he put all his treasure he must now press on and swear to bellomont that he was innocent of piracy being anxious to communicate with his wife kidd steered for long island sound proceeded as far as oyster bay landed and sent her a message and after going on his northward voyaging transferred some of his treasure into three sloops toward the end of june he headed for boston arriving there on the first july where he had various interviews with bellomont the sloop and her contents as well as the other three sloops goods were arrested and kidd was afterwards taken across to england he and six others were tried at a sessions of admiralty at the old bailey in may seventeen o one for piracy and robbery on the high seas and found guilty kidd was further charged with the murder of the man moore in the bucket incident and also found guilty kidd's defence was that the man mutinied against him that his accusers had committed perjury and that he was the most innocent person of them all but the court thought otherwise and a week or so later he and the other six men were executed at the execution dock and afterwards their bodies were hung up in chains at intervals along the river where they remained for a long time of the treasure which was brought by kidd to america and has frequently been sought for by treasure hunters unavailingly the exact total of gold dust gold coins gold bars silver rings silver buttons broken silver silver bars precious stones diamonds rubies 
green stoves and so on reach the following enormous amounts gold one thousand one hundred and eleven ounces silver two thousand three hundred and fifty three ounces jewels seventeen ounces a certain amount of plate and money was successfully retained by kidd's wife and of what was left of the booty after payment of the legal fees involved in his trial the sum of six thousand four hundred and seventy two pounds was by special act of parliament handed over to greenwich hospital surely with such facts as these before one it is a hopeless case for any modern enthusiast to pretend for a moment that the famous captain kidd was not a pirate if his luck had turned out better probably he would have contentedly remained a privateer but opportunity is illustrative of the man and if ever a sailor succeeded in showing himself to be a pirate with all the avariciousness and cruelty which the word suggests here you have it in the life of captain kidd End of chapter fourteen Chapter 15 of Daring Deeds of Famous Pirates. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Daring Deeds of Famous Pirates by Edward Keeble Chatterton. The Exploits of Captain Avery. If the 16th century was the grand period of the Moslem corsairs of the Mediterranean, the 18th will ever remain memorable for the manifold activities of those English seamen who took to piracy as a far more remunerative profession than carrying freights. If we look for any explanation of this, I think it is not far to seek. You have to take into consideration several points. Firstly, it seems to me, in all phases, whether political or otherwise, whether concerned with the sea or with land affairs, you must get at personal and national character, the very fount and origin of all human energies. Whatever else the 17th century was, it was not a very distinguished era. There were, of course, exceptions, but, speaking broadly, it was a most disappointing period. Morally, it was corrupt. Politically, it was degenerate. And artistically, it was insincere and pompous. You have only to read the history of that period in its various aspects to realize this. This was the time when the reaction after the Puritan period had led to a dereliction of high principles, when intrigue and bribery had made such an onslaught on political life that votes were bought for money, that even admirals allowed petty politics to interfere with their loyalty when fighting at sea the nation's enemies. Smug respectability was the dominating high ideal, and there was no greater sin than that of being found out. High-handed actions by those in power and lawlessness by those who were covetous of obtaining wealth were significant of this period. And if you want to realize the humbug and insincerity of the 18th century, you have only to go into the nearest art gallery and examine the pictures of that period, excepting perhaps some portraiture, or to read the letters which the men and women wrote, or to read the books which the educated people of that time esteemed so highly. Religion and politics, domestic life, art and literature were in an unhealthy condition. 
Now, a man, whether a sailor or a politician or whatever else, is very largely the child of his age. That is to say, given a lawless, unprincipled, corrupt period, it is more than likely that any particular individual will be found to exhibit in his activities the marks of that age. And, therefore, bearing such facts as these in mind, it becomes perfectly comprehensible that the 18th century should have been the flourishing period of English sea robbery. Add just one item more, the continual period of unrest caused by years of international wars and the rumors of war, and you are not surprised that the call of the sea was accepted by so many more hundreds of men than ever before in the history of the nation. But naval wars did not mean merely that more men were wanted to work the ship which fought our battles. There was such an encouragement and incentive to skippers and capitalists to undertake privateering that not even in the Elizabethan age had so many ships and men taken part in that kind of undertaking. So, instead of privateering being merely an exceptional activity during an occasional period of hostilities, it became, owing to long drawn out wars, a regular, definite profession. There was in it every opportunity to indulge both personal and national hatred of the foreigner, to enjoy a series of fine adventures, and then to return home with an accumulation of glory and prizes. Side by side with this, and while illustrating the tone of the age, smuggling had become an almost irrepressible national evil. In the history of smuggling, you not infrequently found that the preliminary steps to this dishonest livelihood were as follows. First, the man was employed as an honest fisherman. Then, finding this did not pay him, he became a privateer, or else in the king's service serving on board a revenue cutter. Then, being more anxious for wealth, he threw in his lot with the very men he had been chasing, and became either an out-and-out -out smuggler or else a pirate. For, as has been insisted on more than once in previous chapters, the line of demarcation between privateering and piracy, though perfectly visible to lawyers, was not always sufficiently strong to keep the roving seamen within the limitations of legal livelihood. In a word, as it is always difficult suddenly to break a habit, and as this immense body of seamen had so long been accustomed to earning their money by attacking other ships, so in an age that had but little respect for what was lawful, it was really not surprising that dozens of ships put to sea as downright pirates or else as acknowledged smugglers. In this present volume, we are concerned only with the first of these two classes. Typical of the period was a notorious Captain Avery, whose doings became known throughout Europe. There was nothing petty in these 18th century corsairs. They had in them the attributes which go to making a great admiral. They were born rulers of men. They were good strategists, hard fighters, brave and valorous, daring and determined. But as against this, they were tyrannical, cruel and brutal, and, as is so frequently the case with all men, the acquisition of wealth ruined them, made them still more overbearing and swollen-headed, so that with no high principles, no lofty aims, they descended by degrees into debauchery and callousness. It was a thousand pities in many ways, for these were magnificent seamen who took their ill-designed, bluffled tubs practically all round the world, keeping the sea for months at a time and surviving terrible weather and many changes of climate. If these great disciplinarians had not become tyrants, and if their unquestioned abilities could have been legitimately employed, they had in them the ability which has produced great empire makers, brilliant admirals, and magnificent administrators. 
but their misfortune consisted in having belonged to the eighteenth century. Avery, like many of the world's greatest seamen, was born in Devonshire, went to sea when quite young, and rose to the rank of mate in a merchant ship. It happened that there was a good deal of smuggling going on by the French of Martinique with the Spaniards of the American colonies. And in order to put a stop to this, the Spanish government hired foreigners to act against the delinquents. A number of Bristol merchants accordingly fitted out a couple of thirty-gun ships, and, well-manned, well-found in everything, sent them to Karna to await orders. One of these ships was commanded by a Captain Gibson, and in the year 1715 Avery happened to be his mate. The Devonshire man possessed all the traditional seafaring instincts, and that love of adventure for which his county was famous, and he was evidently not unpopular with the rest of the crew. For after he had won their confidence, he began to point out to them what immense riches could be obtained on the Spanish coast, and suggested that they should throw in their lot with him and run off with the ship. This suggestion was heartily agreed upon, and it was resolved to make the attempt the following evening at ten o'clock. It should be mentioned that Gibson, like many another eighteenth-century skipper, was rather too fond of his grog, and on the eventful night he had imbibed somewhat freely and turned into his bunk instead of going ashore for his usual refreshment. Those of the crew who were not in the present plot had also turned in, but the others remained on deck. At ten o'clock, the longboat from the other ship rowed off to them. Avery gave her a hail, and the boat answered by the agreed watchword thus. Is your drunken boatswain on board? Avery replied in the affirmative, and then sixteen able men came on board. The first thing was to secure the hatches, and then, very quietly, they hauled up the anchor and put to sea without making much noise. After they had been under way some time, the captain awoke from his drunken sleep and rang his bell. Avery and one other confederate then went into his cabin. "'What's the matter with the ship?' queried the old man. "'Does she drive? What weather is it?' for as he realized she was on the move, he naturally was forced to the conclusion that the ship was sheering about at her anchor and that a strong wind had sprung up. Avery quickly reassured him and, incidentally, gave his waking mind something of a shock. No, answered the former mate. No, we're at sea with a fair wind and good weather. At sea? gasped the captain. How can that be? Come, don't be in a fright, but put on your clothes and I'll let you into a secret. You must know, he went on, that I am captain of this ship now, and this is my cabin, therefore you must walk out. I am bound for Madagascar with the design of making my own fortune and that of all the brave fellows joined with me. The captain began to recover his senses and to understand what was being said, but he was still very frightened. Avery begged him not to be afraid, and that if he liked to join their confederacy, they were willing to receive him. If you turn sober and attend to business, perhaps in time I may make you one of my lieutenants. If not, here's a boat, and you shall be set on shore." Gibson preferred to choose this last alternative, and the whole crew being called up to know who was willing to go ashore with the captain, there were only about half a dozen who decided to accompany him to the land. So Avery took his ship to Madagascar without making any captures. On arriving at the northeast portion of the island, he found a couple of sloops at anchor, but when these espied him, they slipped their cables and ran their ships ashore. 
while the men rushed inland and hid themselves in the woods. For these men had guilty consciences. They had stolen the sloops from the East Indies, and on seeing Avery's ship arrive, they imagined that he had been sent to punish them. But Avery sent some of his own men ashore to say that the sloop's men were his friends and suggested that they should form an amalgamation for their common benefit and safety. The men were well armed and had taken up positions in the wood and outposts had been stationed to watch whether they were pursued ashore. But when the latter perceived that two or three men were approaching unarmed, there was no opposition offered, and on learning that they were friends, the messengers were led to the main body, where they delivered Avery's message. At first the fugitives had feared this was just a stratagem to entrap them, but when they heard that Avery, too, had run away with his ship, they conferred and decided to throw in their lot. The next thing was to get the two sloops refloated, and then the trio sailed toward the Arabian coast. When they arrived at length off the mouths of the Indus, a man at the masthead espied a sail, so orders were given to chase. As they came on nearer, the strange vessel was observed to be a fine tall craft, and probably an East Indiaman. But when they came closer, she was found to be far more valuable and more worth fighting. On firing at her, the latter hoisted the colors of the great mogul and seemed prepared to fight the matter out. But Avery declined getting at close quarters and preferred to bombard from a safe distance, whereupon some of his men began to suspect that he was not the dashing hero they had taken him for. But the sloops attacked the strange ship vigorously, one at the bow and the other on her quarter. After a while, they succeeded in boarding her, when she was now compelled to strike colors. It was found that she was one of the great mogul's ships, carrying a number of important members of his court on a pilgrimage to Mecca, and most valuable articles to be offered at the Shrine of Muhammad. There were large quantities of magnificent gold and silver vessels, immense sums of money, and altogether the plunder was very considerable, everything of value having been taken out of her, and the entire treasure having been transferred on board the three ships, the vessel was permitted to depart. When at last the ship returned to her home, and the mogul learned the news, he was exceedingly wrathful and threatened to send a mighty army to drive out the English from their settlements along the Indian coast. This greatly alarmed the East India Company, but the latter managed to calm him down by promising to send ships after the robbers and deliver him into their hands. The incident caused great excitement in Europe, and all sorts of extravagant rumors spread about so that at one time it was intended to fit out a powerful squadron and have him captured, while another suggestion was that he should be invited home with his riches and receive the offer of his majesty's pardon, for he was reputed now to be about to found a new monarchy. But eventually these foolish notions were discovered to be baseless. Meanwhile, the three treasure-laden ships were returning to Madagascar, where it was hoped to build a small fort, keep a few men there permanently, and there deposit their ill-gotten treasure. But Avery had another plan in his mind, and this well exhibits his true character. On the voyage, he sent out a boat to each of the sloops, inviting each skipper to repair on board him. They came and he laid before them the following proposition. If either of the sloops were to be attacked alone, they could not be able to offer any great resistance, and so their treasure would vanish. As regards his own ship, he went on, 
She was such a swift ship that he could not conceive of any other craft overtaking her. Therefore, he suggested that all the treasure should be sealed up in three separate chests, that each of the three captains should have keys, that they should not be opened until all were present, that these chests should then be kept on his own ship and afterwards deposited in a safe place ashore. It seems very curious that such wide-awake pirates should not have been able to see through such an obvious trick. But without hesitation, they agreed with the idea, and all the treasure was placed aboard Avery's ship as had been suggested. The little fleet sailed on, and now Avery began to approach his crew in his usual underhand manner. Here was sufficient wealth on board to make them all happy for the rest of their lives. What, he asked, shall hinder us from going to some country where we are not known and living on shore to the end of our days in affluence? The crew thoroughly appreciated the hint. So, during the night, Avery's ship got clear away altered her course, sailed round the Cape of Good Hope, and made for America. They were strangers in that land. They would divide up the booty, and they would separate, so that each man would be able to live on comfortably without working. They arrived at the island of Providence when it was decided that it would be wiser to get rid of such a large vessel. So, pretending she had been fitted out for privateering, and that, having had an unsuccessful voyage, Avery had received orders from his owners to sell her as best he could. He soon found a merchant who bought her, and Avery then purchased a small sloop. In this craft, he and his crew embarked with their treasure, and after landing at different places on the American coast where no one suspected them, they dispersed and settled down in the country. Avery had now immense wealth, but as most thereof consisted of diamonds, and he was afraid of being unable to get rid of them in America without being suspected as a pirate, he then crossed to the north of Ireland, where some of his men settled and obtained the king's pardon. And now began a series of incidents which might well be taken to show the folly of ill-gotten gain. The reader has already seen that in spite of the vast affluence which these 18th century pirates obtained, yet in the end such wealth brought them nothing but anxiety and final wretchedness. Avery could no more dispose of his precious stones in Ireland than in America. So thinking that perhaps there might be someone in that big west country town of Bristol who would purchase them, he proceeded to his native county of Devonshire and sent one of his friends to meet him at Bideford. The friend introduced other friends, and Avery informed them of his business. It was agreed that the best plan would be to place the diamonds in the hands of some wealthy merchants who would ask no awkward questions as to their origin. One of the friends asserted that he knew some merchants who would be able to transact the business, and provided they allowed a handsome commission, the diamonds would be turned into money. As Avery could think of no other solution to the difficulty, he agreed with this. So presently the merchants came down to Bideford, and after strongly protesting their integrity, they were handed both diamonds and vessels of gold, for which they gave him a small sum in advance. Avery then changed his name and lived quietly at Bideford, but in a short time he had spent all his money, and in spite of repeated letters to the wily merchants, he could get no answer. But at last they sent him a small sum, though quite inadequate for paying his debts, and as he could barely subsist, he resolved to go to Bristol and interview the merchants. He arrived, but instead of money, 
He was met with a firm refusal and a threat that they would give information that he was a pirate. This frightened him so much that he returned to Ireland, and from there kept writing for his money, which, however, never came. He was reduced to such a condition of abject poverty that he resolved in his misery to go back to Bristol and throw himself on the merchant's mercy. He therefore shipped on board a trading ship, worked his passage to Plymouth, and then walked to Bideford. He had arrived there not many days when he fell ill and died without so much as the money to buy him a burial. So it was true that there be land rats and water rats, land thieves and water thieves, I mean pirates. Avery had met a company of men who treated him in the way he had robbed others. Thus, the whole of his long voyaging from sea to sea, the entire series of events from the time when he had seized Gibson's ship, had been not only profitless, but brought upon him the utmost misery, terror, starvation, and ultimate death. He had fought, he had schemed, he had done underhand tricks, he had told lies, and he had endured bitter anxiety, but all to no purpose whatever. End of chapter 15 Read by April Mendes, Dumfries, Virginia, May 17, 2021「Daring Deeds of Famous Pirates」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Heather Eney, « Daring Deeds of Famous Pirates » by Edward Keeble Chatterton, a gentleman of fortune. In an honest service there are commonly low wages and hard labor. In piracy, satiety, pleasure, and ease, liberty and power. And who would not balance creditor on this side, when all the hazard that is run for it at worst is only a sour look or two at choking? No, a merry life and a short one shall be my motto. Such was the remark which a certain Captain Bartholomew Roberts, a notorious 17th century pirate, was said to have made, and no doubt there was a certain amount of truth in this statement. The low wages and hard labor in other spheres of life contrasted unfavorably with the possibilities of ease, plenty, liberty, and power. This fellow, like the notorious Henry Morgan, was a Welshman and born in Pembrokeshire. He grew up to be a tall, dark, indigenous, and daring seaman. For a time he led the hard but honest life of a sailor trading to the Guinea coast. But in the year 1719 he had the bad luck to be captured by Davis, another pirate captain. The latter constrained Roberts to lead this lawless form of life and it is only fair to state that Roberts at first was distinctly averse from piracy, and would certainly have deserted if an opportunity had been forthcoming. However, preferment claimed his conscience and reconciled him to that which he formerly hated. And when Davis ended his days by death in action, the pirate crew decided to choose Roberts as their skipper. It is my advice, said one of these at the time of the election, it is my advice, while we are sober, to pitch upon a man of courage and one skilled in navigation, one who by his prudence and bravery seems best able to ward us from the dangers and tempests of an unstable element and the fatal consequences of anarchy, and such a one I take Roberts to be, a fellow in all respects worthy of your esteem and favor. So the Welshman was prevailed upon to accept this new honor, adding that since he had dipped his hands in muddy water and must be a pirate, it was better being a commander than a private man. So the pirate ship sailed south along the Guinea coast with her new commander, 
captured a Dutch Guinea ship, emptied her of everything they fancied, sent her on her way again, and two days later took an English ship. From her, too, they extracted all that they desired, and since her crew were persuaded to join Robert's ship, the prize was burnt and the pirate, with now a much bigger company, set sail for the island of St. Thomas, which is in the South Atlantic some distance off the Congo coast. But as they had no further luck in these parts, they eventually resolved by vote to make for Brazil. After a 28-day voyage across the Atlantic, they arrived off the South American shore and for nine weeks or so cruised about unsuccessfully, taking care to keep out of sight of land. But on the way to the West Indies, whither they were now bound, a little disappointed, they unexpectedly fell in with a fleet of 42 Portuguese ships of Bahia. These vessels were bound for Lisbon and were now waiting for two 70-gun men of war to convoy them home. Such a rich sight was too much for the pirate. He was sure that his one single ship would have but little chance against such a powerful fleet especially as some of them were really powerful vessels. But a faint heart never made a prize, and he was minded to have a try. Among the many vicissitudes of these pirate wayfarers, the reader must have been struck by the extremely able cunning which these lawless, desperate fellows displayed in many of their captures. Somehow one does not associate skill with brutality. But it was very rare that these pirate skippers were at a loss for a stratagem. Force was employed and used without mercy at the proper time, but that was not allowed to take the place of ingenuity. So long as these corsairs remained sober and did not set foot on land, they very rarely met with defeat. They were terrified not by superior forces, but by the possibility of being found out when ashore. The sea and its ways they understood. In that sphere they were at home. It was only when they became so foolish as to abandon their natural element that they fell on evil days. So Roberts set about devising some means of getting what he wanted from this mighty fleet. He got his ship in their midst and kept his own rugged, desperate crew concealed. He then took his ship close to one of the biggest Portuguese and hailed her to send her master aboard quietly. If the Portuguese should show the slightest resistance or make any signal of distress, he would show them no mercy. This cool impudence was successful. For the master now coming on deck and seeing the sudden flash of pirate cutlasses of the men who had for a time been concealed, there was nothing to do but submit quietly, and the captain repaired on board the pirate as requested. Roberts saluted him in a friendly manner and told him he and his crew were gentlemen of fortune. All they desired from him was to be informed as to which was the richest ship of the fleet. If the captain informed them correctly, then he should be permitted to go back to his ship in safety. But if not, he must expect instant death. So the Portuguese pointed out a 40-gun vessel which had a crew of 150 men. Certainly she appeared far too big a job for Roberts to tackle, but he made towards her, still keeping the Portuguese captain aboard. As they came alongside, the pirate ordered the Portuguese prisoner to hail her and inquire after the commander's health and invite him on board, as a matter of importance was waiting to be imparted to him. The reply came that the commander would come presently, but Roberts was not to be put off, for observing signs of unusual activity on board her, he poured a heavy broadside into her, then ran his ship right alongside in the most approved Elizabethan manner, grappled, and boarded her. In a short space of time she had been captured, and there were, taken out of her into the pirate's hold, large and valuable quantities of sugar, skins, tobacco, etc., and 40,000 gold moidores. After this, just as a dog which has stolen a piece of meat hurries off to find a secluded spot where he can eat his spoil in peace, so the pirates began to long for some safe retreat where they could spend their time in debauchery with the prizes to pay for the cost. 
they resolved to go to devil's island on the river of suriname in dutch guiana and having safely arrived there were well received by the governor and inhabitants but the pirates were sadly in need of provisions until they fell in with a sloop which was in the river this craft which was now seized said that she had been sailing in company with a brigantine loaded with provisions the news gladdened the corsairs and roberts believing the matter to be so important that he ought to attend to it himself went in command of the sloop taking forty men and leaving the pirate ship behind he was sure the latter would be all safe and he would not be away long the brigantine would soon be espied and then he would return with the latter's welcome cargo but on this occasion roberts was unlucky he did not sight the brigantine although he sailed for miles and miles during eight days so at last he came to anchor off the coast somewhere and sent a boat ashore to inform their shipmates left behind in the Surinam river the boat was also to bring back provisions to the sloop but when she returned after an almost unbearable delay she brought no provisions and the unwelcome knowledge that the lieutenant of the pirate ship had run off with her roberts had certainly been a fool not to have foreseen this probability and in order to prevent such mutiny recurring he proceeded to draw up regulations for preserving order in his present craft after that he had to act provisions and water they must have at all costs and so they must make for the west indies they had not gone far however before they fell in with a couple of sloops which they captured this afforded them the necessary supplies a few days later they also captured a brigantine and then proceeded to barbados off barbados they met a ten-gun ship heavily laden with cargo from bristol her they plundered but after three days allowed her to proceed but as soon as the latter touched land and informed the governor of her misfortune there was dispatched a twenty-gun ship with eighty men under the command of captain rogers to seek out the pirates in two days they came up with her roberts was of course quite unaware that any vessel had been sent against him and the two craft drew near roberts as usual fired a blank shot for the stranger to heave to and was very surprised to observe that instead of striking his colors forthwith she returned his gun with a broadside a sharp engagement ensued but as roberts was getting distinctly the worst of it he threw some of his cargo overboard and hurried off as fast as his ship could travel being very lucky to escape in this manner he next made for dominica in the caribbean sea and bartered some of his cargo with the inhabitants for provisions he watered his ship and as he happened to meet fifteen englishmen who had been left upon the island by some frenchmen who had captured the englishman's vessel roberts persuaded these destitutes to join him and this additional strength was by no means inappreciable but his ship was very foul and badly needed her bottom scrubbed so roberts took her for this purpose southwards to the grenada islands it was fortunate that he did not waste any time about his cleaning and that he put to sea immediately after for the governor of martinique got to hear that the pirate was so near and two sloops were sent to catch him but roberts and his ship had departed only the very night before the sloops arrived setting a northerly coast the pirate now proceeded towards newfoundland his ship was well cleaned so she could sail at her best pace he arrived off the banks in june of seventeen twenty and entered the harbor of trepassy with the black pirate's flag at her masthead with drums beating and trumpets sounding twenty-two ships were lying in that harbor as roberts came in but as soon as they realized what sort of a visitor was amongst them the crews forsook the ships and roberts with his men destroyed them by burning or sinking and then pillaged the houses ashore behaving like madmen and fiends let loose he retained just one ship of the lot which hailed from bristol and after leaving the harbor encountered ten french ships off the newfoundland banks all of these he also destroyed excepting one which he took for his own use and named the fortune 
the bristol ship he handed over to these frenchmen and then for some time being in the very track of the shipping made some important prizes after which he sailed again for the west indies took in ample supplies of provisions and then determined to hasten towards the french coast of guinea where previously they had been so successful on the way they came up with a french ship and as she was more suitable for piracy than his own roberts made her skipper exchange ships they were some time getting towards surinam as they made a mistake in their navigation and got out of the trade winds and then trouble overtook them water had been running short for some time so that they became reduced to one mouthful a day famine too overtook them so that with thirst also tormenting them many of the crew died whilst the rest were extremely weak and feeble things went from bad to worse and now there was not one drop of fluid for drinking purposes but fortunately for them they found they were in seven fathoms of water so the anchor was lowered over but as they were such a long way off the shore they despaired of relieving their thirst but the ship's boat was sent away and after a while to their immense relief the little craft returned with plenty of drinking water to end their sufferings one would have thought that as an act of gratitude these men would then have given up their lawless life and ceased their depredations but they were a hardened lot of ruffians who feared neither god nor man so as soon as they were able they were off to sea at their old game they fell in with a ship which gave them all the provisions they required and soon afterwards came up with a brigantine which not only afforded them still further supplies but also a mate who joined their company then as they learned that the governor had dispatched two ships to capture them they did a very impudent and very cruel series of acts by way of revenge it should be mentioned that it was the custom of the dutch ships to trade with martinique illegally to prevent any trouble they would keep some distance off the island and then hoist their jacks the inhabitants were on the lookout for the signal and would row off to do their trading there being always a sharp contest as to who should reach the ship first and so secure the pick of the goods the artful roberts always ready with some new device was well aware of this custom so when he arrived off the island he hoisted the dutch jack and waited the inhabitants of martinique saw it and came off in their craft as fast as they could as each man came on board he had him killed until there were only left those who remained in the small ships which had come for the cargo all these ships to the number of twenty he burned excepting one and into this one ship he put the survivors and sent them back to martinique with the doleful news it was a cruel heartless trick and the basest of all methods of revenge robert's ships then put to sea once more and so the life of pillage went on when they found themselves after a successful period well supplied with everything they would indulge their bestial bodies in hard drinking in fact it was deemed a crime among them not to be in this condition of inebriety and then finding their wealth diminishing they set a course across the south atlantic once more to the guinea coast in order to forage for gold they fell in with two french ships one of which was a ten-gunner and the other a seventy-five the former carried sixty-five men and the latter seventy-five but so soon as these cowards recognized the black flag they surrendered so taking the two prizes with them the pirates went on to sierra leone one of the new ships roberts named the ranger the other he used as a store ship after six more weeks spent at sierra leone in excesses they put to sea and after more captures and more enjoyment of their wealth found that their resources were still in need of replenishment festivity and mirth had made a big hole in their capital so that if they were to keep alive they must needs get busy forthwith 
Therefore, they cruised about, held up unprotected merchant ships, relieved them of their cargoes, and then burnt or sunk those strong hulls which had been the pride of many a shipbuilder and many an owner. But the time of reckoning was at hand, for HMS Swallow and another man of war had now been sent to capture both Roberts and his craft. Definite news had been gained as to where these pirates were likely to be found, and the matter was to be dealt with firmly. Just a little to the south of the equator, where the line touches the west coast of Africa, is a bold promontory known as Cape Lopez. Off this point lay Roberts. Now the Swallow was fortunate enough to know that the man he wanted was here and came up as fast as she could to that locality. Those who were serving under the pirates saw this strange sail in the offing, and so Roberts sent one of his ships to chase her and bring her back. The pirate had heard that two men of war were sent out to seek him, but he had so successfully escaped their vigilance so far that he became overconfident and careless. And in the present instance, he judged her to be merely one more unhappy merchantman that was to add to his list of victims. But when the pilot of the Swallow saw the detached pirate craft approaching, he effected a smart stratagem. He altered his course and ran away from her, but he gave her a good long run for her trouble and managed to allow her gradually to overtake the man of war. But this was not until the pirate had got well away from her mother ship. As the pirate came up full of confidence that the prize would shortly be hers, she hoisted out her black flag as usual and then fired. But when it was now too late, they discovered that this was a man of war and much more than a match for the pirate. The latter was too far from Robert's ship to be assisted, and so, seeing that resistance would be futile, she cried for quarter. This was granted, and her crew promptly made prisoners, but not till she had lost already ten men killed and twenty wounded, whereas the Swallow had not received one single casualty. The pirate admiral was still lying near the Cape, and one morning her crew looked up and saw a sight which gave them no pleasure. Over the land they could see the masts of the Swallow as the ship bore away to round the Cape. At the time, Roberts was below having breakfast, and some of the crew came down to inform him of the sight. But Roberts was far more interested in his meal than in the ship and declined to get excited. She might be a Portuguese craft or a French slaver, or it might be their own ranger coming back. But as the ship came on nearer and nearer, the crew began to get exceptionally interested. That was the man-of-war swallow. It was useless to dispute the point, for there was among the pirate crew a man named Armstrong, who had previously served aboard the naval ship and deserted. He knew her too well to take any heed of others who disputed her identity. But Roberts was still not nervous and stigmatized those as cowards who were disheartening his men. Even if she were the Swallow, what did it matter? Were they afraid to fight her? But if there was a man aboard the pirate who still possessed any doubt, that uncertainty was instantly set at rest when the Swallow was seen to be hoisting up her ports and getting her guns ready for action. Out went the British colors, and even Roberts thought it was time to be doing something. He had driven matters pretty fine, so he had to slip his cable, got underway, and ordered his men to arms. All the time he showed no timidity, but dropping an occasional oath, he meant to be ready for all that the Swallow would be willing to attempt. The pirate's sails were unloosed, and the ship had gathered way. Roberts never lost his head, although he was not in a good humor at having to interrupt his morning meal. He called Armstrong to him and questioned him as to the trim of the swallow. Armstrong informed him that she sailed best upon a wind, so that if Roberts wanted to get away, he would be best advised to run before the wind, as thus the swallow would not easily overtake him. But the two ships were getting very near to each other, and there was no longer time for thinking out tactics. 
quick but not hasty decision must be made. So this is what Roberts resolved to attempt. He would pass quite close to the swallow under full sail and receive her broadside before returning a shot. If the pirate should then have the misfortune to be disabled, or if his masts and sails were shot away, then the ship would be run ashore at the point and every man could shift for himself among the natives. But if this means of escape should turn out impracticable, Roberts intended to get his ship alongside the Swallow and blow the two craft up together. The reason why he intended such desperate measures was that old folly which has been the cause of so much disaster both to nations, fleets, and individual ships. In a word, he was unprepared. So were his crew. He himself had not been expecting the Swallow, and his own men were either drunk or only passively courageous. In any case, not the keen, alert crew who are likely to win an engagement. But there was a curious old-time vanity about the man, which shows how seriously these pirate skippers took themselves. Dressed in a rich crimson damask waistcoat and breeches, a red feather in his hat, a gold chain round his neck with a diamond cross depending, he stood on his deck, sword in hand, and two pairs of pistols hanging at the end of a silk sling flung over his shoulders, as was the custom of the pirates and such as one sees in the old prince of these men. He played the part of Commander Grandly, giving his orders with boldness and spirit. When his ship closed with the swallow, he received her fire and hoisted his black flag, returning the man-of-war's fire. He set all the sail he could, and as the ship tore through the water, blazed away at the swallow. It was a pity for his own sake that he did not follow Armstrong's advice and run his ship off before the wind. Had he done so, he might have escaped. But either through the wind shifting or else through bad steerage and the excitement of the contest, his sails, with the tacks down, were taken aback, and for a second time the swallow came quite close to him. From now onwards, there would have been a very desperate fight, but a grape shot struck him in the throat, and presently he died. He laid himself on the tackles of one of the ship's guns. The man at the helm, observing him there and seeing that he was wounded, ran towards him and swore at him, bidding him stand up and fight like a man. But when the sailor found to his horror that his chief was already dead, he burst into tears and hoped that the next shot might settle himself. Presently, the lifeless body of the daring, plucky, ingenious Roberts was thrown over the side into the water with his arms and ornaments still on, just as he had repeatedly expressed the wish to be buried during his lifetime. The rest is quickly told. The pirate ship was now soon captured and the crew arrested. The latter were strictly guarded while on board the man of war and were taken to Cape Coast Castle, where they underwent a long trial. Like many of the old smugglers, these pirates remained defiant and impenitent for a long time. But after some experience of the dull confinement in the castle and the imminence of death, they changed their disposition and became serious, penitent, and fervent in their devotions. Their acts of robbery on sea had been so flagrant that there was no difficulty in bringing in a verdict of guilty. End of chapter 16